Well, hello. Welcome back. It's 8.22 a.m. on Easter morning, March 31st, 2024. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a uh, wonderful Easter. Happy Easter. Um, Christ is King. And uh, Easter is a very important day here at the Hotel Orloff. So welcome back to episode the heck, 946, apparently where I am going to be going through books and assembling a library live on the air for all two of the viewers. But, um, very, uh, well, I won't, I won't discuss what Joe Biden did today uh, or yet but as far as, we won't talk about that because we don't get political here on the Gratch Orloff uh, television network, the Orloff inspirational network, the so welcome back. So let me get some books. All right, now we've got three viewers. Wow. I was trying to wait till Howler Mouse finished his live stream. Uh, didn't want to break in on his live stream, but I think he's done. Uh, let's see. Dark Horse Archives, it's Nemesis. Um, which apparently originally sold for $60, but I didn't pay $60. Um, man, you know, I think for $60, you could get all the original ACG comics that are reprinted in here and then have the original books. I, I, I think, uh, but I'm not sure. Um, anyway, this is uh, something, you know, you never thought you'd see a whole hardcover edition. Uh, this wonderful wonderful stuff stuff that if that's the kind of comics you like which i do that's what you'll get here let's see what people are saying here friar tuck is saying good morning sir and howler mouse is done happy Easter. i'm laughing because i discovered a girl on youtube that probably has Tourette syndrome and uh and one of the things that she just she the only person I've known in my life uh, that had Tourette syndrome was John Freeman. He was a musician and a really funny guy, but he would just have kind of weird twitches, you know, and then get, and then occasionally he'd do a weird twitch, but he didn't say uh, things. He, this girl says stuff. And, and I was watch. I couldn't stop watching last night. My wife was laughing too, but after a while, you know, I'm obsessive. I got to see more and more. And she says, okay, this is starting to be depressing now. Let's put on something else. Okay. What is her name? Just uh, so I can. Uh... Anyway, one of the things she'll say is, you're done. You're done. You're done. So when uh, <laughs> Friar Texas, Adler Mouse is done, I start laughing. It reminds me of the Happy Easter, says B Sides. Okay. Uh, let's see. Her name is uh, Balin Dupree. You need to subscribe to her. Also, I got my medicine changed on Monday. Uh, it takes about two weeks to get the full effect. Um, Uh, that wasn't one of the better ones. 
These are very G-rated ones. Uh, they can be far more spectacular, but I don't know if we should play those on a family program. But again, um, let's see what her most recent video is. This is from yesterday. Let's see what she's up. Hi, everyone. I wanted to... Oh, your dad. I wanted to introduce my 1.6 pound <laughs> little baby wing two and a half month old palm she she is a female um she bumped your mom yeah you're done you're done <laughs> um i'm looking for names okay um preferably food names like cookie brownie little baby wiener oh right up my brown wiener she's gonna mad but any names that you guys would like to give me, please comment down below because she needs a name. It's a girl. It's a little baby wiener. She's got a massive cock. <laughs> and she... Anyways, I wanted to introduce you guys to my new dog. That Chris Cuomo on CNN interviewed her one time and he couldn't keep from laughing and... <laughs> kept flipping him off and anyway that's something that you can entertain yourself with on this fine eastern morning um what is going on here friar tuck says must have some algorithms she popped up on my recommendations as well really interesting omega dread what happened to playing board games um they're still here i'm waiting we'll, we'll see it just everything's got a time perfectly right. Maybe when the eclipse happens, everything will line up perfectly. Friar Tuck, uh, I don't understand why she does YouTube. Uh, well, to make money, she's a big hit on TikTok, uh, apparently. I think it's also to bring, under, from what she says, understanding to uh, the Tourette's community. And I'm sure she's very well aware of that people will find it very amusing. I mean, that's why she's that's why she's, you know, popular. Moondust says, laugh out loud, oh my. Yes. Okay, so more about Here's um, famous fighters of the Second World War. How about that? Um, so, you know, perhaps this is the type of reading material that you would choose. This is a book I got in sixth grade, Cartooning the Head and Figure by Jack Ham. This is actually a, a pretty good book, and it's one of those classic books from on drawing cartoons. And, uh, all these different faces. This is uh, either from the 50s or late 40s. Not, well, I take it back, 1967. The 1976 printing, yes, my memory is correct that I got this sixth grade. I was in, uh, that was uh, 76, 77. Uh, <clears throat> listening to X-22. Um, well, I know most of you are getting ready for church and or setting up Easter egg hunts and things, but... Here, I'm, my wife is just now falling asleep. Because, uh, 
he's on a weird schedule. This is a, a mad book called Completely Mad. And the back cover is the back of his head. And this is a hardcover edition. I've also got a soft cover edition, which I think was a present from somebody. They thought, oh, he, he would like a mad book. But of course, I already had the mad book. So I'm going to put this with my EC books over there, along with its uh, soft cover companion. Oh, man, what is this? Oh, Pulp Fictions. Um, after the Pulp Fiction movie came out in the mid-90s, then, um, you know, people thought maybe people would like to read the original stuff. Uh, so all these authors, why is Quentin Tarantino in there? Oh, well, I, you know why, because he made that movie. Anyway, so it's a Barnes & Noble book. Oh, let's see what people are talking about here. Oh, Graphic Man's here. That Jack Ham looks great. Great illustrations. It's from 1967. I thought it was older. Uh, uh oh, my wife is also Easter's canceled over here. Oh, man. Uh. I see you are still streaming. How much time do you have left? Oh, I went over. Uh, I don't know exactly. Apparently, I have two accounts. One's on the blue thing, which I think is Explorer. And then, which Explorer used to be an E. Now it looks kind of like the Firefox thing. It's just a weird swirl. And that's the Firefox thing, I think, is now a red-orange swirl. But anyway, that one... I think I still had five hours, so I'll probably max out both my accounts today, and maybe my wife can start another account, and then I'd have another 20. I don't think I'll, it, after today, I'll be able to do any streaming till like, almost, like, the 16th of April. I'll still do little can shows. Okay. Yeah, there's, man, I can't pay for the I mean, yeah, we went out to eat last night because uh, we got a check, magical check in the mail. We really shouldn't have. Um, this is the brand new Monty Python Pepper Bock. Uh, Monty Python. It was weird. It was a show that was in England in the very early 70s. What did it start? Maybe 1969 in the very early 70s. But in maybe it was 76 it was brought over to one pbs affiliate kera channel 13 in dallas fort worth they started running monty python's flying circus and they started running the uh, monty python and the holy grail movie and uh, it took off locally, and then it spread to all the other PBS stations, and they were all running Monty Python's Flying Circus because uh, it was lowbrow and it was highbrow, too. You'd have jokes about philosophers like Immanuel Kant, and then you'd have basically fart jokes all mixed together. And so some of the people that like Benny Hill... Uh, that's that's too highbrow for me. But, you know, if you were just the normal smart kid in junior high, you know, it, it, you know, I loved it. I love Saturday Night Live, but I was never one of those people like some of my friends that would memorize every line of dialogue from Saturday Night Live and from Monty Python. And then they just go around the school, say random lines like run away, run away when they were running from, you know in the Holy Grail movie. It's just like, oh man, my friends don't really have a sense of humor. They have to, they see people laugh at jokes in movies, so they start repeating that line. You see it in movie theaters. Everybody laughs at something someone says on the screen, and then they repeat the line to themselves. They say the line themselves as if to internalize it and make it part of them. Now I'm funny too. I've taken that joke, and now I will say it. What Bill Murray said, I will now say con constantly, and maybe I will have friends Anyway, so uh, Monty Python had this new life in the United States. And, and uh, right about that time, Saturday Night Live was starting, which was basically the National Lampoon show that Lorne Michaels had hired the writers and the cast from the National Lampoon Radio Hour and from their off-Broadway plays and record albums. And, 
And then Lauren Michaels was a genius. But in reality, once that original cast cycled through and left, and he was never able to recreate that original cast, and it was always uh, pathetic. Well, I'm sorry your wife is sick, graphic man. If you want to hang out here a little bit. Yeah, it's... Uh, um, yeah, I just trying to get my library fixed up and you know that it's like a, Easter Bunny doesn't visit here anymore, unfortunately. Anyway, so they oh boy, some of this stuff I can't show. I better cover that up. Sometimes they had kind of blue material in these books. Anyway, this book I believe came out about 1977, is my recollection, when when uh uh they, they did all kinds of clever things like make it look like a school library book. It was, this is a very cleverly put together thing. Let's see what date. Yeah, this is a pretty neato. It said it doesn't have anything that tells you. Uh, it just has safety instructions on how to read the book. <laughs> just, I, I would have thought they wouldn't probably have the year in the front. It's probably in the back. They're going to do everything backwards. Um. And also, the National Lampoon had come along. So here's Monty Python basically doing the National Lampoon. It, it was, it was a, oh, boy, do I not want to use the word zeitgeist. But there was something in the air in the 70s with Monty Python, National Lampoon, and Monty Python. I already said Monty Python. Monty Python, National Lampoon, Saturday Night Live, and SCTV was starting to come on and late night on PBS, too, from Canada. From all, all, oh, and there was the credibility gap with Michael McKean and David Lander. Uh, uh, later, two of those guys would become Lenny and Squiggy, but the credibility gap was great. There was a lot of great humor. And when I went in the music stores, which when I went into malls as a kid, first I would go, when I had free reign, I would go in the bookstore, the record store, the toy store. Sometimes out of order, depending on where they were in the mall, the Forum 303 Mall or the Six Flags Mall would be the malls I would be going to. I was, uh, those were the stores that were important to me. Music, comic books, magazines, books, and toys. Uh, Moondust says, can you think of an Easter-related horror movie, Killer Dressed in Bunny Mask or something? Yeah, there is one. I don't know. Remember, Apollo. Happy Easter! And where? Come on, come on up here. Happy Easter! We just finished lunch and are about to have dessert. There was lamb, but I'm not a fan, so I had pork. Yeah, he he's he's told us how much he loves pork. Um, here is uh, you know, it's debatable. Should this be on a bookshelf or should it be in a comic book box? It's they came from the 50s, one of these 90s uh, books that, I don't know, that may not have been appropriate, but it's all uh, 1950s reprints um, in black and white. Um, and by 1950s, I mean early 1950s, creep code horror. Or PCH is some of the people they, they came from. This is not my I don't know why it's on my but this is my wife's when her uncle visits and he sees the bookshelf of all these books this is the book he pulls out because this is interesting to him um this uh this book should be upstairs in my wife's book that is not one of mine but it's something you know in the move everything got put together why it's close encounters of the third kind a document of the film um, yeah, I don't know. I don't think I've ever eaten lamb. I, something about it. I just like, no, man, some animals, you just, you just don't it's like eating. It's like, uh, we're going to have puppy uh, this morning. You know, lamb just seems like too innocent, angelic an animal to eat. Um, I don't know. It's a book about close encounters of the third kind. How about that? Uh, okay, that's what that is. Fletcher Hanks. 
Do you know who he is? You should. He is this crazy golden age artist. Uh, how about veal? I don't really like to realize that the food I'm eating was once a living animal. It's just the way it is. Okay, Fletcher Hanks is... Uh, one thing about Fletcher Hanks is... Uh, James Gunn is like one of the most hated people on Facebook right now. Maybe everywhere. It's, it's very interesting. Uh, but in this movie, Super, uh, the Fletcher Hanks is a major uh, source of uh, inspiration for that movie. Okay, the thing is, James Gunn took over the DC universe, and there's a whole bunch of people that are such big fans of Henry Cavill, and these are people that I don't think have ever read any comic books. Henry Cavill on the surface, looks like he'd be a good Superman. But in the movies he played Superman, he was directed in such a way where he was told to be glum and depressed and never smiling. So, And then the only movie where he smiled was when, uh, what's his name? The Buffy uh, guy came over and completely reworked the Justice League movie and he had Superman smiling, but he, Superman looked really weird when he smiled because he was over there filming some movie for, I don't know, Guy Ritchie or something, and the actor had a mustache. And he thought he'd finished this Justice League movie or almost finished it, and then this other director comes in and says, oh, this movie's too depressing. We've got to make it a little happier. And so they bring the cast back and and Whoever the director was would not let him shape. Oh, he was filming Mission Impossible, I think it was. And they wouldn't. Tom Cruise was maybe directing or something. They said, no, he's not going to shave his mustache. So they had to use really crude CGI to erase his mustache. So it, he looked completely weird throughout that movie. Yeah. So anyway. So they want Henry Cavill back. So they hear that Henry Cavill was not invited back because he wanted a younger Superman. They're all up in arms, and they're also up in arms. If, if, if James Gunn puts the red underwear on Superman, I, that's just a step too far, man. That's the way he's supposed to look. To, to them, it looks silly. But to me, that grew up reading the comics, that's how Superman's supposed to look. He looks weird with the all blue, uh, no red trunks, uh, Yes, indeed. How about that? So anyway, I'm I'm optimistic about what James Gunn is doing with the DC movies. I I think I like James Gunn. I don't like his Twitter history. I don't like what he did with Warlock in the Last Guardians of the Galaxy movie. But I love that movie. It's just like. I think the average person has never heard of Warlock. So they see that movie and it's like, well, they probably are wondering why that character is even in the movie because he really didn't, as I recall, do anything of consequence in the movie, but he was there, but then he wasn't treated with respect in the movie. So it was almost like, why was he even there? But I like that movie and I haven't, well, there's little things that, that, that James Gunn does like, uh, he thinks it's he thinks male nudity is a lot funnier than I mean, he's like he's 12 years old in some ways you know he probably thought that was really funny when what's his face that played the peacemaker came out at the academy awards with just a cue card in uh, covering himself i most people just thought what the, what in the blazes Be proud of me. I'm not drinking soda pop today. I got to cut that crap out of my life, man. Okay. Modern mad specials, mad movie classics uh, that reprints uh, some. Here's the reprint of Scarface. It's weird to see mad with this glossy paper like it's. Uh, 
hey, did you hear Life Magazine's coming back? Someone's bringing about Life Magazine, and they think that's, I mean, how is Life Magazine going to sell when no magazine sold that I know of? Uh, yeah. You can tell I'm mad it had gone downhill by the time Mrs. Doubtfire came out. It just doesn't look right. Uh, yeah, whatever. How about that? Mad movie classics. Um, okay, so I got to get these books up. Do you listen to this guy uh, X22? He used to be on YouTube, but they banned him from YouTube, and so you listen to him on Rumble now. Uh, and I don't know what X22 means. I'm I'm aware there's an X23 that is a teenage female Wolverine, but. I don't know what X-22 means. I think someone told me that it's some kind of experimental plane or something. I don't know. Oh, okay. Easter festive Easter decorations. Okay. More books. I have this uh, Sheena volume two. I think the one, I don't remember what stream that was, but Gotham City Comics, Kevin Johnson in Mesa, Arizona, he uh, showed a book like this and I said, put it in my pile, but I'm not sure if it, it might've been volume one or it might've been this one. Um, if it's volume two, I already have it. This is a great book with, uh, this is just, why am I not reading this now? Why am I doing this stupid live stream? There we go. Yeah, so it's a, it's a book, it's great. Okay, let's look this up on Amazon. See if, um, how different the cover is for volume one. Hi, good morning, get ready with me. 
to go get dick, 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 to go get my hair done. I haven't gotten my hair done in like four months, five months probably, because it has been damaged very, very badly. Like bad, like my bitch. Um, fried off, double fried. I'll take a side of fries with that. And I to wait you made it. Um, so it just hasn't really went well in my favor with the whole hair process thing. Um, and I have super, super thick hair just, um, from like here down, it's fried now. Uh, <laughs> yeah, from here down, I fucked your dad. <laughs> So it has been quite some time since I get my hair done, and it takes a long time. Like a long, long. That's a long hair. <laughs> All right. Imagine she has a boyfriend. Imagine bringing her home to meet your parents. Let's see. Uh, okay, so what? I'm looking up Amazon.com. Oh, look, Biden declares Easter Sunday the uh, blank day of visibility. Um, so uh, he declared, the White House declared Easter Sunday the most holy of Christian holidays as blank day of blank, claiming that blank Americans are part of the fabric of our nation. Why Easter? Why choose a Christian holiday? Um, unless you're, well, we won't get into that because this is, we don't talk about politics here. Let's look at Amazon.com. People get disturbed when you talk about politics. Joe Biden is a great president. What if a great? I think, I think General Patton would have loved the grit and the fortitude of, of uh, fighting Joe Biden. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Pick up where you left off, and it's <laughs> oh, never mind. It's showing Amazon showing things that you might like, and there's a picture of a Nixon mask, <laughs> and uh, uh, Amazon's got a strange picture of me in their algorithm. Okay, yeah, come on, come on, man. What else do they think I like? Oh, some of this stuff is from my wife, maybe you're looking at it, or just Easter in general. Okay. Okay, so uh, what what was that called? Sheena, Queen of the Jungle. I got to put in Queen of the Jungle so I don't get like Sheena Easton or Sheena. Wasn't there some Sheena hung out with uh, Prince, like Sheena Z or something? Sheena. Uh, queen of the jungle. Oh, I'm getting the Tanya Roberts movie and the modern comic book. Oh, wow. Do I have this? I'm wondering if I own this. I don't think I do. How much is it? Oh, it's $32. It's Roy Thomas, uh, PS Art Books, reprinting Sheena. I wonder how many volumes they did of that. Here's a uh, volume two. That's pretty cheap. Okay, I probably need to put book. No, I'll put volume one. That's what I want to see. Why not just put exactly? Oh, I misspelled. Oh, they missed. They fixed it for me. I misspelled something. Well, well, Roy Thomas got up through volume three. And this is a forty-four dollar book. Well, that's good to know that. Anyway, yeah, I would say, Kevin, if you're watching the stream, uh, if it's volume two, then you could pull it out of my pile. I don't need two copies of volume two, but I think you had volume one. Could be wrong. All right.
That is weird, weird. It's Captain Science from Roy Thomas. This would be one of those books like we just saw on Amazon. The Sheena books would, would look kind of like this. And see, they had the original ads. And the it feels like kind of like grittier, like newsprint. And then the covers are, well, no, they're not really slick, but they look a little slicker. This is Captain Science. Um, so this is one of the great things that Roy Thomas is doing is uh, reprinting these old books. So. A little weird. I, what I was looking at is the this weird. Uh, see the shininess behind there. Or the I don't know if that's spelling out in giant letters science or what. But do you see the? Yeah. Oh, it's the science logo. But it's when you hold it in the light, you can kind of see it. But first, you think is there did a snail crawl across my book and leave like a snail trail? You know, like. Right here is that like what is that damage to the book? That was my first thought, and then I realized no, that's just decoration. Well, nobody's in the chat today, so that's okay. Here are uh reprints of gold key Star Trek books, and this coming from Checker Book Publishing Group, it looks uh, there's something about the, there are better editions you could get. I mean, if you find this, I mean, it's, it's okay. I, I've seen better reproductions of the art. Okay, let's see what I've got here. That is five. This is four. These gold key comics are wonderful. I think it's probably better to have the real comics because one thing they're not doing in here is reproducing the wonderful covers by George Wilson, the painted covers. Uh, well, I take it back. I guess they reprint them in small size uh, pictures here. That's only one of the cover. Do they reprint all of them in small versions? Let me see. Um, Interesting. Is that supposed to be Lieutenant Uhura? Um, okay, whatever. Four and five. Here's uh, volume three. Um, Donald Trump will have two appearances on on uh, Tuesday on right side broadcast. He's got a rally somewhere and some doing something else too. Paulo says, Checker Publishing Group had good potential. Clearly, whoever was in charge was a fan, but he never had the resources to become a player in the comics market. What else did they do, Paulo? I've never heard of any other than this. This is volume two. <laughs> uh, yeah, I guess they do reprint the covers, little little small sized versions of them, some of them. Yeah, I guess they do. That one I bought when it came out when I was a kid, that particular issue. I guess that George Wilson book should be. <laughs> There's one of the great panels where it shows flames shooting out of the back of the <laughs> um, Enterprises. <sighs> okay, so it looks like I have the whole set from Checker Publications. So, so whatever, dude. Early issues, they had photo covers. Uh, yeah, see, this is, I don't know how this is coming across on StreamYard, but this is not really good reproductions. It, it looks kind of muddy, you know, like they, it looks like a 
kind of a bad color Xerox is what it looks like. Uh, what's going on here? Looks like they didn't have the rights to print the gold key logo. Interesting, yeah. From Checker, I was very interested in the Alien Legion Collected Editions. It was a science fiction series originally published by Epic in the 80s. I remember seeing it on the stands and, and passing it by. <laughs> it's one of those things. But I ended up not being able to buy them. Uh-oh, X-22 is ending. I've got to go put on the next episode. One moment I'm recording because someday this will be historically important. Okay, and then, so that's one set of Star Trek reprints, and then it was also done by IDW, Gold Key Archives, and this is volume one. I don't know how many volumes they had, but the art looks a little sharper in, in this IDW edition. Um. So I would recommend the IDW version, which also reprints the covers full size with the gold key logo and all the, and the price and everything. And it just, this is a much better reading experience, but what did they cost? This reprints the first six issues and it was uh, $30. Um, so that's that. And the spines look really cool. To me, that's the <laughs> that's the definitive Star Trek logo. I, I love that. That's like perfect. Okay, and then before that, in the late 70s, Gold Key was I think still printing the Star Trek comic. They came out with Star Trek. The Enterprise Logs, and it was a golden press. But um, it reprints issues one through eight. It's even got a page from Scotty's Diary. This is uh, cool on the back. I'll let you freeze frame this and read it if you want. Where's the signature of Arthur L. Mason? I have not read the chief of staff, Arthur of Command. How about that? This is a completely on comic book paper. I think Golden Press, or they didn't put out coloring books and stuff. It looks exactly, it just looks like a bound set of the original comics. So that's what that is. So I got that this came out in magnifying glass. I would say about 76, 77. Dang it. Seventy six. Gold key published uh, Star Trek up until I think 79 when Star Trek the motion picture came out then Marvel got the rights to Star Trek but it wasn't as good with Marvel because they all were wearing those ugly gray pajamas that they started wearing in that movie then it went to DC but Unless they're wearing these color uniforms, I don't even accept it as Star Trek. I don't accept anything but the original Star Trek from the 60s. That's just how curmudgeonly I am. And I'm sure that offends lots of you people. At least I don't have to ever watch Whoopi Goldberg in a Star Trek. Okay. 
Okay, so this is my collection of Star Trek reprints. I have a lot of the original issues, not nearly a complete set, but anyway. How about that? Do you want to go on a walk? Let's go on a walk. I'm going to take the dog on a walk. But, um, come on, Drew, let's go on a walk. Uh, the temperature outside. Where's my phone? Come on, Drew. Oh, man. She couldn't wait. At least she's going on her diaper. <laughs> Hopefully that's not visible to you folks. Oh, okay. Well, now I'm still committed to the walk, even though she's already done her business. Oh, there's my phone. All right. I gotta be a man. Um, weather why are they giving me the weather in the arctic ocean i don't live in the arctic ocean you swine um real retreat 57 degrees okay. but it's actually 46 degrees so oh, oh okay. what do i need to do oh, I'll be back momentarily. Okay, where's my witch man? Okay. I'm 
Okay, we're back. Okay. Oh. We lost viewers just because I went and walked the dog. What kind of heartless people are you? Um, oh. Moon dust. Picture of a dog and a pile of poop. Paulo says, this is a classic gratu stream. Whatever you get said, at least for several minutes, I can't help but smile. Well, at least I didn't drive to the store. Back when I used to have long memory on my phone, I remember being gone for half an hour. Uh, all right. This is the world's weirdest comic books. And I can't even show one of those things. Let's see. Uh, that's a book I kind of like to get some of these, babe. Uh, Hillbilly comics. Uh, Probably never will be able to. Man. Here's a comic book that teaches you how to be a bus driver. Um, this reeks of being a gift from someone. I don't remember who. And by reek, I don't mean to imply that it's uh, something bad. It's just it just seems like something I don't know how I got. Here's a comic by uh, a comic about LBJ. Okay, well, just thinking about, you know, they have Biden announces this, this is something else. It's not a Christian holiday. It's, it's this new day. And then in a few months, then Barack Obama's wife comes out and says, I'm going to replace Joe Biden in this presidential race. And by the way, I'm one of the, you know, you, I'm one of these wonderful people. Remember that holy day that was devoted to me a few Sundays ago? Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, he's a curly headed monster, Apollo. It's big, my 
that's a horrible thing to say. <laughs> Everyone knows that she's a beautiful woman. This is a uh, wonderful Alex Ross art. So you, you look at this and you realize, okay, you really can make a Hollywood movie with comic book accurate costumes without it looking stupid. I mean, if you just do what Alex Ross did, and this guy, he uses models. Uh, there's a guy that I'm sure he's too old now, but the guy that was posing as Superman for Alex Ross to paint in kingdom come that guy maybe he looked like superman but he couldn't act but that guy would have been a great superman he's, he just physically looked as much like christopher reeve as them these models that he has you know the model he has for wonder woman perfect um anyway metamorpho is going to be in the new superman movie by the way Anyway, these people on Facebook are just the real after James Gunn. By the way, speaking of uh, Facebook, Bob Beerbaum uh, passed away Thursday, same day that my cat passed away. I noticed Beer Bob Beerbaum, um, he was one of the original comic book store owners in San Francisco, and he was writing a book called Comic Book Store Wars about... Um, about the history of comic stores and, and he was very much he was very much against stan lee and everything and uh, i think too much against stan lee but you know he had his reasons and his political views and some people dislike him he wasn't pretending so anyway he seemed like a nice guy, even though I disagreed with his political views and some of his views on comics. It, it, you learn a lot from reading, you know, he would post on Facebook. Because he was there during the big days. Let's see, my wife is still not asleep. And then you got bunny, rabbit, bunny, rabbit, and then the chocolate. Uh, we need to eat a chocolate bunny. Um, yeah, they have them at, possibly still have a few at Dollar General. <laughs> Uh, okay, so man, I've got multiple copies of these. Um, it's Crisis on Multiple Earths. It reprints the Justice League comics that I think are, are so wonderful, which is why I. <sighs> When Crisis on Infinite Earths came along in the mid 80s, the artwork was great, the writing was great, but I, it didn't feel right. They're killing off whole worlds of characters that I had loved my whole childhood. And, and when my older brothers were in comics in the 60s, that, everything they read then was being killed off too. And they completely revamped the DC universe. And I was left cold by that. But I love these original Justice League issues where the, you know, like here, the Green Lantern of the Golden Age, who's on an, you know, a different version of Earth, is meeting the modern Jet Age Green Lantern. And uh, so the Justice League and the Justice Society from another Earth every summer would have some big crisis. They'd have to team up. And over a span of a couple of issues that summer, every summer it was that way, you know, as a kid. And when my brothers were older than me, when they were kids, there'd be a crossover every summer. And it would be a crisis that they'd have to team up for. And that was a wonderful thing. And when they got rid of that, you know, they were kind of already shooing me out the door. No, I've definitely been shooed out the door. Here is, uh, that was volume one. This is some different variation. Crisis on Multiple Earths, the team-ups. Um, oh, I know what this is. This is uh, when 
Justice League and Justice Society characters uh, teamed up, not in the crisis of issues, but just, uh, okay, I forgot what this book is. This is, okay, so I'm going to put this book in front of the book. Here's the Crisis on Multiple Earths, Volume 2. No. This is wonderful stuff, and it reprints these um, later 60s and very early 70s Justice League uh, crisis, summer crisis. I should call it a summer crisis. Um, I have two copies of it because apparently in my senility, I saw it two times volume three I got three times so that's even a bigger testament to my fragile uh, sanity then we're getting into the bronze age here the 20 cent issues the and it really does you know bring a tear to the eye to think all this was gotten rid of because DC just wanted to revamp everything. And I uh, wasn't a fan. I was a fan of this era. And uh, but that's all right. I still have this era and everything. And let's keep what? Hear me. Friar Tuck says, R.I.P. Pete, thank you. Uh, thanks, Friar Tuck says, my wife. Paulo Costa says, whiskey time now. Dalmore, 12 years. Oh, yeah. Well, it's much later in the day. It's like, what time is it where you're at? Uh, like 3, 4 in the afternoon? My wife says, sounds great. She hasn't even had any sleep, man. Is whiskey popular in Portugal? Asked Friar Tuck. Mm. Um, and here's volume four, which takes you up through issues that I remember buying. Like I remember the summer day when I bought, you know, that issue. I remember buying that, mowing the lawn and buying that issue. So anyway, how about that? We're getting up to the point where I'm going to have to go upstairs and bring down another bookcase down on the elevator. Um, okay. Is, is whiskey popular in Portugal? My wife says, has anyone ever had whiskey with milk? And Friar Tuck says, they're seeking them more like a wine culture. And Paula Costa says, with some people, yes. My dad's always been a fan. When I was a teenager, I found whiskey. It was the only drink I could nurse for hours. Oh. People talking about drinking there. It's only 9.30 in the morning. Of course, it's much later for Paulo and the far-flung country in which he lives on the other side of the earth country very few people in the United States have even heard of, Portugal. I imagine if you went in the average mall, most people would never even, not even know that that was a country. People here, not very smart Americans. Let's see, Mundus says, eggnog and whiskey. Paula says, we are, we are a wine culture. We had two bottles for five people for lunch. We're having whiskey because we've already had coffee. That makes sense. I'm having water because I already had water earlier. I guzzle it pretty quickly with Coke. I don't even know if I've ever had whiskey. Oh, Jack Daniels, is that, what is that? Is that whiskey? I don't know. It seems like I drank some of that once. Um, and I fell on my face. <laughs> I was alone. I, uh, long story. All right, well... <clears throat> Put 
Well, here's a Archie Americana series, best of the sixties. But is it really the best of the 60s, or do they just choose randomly? I don't know. Um, I mean, I'm not really exactly sure how this was put together, but that's pretty cool. Okay. Best of the 50s. This is book two of Best of the 50s. So here, you're going to be seeing art from Harry Lucy. Do they even credit the artist in here, I wonder? They give you the and the table of contents it tells you like this appeared in Pep Comics 114 March 56th. It's not giving you artist credit. There's a little text feature at the beginning that probably does talk about the artist. I not seeing names though. Talking more about what about the 1950s in general. Um, uh, the the very early 50s. This is the era that Harvey Kurtzman and Will Elder were doing parodies of in the early Mad comic. That's volume. Two, this is volume one of Best of the 50s. So this is, uh, look how thin her waist is there. It's like Vampira. Um, this is a great era when the art looked like this. Okay. Yeah, Jack is a wuss, whiskey. Eggnog and whiskey. Sounds like a plan, LOL. Moon Dust says, just be prepared for the bathroom. Still sounds like a good plan. That's because the bathroom is very close to up there. Okay, best of the 40s. As we get back into the 40s, the main artist is going to be Bob Montana. Yeah. The great thing about comics becoming so crummy over the last 30 years is that you have more money to buy these. I'd go into Lone Star Comics, look at all the new comics, eh, nothing there for me. And then I pick up, you know, some trade paperback comic. Replay home and stuff. And here's, that was must have been Best of the 40s, Volume 1. This is Best of the 40s. Um, that was Volume 2. This is Volume 2. Uh, that was one too. This is volume one. Man, yes. I'm losing my mind here. Here's a, a little bit different style of art as we get back to the very origins of Archie. And this reprints the whole, this is the very first appearance of Archie here. Okay. This one. Probably is a much smaller print book. Uh, 
Archie fanzine special, Best of Betty and Veronica Summer Fun. And I think this, this all kind of looks like like Xerox copies. It's it is a truly a fanzine. I don't remember where I bought this, but yeah, this is kind of like and this came out 1991. Okay, well. Dan DiCarlo was uh, the the Archie artist most people know be, because he was the guy in the part of the 60s and all through most of the 70s and but he uh, also did art for books other than Archie and this is a book that shows some of his other art here he's art for the mighty Adam and uh, just his other work the yard birds Oh, that was interesting. Um, he did work for Marvel, my friend Irma. Well, that was Atlas at the time. Um, so. So. There he is. It's a family man, Dan DiCarlo. This is a book, The Art of Dan DiCarlo. This is uh, from Fantagraphics. And this was a $35 book when it came out. And um, lots of... Uh, Lots of his art. Um, okay, fantastic. So that, let me put that down. This is a cool book uh, called Cartoon Confidential. And this is from Jim Corcus and John Colley. Toon Secrets Revealed. That's when. Uh, after that uh, Roger Rabbit movie came out, people started calling them tunes. I mean, I know that there was Looney Tunes, but they were referring to tunes, T-U-N-E-S, because they had music, you know, and Looney Tunes was just a takeoff of Merry Melodies from Hold on. I'm getting it all mixed up. There's Merry Melodies, Looney Tunes, and what was... Oh, it all started with Disney, with Silly Symphonies. And then Warner had Merry Melodies and Looney Tunes, which was all just, uh, just you know, same thing. They were going to have music with the cartoons. And usually it was music from about 15, 20 years ago that you remembered from when you were a kid. And these were run before the movie, and adults were watching them too, so... If you're watching a cartoon from the 1930s, you're usually hearing music that was probably popular around World War I that the people in the 1930s would have remembered from when they were kids. So you're going to hear songs like Camp Town Races and, or, you know, in the 40s, you're going to hear, Oh, You Beautiful Doll. You're, there's going to be, yeah, well, they were basically putting popular music in woven into these cartoons, which um kind of have to be there to understand okay so this is uh all about things that were censored in cartoons uh oh, what is this this time about the animated superheroes of the 60s it's the submariner cartoon what is it man what is that from Oh, this is storyboards from a Submariner cartoon. And that's, of course, the Hanna-Barbera Fantastic Four. There's Hanna-Barbera there. There's all kinds of stuff in this book. All right. What's your top score on Kiss Pinball? Have you done a 
pinball machine video recently. I don't know that I've ever really done a pinball machine video, period. I've done a few. No, I haven't done one recently. Um, but have I done one? At all, where I, you know, where I discuss each individual machine, I don't think so. I probably get a different group in, as maybe possibly subscribers. That's probably a good idea. Oh, here's some books I didn't show you. Um, one of my favorite movies is Ghost World. And if you haven't seen that, you're watching this channel, you need to like immediately figure out a way to see it like today. This is Ghost World Special Edition. Um, this is, um, of course, Ghost World was a comic book first, and this has just about everything. The original comics. Ooh, and this book smells really good, too. This must be from Craig Yo. No, it's from Fantagraphics. They're good, too. They're great, too. Um, this is like the ultimate book on it. It even has a... Pages from the shooting script for the movie. Um, actually, it may have the entire shooting script in here. Here's the the Satan worshippers she sees, you know, in the diner that she's in, like a Denny's. All oh, those people must be Satan worshippers. Yeah, this was great stuff, and the movie was fantastic as well. So, can't write off the 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 nineties because there was. Daniel Klaus and Peter Bagg, they were turning out great stuff. Here's uh, another book that's the screenplay of the movie. So I guess I've got two versions of that. And speaking of um, Peter Bagg, this um, this stuff was great. So the Bradleys and Studs Kirby. This is the this is where you know if if. You could be buying Rob Liefeld comics or Image or Spawn, or you could be buying this. And this is what I chose to be getting. Um, this is uh, this was the really good stuff, in my opinion. Yeah. Here's oh, Flaming Carrot was a lot of fun too. Flaming Carrot. This is from Dark Horse. And this is, a, you know, a collection of a lot of the dark, a lot of the uh, flaming carrot stories. Um, I'll put the link in the chat if anyone would like to come on and ask questions about books or whatever. Not that there's anything to ask. Things aren't that interesting, but uh, I'm just doing something I'd planned to do just to keep my mind off of all the horrible stuff in the world. In the world, and, you know, just, just something I thought, well, I'll put more books in the library. I'll bring them down. It's just like an important thing to do. So I, I go live just because it's great content, right? Oh. Is Scotch whiskey 
Ask Friar Tuck from Sherwood Forest. They get a good Wi-Fi signal now in Sherwood Forest. Okay, it's the greatest Superman stories ever told. I guess you wanted to see him, so so that's oh man. Uh, they got the John Byrne Superman on the back. Oh, they got a little bit of John Byrne here. Okay, I guess I'll maybe there's some good. I just don't want to accept anything after the. It's all right. Uh, yeah. I like the old Superman, man. I like this time period. Ratu, do you have a record collection of vintage albums? I'm sorry, I'm not meaning to laugh at your question, but I've got a lot of records. Yes, that is correct. And I've shown a lot of them before, but all I prob probably should show them again, you know, probably. This is the complete book of cartooning. This one, University of Texas at Arlington. My older brother was attending UTA and uh, they had a campus bookstore and I went there with them and I saw this book. They were selling it there for the college students. It's by John Atkins Richardson. And it shows you all about uh, how to draw basically, I guess. But what I, what there was some things in here, as I recall, this is probably I would have gotten this about 76, 76, yeah, 77. There's things about it that reek of the counterculture that show, you know, like the way they wrote acknowledgments, you know, it's that kind of and. Basically, you could kind of tell when you got the font like that, that this was done by kind of a hippie. Oh, and it also has this. Uh, oh, you see it? It has this animation up here. He's jumping. So that was uh oh then he then he lands. Um shows political cartoons, you know, there's an anti-Nixon one, of course. Um I think this is the I've gotta find what I'm trying to show you. Um There's an example of a Prince Valiant comic strip, and uh, there's Flash Gordon. Okay, but somewhere, in, oh, oh yeah, here we go. They show the really relevant Neil Adams, Denny O'Neill, Green Lantern, Green Arrow stuff, but there's a page here. Then they get into the underground uh, comics, you know, of course that's in here, and and stuff like that. They show you how to draw your own comic and pay, you know, cover Rocket Blast comic collector. But there's this one page from an issue of Creepy, um, Richard Corbin's story, which is a story I think called Quickly, which shows this cartoon frame stuff in the guy's head. And, and uh, I could have sworn there was more art in here from that story. And I saw that and I thought, wow, you know, because I always loved Richard Corbin art. But um, there were some things in here that were, I could have sworn there was more Richard Corbin art in here. Anyway. So, here's a Prince Valiant book, Hal Foster. Actually, is a 
wrap around. Look at that. Amazing. There's that famous illustration that was used on the back of the Warren Magazine comics when they were selling the Prince Valiant things. This is actually not. This is a. Um, This is kind of a ripoff. It's not Prince Valiant comic strips. It's them telling the story of Prince Valiant with occasional with illustrations from the comic strip, but it's not strictly comic art. It's text, the story of Prince Valiant with illustrations. So I guess that's okay. It's just, you know. Yeah, it's not how I would have done it. This is a catalog from Movie Star News. Now, Movie Star News, that's, uh, Movie Star News was a store in New York run by Irving Claw and his sister, Paula Claw. And they would put out catalogs with pictures of movie stars and they would have numbers under each one. And then you would order pictures of movie stars. And that's what they were doing. There's a whole bunch of pictures of Vincent Price. And they they were a whole bunch of pictures of different female stars. But one thing that Irving Claw discovered is that when he had pictures from movie serials and the heroes rescuing a girl that's tied to a tree or something, or Tarzan's rescuing Jane and she's tied. There were all these, uh, um, you know, skeevy people in New York were really wanted those pictures with the people tied up. They like that. So he puts up and he's thinking, well, I've got this back room. Why don't I take my own pictures? Pe people tied up. I hate to use the B word. Um, so he got that. So he did took probably thousands of pictures of Betty Page in the 50s and other girls just tying each other up. And so that this is modern from the uh, 80s, which is modern era to me. And here's a bunch of pictures of Lily Christine, who was a burlesque star. But in the back of this, you got all these pictures of Betty Page that you could order. So this was like, a, and uh, and that was there. That was where they were at. Movie star news, actual storefront. So when Betty Page exploded in popularity there after the Rocketeer came out, and uh and all everyone was discovering and collecting Betty Page magazines and stuff. Uh, Movie Star News was still in operation. Irving Claw had passed away, but his sister Paula Claw was still running the store, and they she would appear on Entertainment Tonight and stuff and talk about how. And he wouldn't just take pictures; he also shoot like eight millimeter films and he'd sell films of um, you know the girls dancing or tying each other up and stuff. None of it was, uh, I don't think any of it had nudity, but it was, it, it was, uh, stuff that was not, wouldn't have been frowned, up, would have been frowned upon by the authorities that he was selling there. Okay, so that's what that is. Here's American Tall Tales, and this was in a library at one time. Sometimes the public library back in Arlington, Texas, would would uh, the whole basement would be books they were getting rid of and they would have book sales and record sales and sometimes you'd get cool books for basically nothing. So um, some of these characters, I don't know, Storm Along, Johnny Appleseed, I know. Uh, you know, so a lot of folk heroes in that. Okay, this book is uh, oh, a little bit of, I mean, to cover up a little bit. This is The Adventures of Phoebe's Night Geist by Michael O'Donoghue and Frank Springer. 
Now, um, Michael O'Donoghue, if that name sounds familiar to you, he was a National Lampoon writer. And uh, Lauren Michaels, he was one of those National Lampoon writers that um, that was uh, hired by Lauren Michaels to write for the early Saturday Night Live show. And he would appear on the show as Mr. Mike. And he was uh, a sick character. You know, he would always, his humor was very sick. The sickest elements in National Lampoon were usually written by Michael O'Donoghue. He was very funny. I think that he was the first, like the very first episode of Saturday Night Live, which originally was just called Saturday Night. It's like live from New York, it's Saturday Night. The name was actually Saturday Night. Then they just started calling it Saturday Night Live. Uh, as I recall, he was like a psychiatrist and he was interviewing John Belushi in the very first opening sketch of the first episode in 1975. And it was, uh, something about Wolverines or something, but you see him there. And he would do little comedy routines on Saturday Night Live. Um, I'd like to do an impression of Lady Bird Johnson with needles in her eyes. And then he'd just start screaming and writhing around and on the floor. And that's that's his, his style of humor. And then he did a parody of a Mondo movie called Mr. Mike's Mondo Video. And... Um, it was supposed to be uh, a special, like one, one week when Saturday Night Live was not aired, they were going to put on this special Mr. Mike episode in place of, it was an hour and a half long, it was going to be a special replacement episode so they could have a vacation. And the network looked at it and said, we can't hear this. And so they, they released it in theaters as Mr. Mike's Mondo video. And it's like the show they couldn't show on television and people would see it. And they was like, what is this? What is this S? You know, people didn't get it. And it was like Dan Aykroyd showing his web toes. And stuff. It was insane. Actually, I don't really remember it that well. So I don't think it really was him at his top in his top form, because by then there was probably a lot of cocaine going up his nose, which is like a lot of those people, <laughs> those early uh, people. Anyway, so what is this? It's, uh, it's a big, thick graphic novel by Michael O'Donoghue, and it's going to be stuff I can't show you for the most part. In fact, are there any pages that it's uh, like an intellectual and little Annie Fanny, I guess you would say. It's very. Uh, sir. No, uh, you really. <laughs> no, I. Uh, I don't know. I just can't show much of it. I'm having to put my fingers over things. Yeah, just about every page has uh, stuff that you can't show on family programs. So, anyways, Phoebe Zeitgeist, if you want to obtain a copy, I'm sure there's, they're on eBay. This is a book about, it's, this is, you know, remember Horror Mike a few weeks ago or a few months ago put out a book that was nothing but splash pages of, the, just the first page of a horror story from the pre-code, pre-code early 50s horror era. This is sort of like that, except all it is is the front covers of National Enquirer and other magazines like that from the 60s. And I remember... National Enquirer, and when we'd go into the supermarket when I was a kid in the 70s, my mom would always buy National Enquirer, and I was embarrassed, and she'd buy the Star and the Tattler and all these little um, rags. I think my mom called them rags or scandal sheets. Well, what I didn't realize is 10 years before, in the mid-60s, about the time I was born, the National Enquirer and all those other... Uh, tabloids were far sleazier and uh, horrifying looking and I don't know how they put them in supermarkets 
I, I don't know. It's one of those things that's a mystery. It's like, how did that happen? Like, how did in the 1930s, did some of these pulp covers just, well, how were they just on newsstands? Because you figured, like, I, I just can't imagine my grandparents' era that that stuff was just on newsstands. But uh, I knew that the National Enquirer had used to be something different because I read a, a parody in Mad Magazine, one of the reprint issues, one of the Mad Specials, and it had a, re it had a reprint of a parody of the National Enquirer, and it was an older story from the 60s, and it just showed how horrible it was, just nothing but gore, and, and I thought, okay, National Enquirer must have been different That's what than it is now. So, uh, let's see, is there pages I can show? So here's like the National Examiner. Wife keeps her hubby's corpse for five years because she can't afford his funeral. Truth about those rock huts and gin neighbors, marriage rumors. That's the National Examiner. Oh, yeah. Most of this you can't. Here's uh, I forgive Oswald. <laughs> that says Kennedy at Seance in Dallas. Um, how many of these can I? I was married to the Boston Strangler. I'm covering stuff that's. <laughs> I can't even show you most of this stuff. Uh, <laughs> oh my God. Um, yeah, this is what the National Enquirer used to be like. Girls. <laughs> um. Teenager twists on corpses' head to get gold teeth. You imagine going in the in the supermarket and seeing that <laughs> starving mothers cook and eat kids. It's just horrifying. <laughs> it's just uh, uh, oh boy, yeah. Most of this <laughs> I just can't show you. It's called the book is called Sleazy Business. If you want to obtain a copy, this is what it's actually. Uh, I'm trying not to show you the front cover. <laughs> a pictorial history of exploitation, exploitation tabloids, 1959 to 74. It's from Alan Alan Betrock. Okay, that's about all I can show you. That get your own copy and see what I was laughing at. 1920s and 30s were wild. Yes, yes, I know they were. Yes, but you would think that would have been in the nightclubs and the music, I know, but you just wouldn't think it would be on a newsstand. But the illustrated James Bond 007, this is going to be uh, not American, but British uh, James Bond comic strips. James Bond was interesting in that it was one of the biggest phenomenon, uh, biggest biggest things i mean in the 60s the three biggest things were the beatles bond and batman that those were you know if you want to boil the 60s down like being a kid what was the most popular was those three things so uh the beatles didn't get a comic book they had a cartoon on saturday morning uh, there was a yellow submarine adaptation but other than that that's all the beatles got. you would have thought there'd be a beatles comic book but it just wasn't like, why didn't Gold Key do that? I guess it just wasn't I wasn't offered, you know, up the rights to do that. So um, Batman already had a comic book, but, you know, he appeared a lot more in a lot more different titles because the TV show. And then the other thing is James Bond. Now, before Dr. No came out, there was a Dr. No adaptation in Showcase from DC. But... Um, Either that was right before it came out or right simultaneously, but it didn't look like he wasn't drawn to look like Sean Connery. And then then the spy thing exploded and there was a man from uncle got a comic book. And then Marvel did Nick Fury, agent of shield, which was a man from uncle, which was uh, James Bond, you know, so 
everybody had secret agents, but no one did a James Bond comic. Now, the movies, the books and the movies were arguably, yeah, not really appropriate for kids. Kids watched them, but the morality in the James Bond movies, it would be hard to... Anyway, they just didn't have comic adaptations of James Bond in the 60s, which is surprising with his extreme degree of popularity, but in England there was a a newspaper comic strip, and that's what this is reprinting. Whatever. Whatever, dude. Here's a saucer attack. This is uh, comic books about flying saucers. And comic books and movies. It's So this is... I'm actually wrong. This is not just about comics. It's about Flying saucers in culture. I actually have that issue of fate there. I showed it on the four color fossils a while back. And I have, this is weird, I have that issue too. I showed that in that same episode of four color fossils. And going back to the pulps, how about that? There's a flying saucer in a 1930s Hugo Gernsback pulp long before. People started seeing flying saucers right after um, flying saucers started to appear basically right after the um, Hiroshima and Nagasaki. It's almost like, you know, Dave the Earth stood still. Hey, you guys are starting to mess with stuff that could have major consequences for the universe. We're going to start monitoring these people now and see what they're doing and making sure they don't F up too badly. And I think. That's why you know a lot of people think that's when UFOs started to appear. Okay, I gotta, gotta edit the next episode of X22 in Okay. Here is uh, presenting Houdini, his life and art. The big book about Harry Houdini. I might have gotten this at the same estate sale where I got a whole bunch of books on magic. Someone had passed away. Uh, that was a magician apparently and uh, tons of magic books there in the closet um, okay that's probably the word this is uh, Blondie and Dagwood's America it's got an introduction by Bob Hope oh Kevin is here from Gotham City Comics in Mesa, Arizona. Good morning and happy Easter. Happy Easter to you, Kevin. Book about 
Oh, um, yeah, I wanted to show him something. This is uh, all Blondie comic strips through the ages. Um, this is the nearly complete essential Hembeck archives. Hembeck was this um, cartoonist that would appear in the in like fanzines and do parodies of uh, comics. He's uh, he always drew elbows with little weird circles on the elbows. That was one of his big ones. Okay, Kevin, uh, the one that you found like a week ago, was it this one? This is volume two, or volume one probably looks identical to this with slightly different art. Anyway, I've got volume two. If that one that you found was volume one, I need volume one, but if the one you found was volume two, then I already have it, obviously. Um, oh. Monster Tales. This was a book I got as a real little kid, like in third grade. This might have been a Christmas present. It's got the original price tag of $3.95 on there. Look, it's got an introduction by Robert Block and that very strange early 70s kind of children's illustration. It's number one. Oh, great. Well, then that's what I need. Um, anyway, this is just one of those children's books that, yeah, I don't know how I got this. This doesn't really look like a Christmas present upon, uh, <laughs> but then, uh, you know, I was a weird kid. Uh, 73, first printing, 1973. That's about right. Don't put me in the zoo. By Robert Lopsher. One of these uh, classic old uh, Paulus says, Hey, Kevin, and Gotham City Comics says hello. What year is this from? Nineteen sixty. Here's one I Pretty sure I got this from Gotham City Comics. Casper the Friendly Ghost. He'll, he'll tell me whether I, I think so. From Dark Horse. Oh, look at this. It even has ads in it. Isn't that great? Um, yeah, see this, when they put the ads in there, then they know what they're doing. And so is this, who did this? Dark Horse. Yeah, some people know what they're doing because the ads are all part of the experience. Some people don't get it, though. Man, whoever put that book together understands. Here is uh, Witches, 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 selected by Helen Hope. Yeah. Yes, you did. Okay. This one was three fifty at uh, half price books. When did you think this book's from? About nineteen sixty. Close fifty eight. Printed in USA. Okay. This one. Oh, 
You guys probably remember this book. What year is this from? What do you think this book is? I'll give you three guesses. I'm trying to, okay, hold on. Ooh, hold out. Um, 1980, okay, that's what I thought. Oh, anyway, anyway it's uh, Star Trek Space Flight Chronology. So it, it traces the whole... <laughs> Very inaccurately. Well, anyway, well, it has like space flight. This is 75, which was, then it gets into the 21st century. And let's see what, these are the spaceships that we remember from a few years ago. 2024, you remember that spaceship that we developed in 2020? They have it on the timeline. Um, well, it shows the development of space flight over the years until, until we get to uh, closer to Star Trek, you know. And there's the real Star Trek. Then there's the, the newer Enterprise with the skinnier. Uh, there's a fold out here. Let me see what this is. Oh, it's a whole poster. Boy, you put, you have a poster on your wall of the history of uh, Starfleet spaceships that you're uh, probably not real popular in your school. Here's a catalog from a mock press, and they were. Uh, they were kind of like a bunch of, uh, they'd have comic stuff and, and they would have, uh, most of the stuff is going to be, you know, Timothy Leary, Aleister Crowley. Then they have a section of Jack Chick, but they're trying to be ironic with that. Yeah, this is basically, yeesh, stuff about the, what's his face, uh, the, uh, yeah, stuff about killers, you know, this is a, then they have a book about lunchboxes. It's pop culture mixed with really dark um, stuff, you know, they're basically, they're, uh, they're just a bunch of hipster devil worshippers, let's face it. That's what they are. You remember those tapes. I'm in the OTO. I'm so I'm so cool. Here's the spin again. This is a book about board games. Look at that cool one. Route 66 game. So there's the Davy Crockett game. The spinner from Life, the game of life. Yeah, so this is a whole uh, little trade paper trade a little book about games. Here's a book reprinting the first five issues of Creepy. I got this also from Gotham City Comics. That um, was James Warren's attempt to bring back, kind of bring back EC Comics there in the mid 60s. It's raining here, first time on Easter in 25 years. That's, yeah, he's in the desert, so that's unique. Sometimes they'll even reprint some of the ads, which are very important, but they don't reprint all of them. They've got the great Frazetta covers in there and everything, uh, all that stuff. What else we got? Here is uh, this book, uh, it's a historical book about uh, bad stuff that we don't want to talk about here. But anyway, it's just like a scholarly book on that subject. Here is this book, which I still have yet to read. 
that looks amazing. This was recommended to me by Kevin of Gotham City Comics. I've got to read this. It looks, it's a modern comic, but it looks phenomenal. And when he came on, was that yesterday or the other day, Kevin came on from Gotham City Comics and was showing he had a, like a whole rack of Geiger comics. And I don't, so I'm probably behind this because there's also this uh, other comic called Junkyard Joe, and this is part of that universe and um, from Jeff Johns and Gary Frank um, from Image Comics. So I'm assuming this is the first volume where I need to start and I'll need to go from there. So amazing. Ow, oh, my knees are cracking. Let's see, yes, start there. But how many of those um, trade paperbacks are there now of Geiger? Look like there, you had like a whole bunch of them. Um, or were those single issues you had? Friar Tuck says, does Jeff John still work at DC? It's a quick read, so just read it. It's the best thing out. Yeah, I believe you. It looks great. It looks uh, genuinely great. And that's hard for me to say about modern stuff. Here's a beat up copy. It is not, it was not beaten up by me, but by a previous owner, the complete fairy tales of the brothers from. I want, always want people to acknowledge that I would not treat a book like that. But when I found this book, I wanted to read it. And it's like, what, am I, what else am I going to find? The complete, real cute. Here's some, uh, here's Satan's music exposed. Um, Yeah, I find uh, music can generate anger or nervous tension. <laughs> anyway, that's fun. Here's a book. Oh, yeah. There's a guy named Phil Phillips. Now, I'm not talking about Phil Phillips that wrote the song Sea of Love which is a great song. So if you look up Phil Phillips on YouTube, you'll probably get the song Sea of Love, which was later covered by Robert Plant singing with the Honey Drippers, which was a super group of older rock stars that formed the band to do 50 songs at some point. No, Phil Phillips was a guy, and there are whole interviews with him on YouTube. I'm pretty sure they are. He, I think he was out of Dallas. He was writing about he, he in, the, in this book and in his many interviews on on TV shows, he was talking about how all these toys from the 80s and 90s look at how evil they made Yoda look. That these were all getting your kids in into uh, worshiping Satan, and <laughs> I don't know. Maybe he's right. This is the guy here. Look, that's his glamour shot from Starburst Publishers. 
A shocking expose of the toy and cartoon industry. It reveals the hidden dangers found in He-Man and the Masters of the Universe, Barbie, Rainbow Bright, G.I. Joe, Smurfs, Dungeons and Dragons, Care Bears, Thundercats, E.T., Cabbage Patch, to name a few. This book unmasks the new age, occult, violent, and satanic influences that have invaded the once innocent toy box. Turmoil in the toy box also explains the importance of play and how toys can enhance or stunt a child's development. In addition, this book provides the reader with an alternative to today's most more popular toys. So, it, this is basically like Frederick Wortham's book. Um, shows pictures of the evil and so this says jesus christ jesus christ crucified on a pentagram from a comic book i don't know what book that's from you guys probably know paulo will know what that's from he's an expert i don't know what that is there's uh jim um anyway so he did several of these books and then <laughs> This is a great one. Saturday morning mind control. Look how he's. Uh... Which turtle is that with the red bandana? You guys would know. He's hypnotizing everyone. He this dates it to a certain time the Batman movie had come out. <sighs> yes, indeed. Colorful cartoons enchant young viewers and tease their curiosity, but Saturday morning programming. Plays havoc with children's mental and moral growth. Let's see what we got in here. Yeah, it's the same author. It's Phil Phillips again. Oh, those were singles. So those were all probably reprinted in that book. Which okay. Here's another uh, punk rock book about. Bands on tour. I need to put that with those other punk rock books. Um, more of these Dan DiCarlo books, but these are smaller versions. This seems to have more of his artwork from men's magazines, but it's something to be careful. But it's all great art. But and that's Dan DiCarlo by, oh, it's weird that it's, the, the, the title starts here, the pinup art of Dan DiCarlo. It's, that's a very strange choice to start your title on the back cover and you have to turn it over. But I guess the spine gives you the complete title. And those are the writers, it's from Fanagraphics. And then there was a, a sequel, Dan DiCarlo 2. And again, they do it the same way. Pin up art of Dan DiCarlo. Uh, in some case, they reprint the back of the art. Um, so this is... Uh, this is what that is. So this needs to be shelved with smaller books. And then this, I believe I also got from Gotham City Comics. This is a smaller Casper book. Smaller, smaller than a comic book. You can see it fits in my hand. Um, so it reprints Casper and Wendy comics and spooky and color. And just printed a little bit smaller, almost like the size that is popularized by manga. And this is um, Zoria, Ray Torres the Third, the Monster War series. Here's decades, Marvel in the 70s. These are all, all these books, the last few have been, have come from Gotham City Comics. Groovy Ghouls of the Supernatural 70s. So it reprints first appearances like Tomb of Dracula, 
Um, I actually own some of the original comics. Like I own that one. And I, I own a lot of this in its original form. I own this comic. I remember buying that. Um, let's see how many of these I actually own. I'm, but you buy it. I don't know. I don't own all of it. I don't have that issue. So that's something that it has some ads too. That's cool. Um, um, so, some more of the black and white magazines from, from Marvel. And that one is from, oh, what is that? From? Yeah, this is a cool book. Batman Year One. I remember this being pretty good. It's up. It perpetuates the what started in Dark Knight that showed Catwoman as an older lady, and this is showing Catwoman as a Lady of the Night, which I I've always objected to. But other than that, this is a pretty cool um, book, just showing first year in Batman's career, but. I'm always going to be turned off by, by that depiction of Catwoman. I don't like that. But that's just how I am. Now, this, uh, when I first met Eric Breen on Four Color Fossils, he's telling me that Ed Brubaker is a great writer. So I would be at Half Price Books and I'd see a lot of these Captain America trade paperbacks and I'd see Brubaker's name. I'd pick them up. They were super cheap. So I have a bunch of Brubaker graphic novels or collections of issues that look like they're pretty good, uh, even though it's modern comics, because I was so impressed after watching Winter Soldier, it made me go out and get a bunch of these these kind of books, because I, I was just, I thought that movie was fantastic, because it was fantastic. Um, let's see, yes, that was from a great graphic novel collection I traded my amazing Spider-Man 24. Right, right, right. And then someone bought most of them. Yeah, that was, uh, let's see. Yeah, that's right. The guy couldn't take take him with him, take the books with him and needed a book he could just take on a plane. That's right. Yeah, they were his father's, right? Yeah, this is all... This section here is all stuff that came from from Kevin. Amazing mysteries. This is from Fanographics. It's all um, stories by Bill Everett, the great artist Bill Everett, creator of the Submariner and everything. It's just um, stuff you don't see reprinted or most people don't know about. Um, Amon, the amazing man. Yep. Okay. This is how they're reprinting EC Comics today. Um, this is an issue of, um, this is uh, volume one of Shock Suspense Stories. Um, I think it's a uh, really great and affordable format the, the colors really jump out at you um they have the letter pages the ads um they have the original the original art was all saved by gains so it was all shot and put into those uh russ cochran bound sets so the original art is accessible and then this is a all of these stories are going to be basically shot from stats of that original art. Um, and um, beautiful color. So this is about as good as EC has ever looked in these modern editions, which I really should get on it about getting more of this. I just think, well, I have almost all of the Russ Cochran, you know, the box sets with the black and white art right from the original art, but 
it's fun to read them in color and uh, uh, I don't have weird fantasy though. I thought I did, but I don't. They're, they're, these are being put out, these EC archives are being put out in hardcover and and uh, soft cover like that. These again, I got from Gotham City Comics. This is Tales from the Crypt volume three. Um, so that's that's the only Tales from the Crypt I have is volume three in this uh, this new style format, and it's just beautiful looking. Uh, ooh, I need to pause my recording of X twenty two. Eric Breen. Oh, Eric Breen's here. The new EC reprints of the best buy in comics today, in my humble opinion, and I agree with you. Oh. Oh, You know, these people will knock Stan Lee, you know, and I think, well, Stan Lee, he was an important part of our childhood. I mean, he really did bring something. It wasn't just that he just got this stuff already written by Ditko and, and Kirby, and then he just did nothing. He put his voice into it. And then when he says, you know, Silver Surfer's my, my favorite creation, and you think, well, eh, no, Silver Surfer was created completely by Jack Kirby and when he was when Lee first saw it's like who's this guy um but Stan Lee wrote the voice of the silver surfer and uh the the philosophical surfing through space all that was Stan Lee you know uh, Kirby just meant oh this is you know, Lee thinks, well, if I came up with the name, the Silver Surfer, then I'm kind of the creator. And, and, and it's the guy's talking, saying my thoughts. So we, that's kind of how, I don't know. He, he's no, he's not innocent. But, you know, I argue sometime playful, sometimes playfully with uh, Porter Mike about William Gaines. He seems to be kind of down on William Gaines. I, I mean, William Gaines created the high watermark of the whole comic book industry. But, you know, sometimes it's like in music collecting, people say, you know, the Beatles weren't all that. Well, how about the Floyd Dackel combo, Floyd Dackel combo out of Fort Worth that did Dance, Franny Dance? That song was just as good as anything on the first few Beatles albums. It's like uh, the Beatles. <laughs> it's okay. Well, yeah, Floyd Dackel combo was great. But, uh, you know, uh, it's just... Uh, um, you know, well, you know, Elvis Presley. Well, what about this guy out of Tennessee? This guy in Kentucky. You know, he was he was even better. <laughs> and and so it's like, well, you see, you know, well, there was better stuff, just just as good coming up from Harvey. And it's like, yeah, but EC was the high water mark. The other stuff was imitations. Sometimes it rose up that I, I just get into this. It's just like, don't insult William Gaines, man. <laughs> he did great stuff. So I get, uh, uh, you know, it's like, nah, don't do that, man. It's just, you want to root for the underdog. And it's like, to me, William Gaines was an underdog. I mean, his whole company got uh, basically uh, run out of business, but he survived with Mad. Oh, boy. Let's see. Uh, Someone from out of town just came in and bought a volume one. Is all this stuff that's still in print and still available for you to get copies? Is that is this something I need to rush on? <laughs> but if it's still uh, available, then I'll take my time. Um, get more books put over here. Oh.
Okay, let's get some more books. This looks like a fascinating book, The Story of Eli Whitney. I've always wanted to know about the creation of the cotton gin. Uh, let's see. Hurricane's Cult. Some of these books are... Um, going to be stuff that was um, the 1969 book. See, the thing is, I love books. And libraries are told to weed out their collection from time to time to get rid of books that aren't being checked out or books that have incorrect information or outdated information. You know, like, in other words, they still espouse that America is a great country, stuff like that. Anyway, they're told to clear out their library of those old and invalid books. How often they do that every summer. So book from 1969, that's just no good, you know. So they're told they have to destroy them. Uh, well, school libraries are told they have to go in the dumpster. They, they gotta be destroyed. So sometimes school librarians will say, here, take these books to the teachers and say, put them in your classroom libraries, whatever, just don't, I hate to th throw them away or they'll squirrel them away, hide them in the background. So, uh, or sometimes you can buy these books at public libraries when they're getting rid of them. So why up with these books that look like old school, oh, man, I didn't mean to say old, I hate that term, but you know, technically it is old school. The, the books that you used to see on the shelf at your school library that look like that, you know, <laughs> and cutback covers look like that. This is uh, something that, uh, and they would just scratch out the name of the school library and instead of tossing it in a dumpster, they would hand it out. This was uh, copyright 62, fourth printing, 1966, when I was learning to talk. Oh, Gary Davis is here. Uh, let's see. They're trying to rewrite history, so save your books. That's right, because they'll, you've got to keep the printed books, you know. Happy Easter, Gratu and Cleo. Thank you so much, Gary Davis. They're not making Amazon workers work on Easter. That's good. <laughs> yeah, buddy. Is that the link is in the chat if anyone would like to come on. If you'd like to come on Eric Breen, that's fine, but someone would have to give him the link on his Twitter page. If someone would care to do that. This is the Mammoth Book of Horror Comics. Over 50 of the greatest horror comics and graphic short stories ever produced. And uh, it's old stuff, but it, it's reprinted super small. I mean, this is a small book. And it's kind of grayish, like the uh, photocopied and, and a little bit smaller, but it's still, and it goes to modern times. There's a Mr. Monster story in here. Um stuff from Skywald Psycho. It's uh, it's a real hodgepodge of different stuff. I don't know what a mortal or vampire tale. That looks terrible. And yeah, uh, there's some Dark Horse book. Um, stuff looks like that. But I think as you get back to the beginning of the book, it's, it looks more looks more better. Yeah, 
There's uh, some torture chamber scene. Here's a, yeah, it's a weird hodgepodge. Here's a story from a fiction house comic, Rangers Comics. Uh, here's one from Journey into Fear. It's an interesting book. Uh, I guess I got it at half price books. It's the kind of stuff that would appear there. Here's some Bernie Wrightson books. Here's The Mutants by Bernie Wrightson. Um, price tag is half on, half on. Where is that from? Oh, well. It's a uh, black and white, beautiful black and white art from this is Bernie Wrightson art from when he first started in the late 60s. This is going to be probably stuff that appeared in fanzines or uh, probably tells you. See, Bernie Wrightson, this is an illustration from 1971. That, you know, if EC Comics had continued on, he would have been a perfect guy, a perfect fit for... Uh, Yeah, it has the dates. Most of this is from 69, 70. One story is from 66. Let's see his early story on page 32. Um, Yeah, this is this is the earliest story in here from 1966. He was uh, some of the stuff. Um, you see all the different influences. I mean, you can see Frazetta on that panel. Um, um, I don't know. It seems like I've seen some of his early stuff. Was it in an issue of Castle of Frankenstein? Um, some one of the monster magazines had some early, early, early. And here's uh, the Reaper of Love. Looks like it's reprinting some of the same stories in here. In fact, yes, it is. The other one had stake out. This might be everything that was in that other book, but more. In fact, I think that's the case. Um, yeah, and this is in, in, in order because it starts with that 1966 story. This may be the better way to go, this book, The Reaper of Love. It looks like it has everything that was in that book, The Mutants, that I just showed you, and more, and it's a hardcover edition. And uh, now whether you can still get this book cheaply, I don't know. It came from Panagraphics, $35. Uh, when, you ask. Uh, first printing in May 1988, so it's very recent. To me, that's recent. I'm, I'm, I'm not even joking. Okay. Um, these are collections of uh, of. Uh, These are collections. They're kind of uh, floppy. They're uh, collections of Tijuana Bibles. And uh, if you know what Tijuana Bibles is, then you probably know why Popeye's sweating there. But I, it's about all I can show those. Okay. The Basil Wolverton Reader, Volume 2. From... Black and white reproductions. It's very clear that the Basil Wolverton original art survived because these Basil Wolverton collections always have very clear uh, printing. So I'm not exactly sure how or what or who saved it or. Maybe he saved it. I don't know. But here's a book about Booty Rogers. A, uh, it's got a recommendation from Robert Williams, so you can 
this is a guy that had a really great style and he's the I mean, he was influential on another person, influential on uh, underground comics, and he did this uh, that hillbilly comic I was talking about earlier, Babe, the, the Amazon of the Ozarks. Um, yeah, I'm working tonight, says Gary Davis. Gotham, uh, Kevin says, did you see the Lucio Perillo Godzilla painting? No, I know that I know who I learned that name from is the Crypt Keeper of Castle Hills. He was always talking about this is a Lucio Perillo cover, and it's like, oh, so, so I realized oh, this must be a really good pinup artist of the modern era that seems to people will buy um, comics just for his covers. So. I'd like to see that Godzilla cover. Okay. And that tells you everything you need to know. Trump is using all the information and he's telling people Planet of the Apes revisited. Sure, a lot of you are watching Ben Hur today, Easter Sunday. And after that, you should make it a double feature and watch Corner of the Apes. Um, must have been a cutout. Someone has a magic marker. Well, mark, this was a comic my dad read when he was a little kid Captain Midnight. So, this is a one of those hardcover collections that usually sells for yeah fifty dollars but usually you can get them cheaper because nobody wants them except a few people like us i don't think that this is probably a bestseller and it probably just sits on shelves and bookstores for decades uh, because people just aren't cool enough to want that Um, let's see. Oh, Gary Davis just sent a message. Uh, always love seeing Pete the Cat on your show, my friend. I'm sure he'll be waiting for you and Cleo in heaven. God will heal your heartbreak of his passing. Call if you need to chat. Thank you so much, Gary. That's very nice of you. It really is. Um, okay. Yeah, yeah, Pete the Cat uh, passed away. Uh, uh, here's um, the best of the Three Stooges comic books, volume two. Now, I've never owned 
one of these old Three Stooges comic, comics from the 50s. I've only had Three Stooges gold key comics. But the great legend was in the chat yesterday. He said that those 50s comics of the Three Stooges smell terrible. I don't know why they smell terrible, what, what they put in the ink or the paper. But uh, <laughs> maybe it's better to have them in this hardcover of uh, collected form, if that's the case. And here's volume one of the Three Stooges. What's great is the uh, problem with the Gold Key comics is they've got, what's his face, Curly Joe Dorita in them. But this, you've got Shemp. <laughs> so. Oh, yeah. Three Stooges. Oh, there's someone talking here. Super wet and moist. Guillermo del Toro and Christopher Nolan wanted warned humanity to own physical media because the lizard people will change it or no longer make it available. Yes, uh, absolutely. Uh, that is exactly right. Um, whether or not you believe it's lizard people, there are evil people in our society that are trying to bring it down. They're trying to bring the whole thing down. And that was um, something that, yeah, Christopher Nolan, yeah, right. Because he did that with the Joker in, in, uh, in, in the Dark Knight uh, Batman movie, it's like, well, he doesn't want money. He just burns the money. He just wants to destroy everything. He just That's how these people are. Because they're agents of Lucifer. <sighs> Ooh. Yeah. Why do I own this? Was it a gift? I don't know why I own this. This looks like something that just, yeah. Understanding comics, the invisible art. You can just look at that illustration and know, I hate this. Um, I don't know. I mean, I just don't like people that draw like that. You know, give me Richard Corbin. But it looks like it's got some interesting historical stuff in it. I, yeah. I'd use it to light a fireplace, but I don't have a fireplace. So that's, that's how that works. The Comics That Ate My Brain. That's a terrible cover. I don't like that. Drawn by a fellow named Madman. Um, I like the back cover much better. Rats. These lower dungeons must be filled with them. Is that their plan? Am I to be eaten alive by them? Inside, you've got a pre-code horror comics, black and white, very typical of that time period in the early 90s when tons of these books came out. Yeah, 1991. That's just the book, the, the comics coming out from Marvel and DC were so terrible in 1991. This is what you would buy is the reprints of the old stuff when Oh, this is the Bill Bill Everett Archives Volume 2. I need to put that with the other one over there. This is um, more Bill Everett stories that uh, you never see reprinted from other companies. Well, this is an Atlas story. This is non... It's, well, there is superhero stuff, but it's not the superheroes that you would expect yeah bill everett was great yeah he's trying to do a flash board kind of thing. um what is this Uh, 
new interpretation of the intimate connections between among politics, economy, and religion during the Second Great Awakening. Uh, a shopkeeper's millennium, society and revivals in Rochester, New York, 1815 to 1837. This is the type of book that they would force you to read in a college class, but you're probably not going to read it for, that's not going to be the first book you would pick up. Somehow exists here, but I don't remember buying it. it must have been given to me or left free on a doorstep. Here's private files of the shadow. Five classic tales of the original Dark Avenger by the legendary team of O'Neill and Kaluta, represented for the first time in full process color, plus an all new story written and illustrated by Kaluta. So, yeah, the, the shadow was uh, around for a brief while in the early 70s from DC. DC had the rights to the shadow, and this was a very good adaptation of it. It just uh, didn't last. Don't. Special giant issue featuring the secret origins Superman, Batman, Green Lantern, Wonder Woman, Flash, Adam Strange, Manhunter for Mars, Green Arrow, Challenges of the Unknown. What are people saying there? Digital comics have no smell. Yeah, that is true. Just great stuff. It's um, um here's um, Sandman by Joe Simon and Jack Kirby. Oh uh, boy. There's the comic book reader's companion, an A to Z guide to everyone's favorite art form from Ron. No, art form, Ron Goulart. And this is has some illustrations. So, the illustrations kind of look like photocopies. But, but it presents well. Okay. Oh, an old co-worker from years ago before I retired just sent me a happy Easter message. So I'll respond. Happy Easter. You don't, you don't say same to you. That sounds uh, same to you, buddy. That would be funny if I type that. What do you say? Happy Easter to you? To you? Um, I'm not good with social interactions. Um, happy Easter. What do you say when someone sends you a message like that? Uh, did you find any eggs? <laughs> ditto. <laughs> Briar Tuck says ditto. I don't know. Somehow that just seems a little yeah, creepy, man. I'm mean, no offense. So that it's just like, I, I don't want to sound like a jerk. Like, of course, I am a jerk, but I don't want to sound like one. Happy Easter. It's like you want something, you know. Spiritual, you know, like God bless you, that kind of stuff. Um, I'll just put Happy Easter to you. And I'll add a sentence. Hope you're doing well. I'll add that. That sounds good, right? Hope you're doing well. He's the custodian of the school I used to teach at before I retired, and he he also collects comics and antiques and things. And his great grandfather or great grandfather was in the Fletcher Henderson band. So if you ever uh, and 
He's related to uh, the Campbell Soup uh, founder. So how about that? And he says, thanks back. How about that? I warmed someone's heart with my heartfelt uh, response. Uh, okay. Twenty-five people watching. Uh, a lot of people don't have <laughs> things to do on Easter morning, man. The Easter Bunny stops bringing that stuff, you know. And then what do you do on Easter morning? I mean, you go to church. It's like, ah, oh, well, haven't seen you in a year. Or seen you since Christmas. Well, yeah, I mean, I've got to find a church. But um, Easter is a, an important holiday. But uh, that rat fink Easter money doesn't bring me jack squat anymore, man. Uh, Eric Breen says, uh, my uncle Jack, who considered John Coltrane hippie stuff, loved Fletcher Henderson. Yeah, he wasn't. This guy's uh, ancestor was not Fletcher Henderson, but one of the guys in the band. He could show me in photographs. And he grew up in the same neighborhood as the Jackson family. And uh, his dad was, I think, friends with... Uh, Jackson Five's father, you know, whatever his name was. I don't. And he was able to tell me that uh, Michael Jackson, in order to, he, he knows knew all the inside skinny. Michael Jackson's, uh, what they did to him is they gave him I think they gave him uh, did he say birth control pills? Some some kind of female uh, they were giving him because they wanted his voice to not change so he'd keep that Jackson Five high pitched voice that was, uh, and so they were give I think he said birth control pills. Do they have some kind of uh, female thing in them that uh, would do that? I don't know. They, but they were messing him up. Uh, that that's what I hear. You know, take it for you know could be just. Who knows what evil lurks in the hearts of Mr. Jackson? Estrogen is in those pills, huh? I would think so. John Gorris, 
Didn't they used to do that to falsettos, cut their goods off pre-puberty, get those sweet notes? I, I don't know when they did that, but... Uh, uh, What's incredible is you remember remember the Osmond brothers that one bad apple don't spoil the whole bunch girl. It sounds exactly like the Jackson Five. They let Dottie Osmond uh, live a little more normal life. I think I need to bring another bookshelf down. That's what I need to do. So that shouldn't take a uh, massive amount. I maybe should I bring you guys along with my phone? Oh, Thank you. 
minimizing that yes, the electronic voting machines have this communication and they're connected to the internet, which I find very, very interesting. But I've reached a report to the town say, how concerned are you that the electronic voting machines may be monitored remotely for internet connections to urban voting? I'm concerned Democrats Uh, Friar Tuck so where did Gratu go? I went up and got another bookshelf from the second floor and uh, brought it over on a uh, dolly. This is a uh, cut, the unseen cinema. So it's uh, um, That was always a strange painting that Basil Gogos did for Spaceman magazine. It's there because they're showing also Flesh Gordon, but it's uh, it's basically shows stuff from, you know, there's the pre-code era of comics, but there's also the pre-code era of movies before they brought in the Hayes Code in 33, and the movies before then were a lot wilder and a lot race here and so I can't even show you these pictures even though they're from the 20s here but uh, um, and then it goes forward to Andy Warhol's uh, Frankenstein and whatever else basically it's a book I can't show you uh, here's the book of the sub genius I first heard these guys uh, Philo Drummond and Ivan Stang on 57 WFAA radio news talk 57 and, and from Dallas I was you know, probably 77 78 they were on a local talk show and they're talking about this they're talking about slack and J.R. Bob Dobbs and and then as the 80s came in they became famous all over the country and world and it was just became kind of this weird little joke 
fake religion cult that spread among comic book people and rock and roll people and Devo became members. And it's like, it was always this, uh, saw this head everywhere from the 50s illustration um, ads, you know, the head of J.R. Bob Dobbs. Anyway, years later I would meet Ivan Stang at Joe Riley's birthday party. Uh, it's, uh, it was a lot of fun there for a while. He's got a YouTube channel. Here's a beat up copy of Blondie by Lester Bangs. Now, Lester Bangs was a great uh, rock and roll critic. Uh, and he, uh, he passed away, but he was a very uh, well-known Lester Bangs. There's a whole book about his life. He was kind of one of those... One of those greats. Look at this. Uh, uh, there's Debbie Harry when she's in the stilettos. It's uh, it's about the band Blondie, which uh, I don't know if it's in this book, but I can tell you that people just assume oh she has blonde hair that's why it's the band's called blondie that's not the case uh, um johnny ramon was always talking about his collection of world war ii memorabilia favorite comic book was weird war and he collected all this uh war memorabilia and he's just always talking about world war ii trivia and he was talking to chris stein and, and debbie harry and said mentioned that Hitler's dog was named Blondie and they took the name. So Blondie is actually named after Hitler's dog. And that's a, that's a true fact. I don't know if it's in that book though. Kind of doubt it. Okay. Okay. All right. Of uh, Little Annie Fanny, which we won't look at. Okay. Yep, yep. Stuff we're not going to look at here. Oh, look at that. Not that This is a history of burlesque. No, let's get these books over. My wife just sent me a text message that she's getting sleepy. It's almost noon, so she's completely on a vampire schedule. Uh, I'm going to need to bring another bookshelf down and kind of brace that one. Um, so we're in. Okay, yeah, he wrote for Cream Magazine. That's right. I was having a brain fart. Hi, Gratu. And all visiting Hotel Orloff from Roll Retreat, Virginia. Yes, thank you, Charlton. Uh, Lester Bangs used to write for Cream Magazine, Missing Mars reminds me, and he says, hey, Charlton and Foofs. Yes, indeed. Uh, I'm going to go get that other bookshelf, but I'm going to bring you guys with me this time. Because that bookshelf, if it doesn't have one behind it, could topple and hurt somebody. Now she's saying night grots. Okay, so.
I'll put the link in the chat if anyone would care to come on. Okay, so let me uh, call into my own show. I'll demonstrate how it's done. This is the link. So I would go to today's show. I go on YouTube and... Uh, There's the live show. I click on it. And I hit like. Okay. Then I go to the live chat and I click on the link. And then I'll get to it from Safari, I guess. Then it says entering the studio. Wear headphones, but I don't have headphones. Allow mic camera access. StreamYard would like to access my microphone. Allow. Okay, and then I, I uh, display name. What should I call it? Um, I'll call myself anti gratu Okay, so now I see myself appearing down below. So, stage. Okay. Okay. Incredible. Incredible. Now I'll, now give, I'll give the other, the other guy, guy the full layout. layout. Now, now I've got to put this phone into, into a. a... <sighs> Where is my? Ouch. Tripod. Not there. Oh, I bet it's up in the comic room because the last time I used the tripod was during yesterday's stream. Not stream, uh, whatever you call it. Okay. So. So. So what I've got over here, I'll give you a closer look. Um, this is what I've been filling is this bookshelf here which is stable, but the bookshelf behind it, this is a little wobbly. So I'm gonna put another bookshelf back behind it. Now on the other side, you've got just the, the backs of these bookshelves, which looks bad, but Gary Davis has a cool plan with, he, he's created rooms with bookcases and he puts posters on the back. And, uh, and I'm also gonna put some bookcases behind here. So let's go upstairs and see what we can do. So we get into the elevator. And I pull the cable. And I head up to this floor. And I have to line up the floors manually. And it says it's the third floor, so that's the correct floor here at the Hotel Orloff. All right, we got it lined up perfectly. On that tripod. Oh my gosh, someone vomited on the floor in the comic room. I need to clean that up. I need to clean that up like now, actually. Okay. 
Drew's been vomiting a lot. Bring the dolly up. That was foolish. Um, wow. Incredible. I don't know what this is even pointed at. Man. This, I gotta fix this tripod again.
I think I'm going to put a desk here um, in this spot until such a time as I can get more bookcases because I got a lot of books that don't have bookshelves to be put into. So I forgot to bring the dolly, but it's downstairs, so that's okay. So, oops, wrong direction. So. I don't know 
that's not good. There we go. All right, so I put this card on wheels here. You can see. You can see. So I this card I just brought down from upstairs. And uh, let's bring the other bookcase over. Um, Good evening, Charleston. Then he corrects himself and says, Charlton. Yes, indeed. Oh, I look there. Awesome. 
25 people still watching. Incredible. Okay. Okay, so we got some mad related books. Don Martin's droll book. Um, how, to, how to draw. Um, these aren't reprints from Mad, but stuff he did on his own. Looks like he tried to do his own comic strips for the newspaper. Yeah. There's a beat up. Not my childhood copy. I would not have treated it this way. It's a big book of spy versus spy. He was an artist that came straight from Cuba and didn't speak any English, but there were never words in the in the comics. So it all worked out great. He was fantastic. Here's a hardcover mad book from relatively, re I met, who is there? What is this, man? Oh, here's the original bill of sale. Gift receipt, Barnes and Noble. This was bought uh, 2013. This was given to me as a gift, I remember. But I have a feeling it was given as a gift to someone else who re-gifted it to me. But they knew I like monsters and they knew I like mad. So this is a great book. And it's, uh, this is actually great. Uh, eh, I want to see which is of East book would uh, parody. There's the Jaws reprint uh, again. This is uh, a musical, Manny Get Your Ghoul. It's great artwork there. But uh, still got words here on the screen. Rob Brown says, hello, my friends. We've lost three viewers. Oh my goodness, guys. Wow. Um, Nice, nice art. But monsters were extremely popular in the 60s. So, oh, I remember this with the Wally Wood art, the Mad Horror Primer. Look at the, the way the letters all have. Uh, it reminds me of those stickers you used to get from top with the monsters inside the letters. You, you could collect all the letters of your name and spell out your name and monster lettering. Uh, hey, Friar T. 
Tuck, Happy Easter, says Charlton, and Rob Brown says, Cool Giant Frankenstein, hardback, yeah, mad. This is Mad About Superheroes with an um, introduction from Adam West. Some of it's like from the modern era, like the uh, Batman and Robin movie. But they also will reprint the early EC comics Mad with the Wonder Woman parody, which was uh, really marvelous. Um... Yeah, that's the Plastic Man parody, also from the EC comic book. Parody of uh, the 89 Batman. A lot of this is just cross-promotion, because at this point, Warner owned DC, and, and uh, they also owned Mad, so it makes sense for them to reprint a lot of parodies of DC movies in Mad to things that they own and oh this is what I was talking about yesterday this was also in paperback form but this is a, a bigger tabloid uh, not tabloid but magazine sized form this is the mad morality or the ten Command commandments revisited this is one of those books where they look at mad from a uh, point of view of Christianity and the each Ten, each of the Ten Commandments, then they talk about how Mad has commented on that and how that is in uh, today, you know, making yourself a graven image. And then, so they're, they're showing that Mad is actually kind of showing uh, Oh, well, it's a, not from the mad people, but here's a book, a visual celebration of the art of mad magazine and the idiots who create it. It's a pretty thick book on the art of mad. This is a more sophisticated book. This picture of King Kong. Um, These were cool books, inexpensive and, and, and pretty amazing. It's um, the complete collection of everything Wally Wood did in Mad 1 through 23. And all the stories are in color. So if you're, uh, I mean, it's, it's a recent book from whatever. When I say recent, it could be 30 years old. Let me see when this came out. Come on, man. Uh, 2015, that's pretty recent to me. <laughs> And then they also had one of Will Elder. They might have had a Jack Davis one too, but this is all the Will Elder art. Like his King Kong parody. And I mean, this guy was, the, of course, his parody of Mickey Mouse is genius. Look at uh, this, this parody of uh, Mandrake the Magician. I like how. His assistant's holding up a Rita Hayworth poster. It's just brilliant. Parody of the Raven. There's the King, the King Kong parody. It's great stuff. Here's a book. A Will Elder book. Chicken Fat. Drawing sketches, cartoons, and doodles. I've got a print of, of this, uh, like a signed print of... Um, that illustration there. Yeah. Rob Brown says, nice Wally Wood, Wally Wood art book. I have that in the Bill Elder one too. 
John Carissa's match showed what a S show humanity was, is, left you nowhere to go except mis mis misanthropy, nihilism, or faith in something other than man or a mix of both. Yeah. Um, oh, these are... Uh, um, these are illustrations that Elder did for Playboy of, of pulp covers, parodies of pulp covers, which I can't, I'm not going to show you too long because they kind of inappropriate. But <laughs> well, what is this? Someone put um, a little cartoon that they cut out of looks like they cut out a playboy but it's not by will elder and here's a bookmark so i was not the original owner of this book interesting al jaffe was one of the last surviving artists i think the only one now is sergio Aragonis, but he just passed away i think within the last six months possibly um I lose track of time. Definitely within the last year, I think he was like maybe 101 or really up there. Um, but anyway, Al Jaffe was great. Um, it's very well put, uh, John Goris, your explanation of what MAD taught kids. Um, it's just Al Jaffe was great. What else can I say? Here's the art of Jack Davis from different places. I mean, he uh, I mean, he worked for Time, for Mad, for TV Guide, for it, it goes through every publication he worked for and shows examples of his art. Um, this. I've had for a while, but I think they just reprinted this. I just saw it at the Dollar General. It's like uh, every year they reprint these uh, mad specials instead of coming up with new ones. Yeah. Um, here's the Star Trek parody called Star Black. <laughs> Jack advice was just so damn good. I think spell correct James Davis to advice. Jack Davis was just so damn good. Yes. Oh, and he corrects himself, Davis. Yes. All right. Well, let's get these mad books up. Okay. Oh, we just gained a viewer. It's incredible. All right. It's fun watching someone do work. It's uh, not how to watch someone do work. Okay. 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 Thank you. 
Okay. How many people do you Here's that. Supergirl Archives Volume 2. I think I have two copies of this. Um, what are people talking about here? But hell, I wouldn't will other weren't slouches weren't was weren't slouches either. Uh, Kevin at Gotham City Comics in Mesa, Arizona, I says I didn't get I didn't get to go to the movies a lot as a kid, but I got every issue about of Mad and learned about the films that way. Yeah, especially the ones that are rated R. That's how you'd find out all about them. Cool, lol. Okay, so amazing, Supergirl. So that's uh, fantastic. Here's uh. Spirit Archives, Volume 7. I really should get... This is something I really should look into getting more of because uh, these will never be reprinted. When was, the, when was this printed? Um, Two thousand two. So that's 22 years ago, and it will never, this is some of the greatest comic art ever, you know, but Will Eisner's sidekick was drawn in a stereotypical way, so I don't think that anyone will ever reprint this. I can't imagine. Dr. Solar, Man of the Atom, the Gold Key Hero. This stuff was being reprinted by Dark Horse for a while, and there was so much coming out, I just couldn't get it all. I, I just see it coming out at Lone Star Comics. It's like, wow. I, but I didn't have the money to buy it all. That is one of the great painted covers that this comic had. And, and in some cases, like the, the art reproduction isn't great. Um, really, it, it, I, I looked at it and realized, you know, I got a lot of the Dr. Solar content, maybe not every issue, but a lot of them. 
And the original, having the originals really look better than these, I don't know how it's coming across on StreamYard, but the original comics just look better. And, and Dr. Solar, as far as I know, isn't that expensive a comic. I don't think there's a huge clamor from the comic Tom type people, the speculators about Dr. Solar. So those books, if you can find them, you're not going to find them in your local comic store, but you know, mycomicshop.com. You can still get those books. So uh, well, maybe that's, this is going on. But uh, it was a $20. Yeah, but that was probably a couple decades ago. So $20 was a chunk of money. And it's still rough on me now. $20, man. Oh, yeah, these are not good economic times. At least not for me. Maybe for you, you're doing great. Uh, Fire Talk, who was the artist on Solar, the interior artist? They give the artist credit. That's one good thing about uh, the, these uh, modern books, most of them. By Paul S. Newman, John Fujitani, Bob Fujitani. So I would imagine he was of Japanese descent. And Frank Bull. Oh boy, bull, bull. Paul S. Newman. I guess he put the S in there so you wouldn't mistake him for the movie star. Now, Paul Newman, when he's not in starring in movies, is writing or illustrating. Uh, uh, okay, Thunder, King of the Thunder. Frank Frazetta. This is from Dark Horse. This was a uh, $50 book when it came out. I can't imagine I paid $50, but I mean, it's worth $50. It's Frazetta, but I can't imagine I paid that, so I imagine I paid less. But it's uh, early Frazetta stuff. Okay, then you get into the uh, <coughs> Reprints of Gold Key Flash Gordon from Dark Horse. And this was a $50 book. They're playing off the Flash Gordon movie because that's about the time period that these Gold Key comics came out. And actually, it does reprint the movie adaptation in here. So that's probably why they put the uh, Sam Jones in the back cover. But this is uh, Al Williamson. Who is a big, uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> the movie was really cool, but the, the way he makes that movie look, man, can you imagine? Yeah, it was a, it was a great movie, but, but just imagine <laughs> Al Williamson's vision of it. Yeah. Yeah, and then it, yeah, most of this is, and then the other issues are more, you know, Flash Gordon's made to look like Alex Raymond's hero instead of the, the guy with the feathered hair. Um, that's great. That's number uh, volume five. What are you barking at? The Easter Bunny finally get here? Can't be any delivery person on Easter Sunday. Here's volume four. And I have a lot of these original comics, uh, but this is this is volume four, hardcover edition. Yeah. The art is, is a very good recreation of Alex Raymond's art. It's it's nice. Um, that's when they brought Flash Gordon back. It says Flash is back. That was, yeah, I bought that issue off the stands. Um, we're making salad dressing. Oh, yeah, Paul Newman. Okay, so that's four and five. Volume three, I think this is going to be uh, Charlton. Uh, 
Yeah. So I guess they kept the same numbering when Flash Gordon went from Charlton to uh, Gold Key. So it's considered the same run. This is volume three. So this is uh, earlier from, this is more um, Silver Age. Oh, who's doing that? Interesting. Number 13 uh, here, the artist is uh, trying real hard to do Frazetta style. That's cool. And they've got some of the ads reproduced in here. So uh, my, my hats are off to Dark Horse for that. And then here is the... Uh, Last Gordon, I have this from when the movie came out, this hardcover, this is the hardcover adaptation uh, of the of the movie. This is what we were just looking at, but in a slightly bigger form. Um, this is the way to, to read it in this bigger format. Um, okay. okay. So, one thing I noticed upstairs is I have this Kirby King of Comics book, right? And this is a soft cover with these, you know. But then I also have, and I have this bigger version of it. It's the same book. Um, look at this back cover. The same book, that one might be a cheaper version. Um, just, just great, great stuff. So, let me get this stuff up on the shelves. over my light. Wonder what happened. Oh, there you go. You ruined my childhood. Okay. Mr. Viscount. Oh, there you go. Uh, what's going on in the uh, chat here? Eric Green's watching. Cool. Flash Gordon started at King Comics. I read issue one about an hour ago. Al Williamson on art. Cool. Um... Charlton, I have a soft cover of the Flash Gordon adaptation. I never knew there was a hardback edition, very nice. And then they also was were comic book, like several issues of the comic, I think, like uh, the morons call them floppies, you know. The oddly compelling art of Dennis Kitchen. Uh, 
Not much. Some art I can show you, but some I can't. He was an underground guy. Oh, this is a book about Custer's Seventh Cavalry from Fort Riley to the Little Bighorn, right? Now this book, there you go, son. I can't show you the whole photograph. Uh, maybe I shouldn't show this, but this, <laughs> uh, yeah, it's a picture of a, a soldier that's been left naked with about five arrows in him. He's scalped. He's cut open. Yeah, I, I should. I'll cover up the bed. You yeah, know, it's just horrible. So. Uh, so that's maybe why. Oh well. <clears throat> so uh, let's see. Flash Here's uh, what are we talking about here? Oh, yeah, same stuff. All right. Here's a um, John Carter adaptation from recent years, possibly around the time that the movie came out, I guess. Uh, looks, looks okay. Um, Here's a reprint of John Carter of Mars from the, the, the DC stories that appeared in Edgar Rice Burroughs' Weird Worlds. Someone on YouTube posted a little video of the shop yesterday. Oh, cool. I'd like to see a link to that. Maybe you could send me a link on uh, Instagram. Yeah, there's a uh, John Carter with Wula. His faithful Martian dog. This is how it was all depicted in uh, DC Comics. They did a good job with it. And then here's adaptation of the Dell stuff, the Jesse Marsh years uh, from Dark Horse. So this is the Dell, this was later reprinted by Gold Key. And this one's also from Dark Horse. And then this weird edition, The Princess of Mars, a graphic novel. It doesn't look like something you'd want to read. It, uh, it um, it's almost more kind of manga looking. But it looks like it's an okay adaptation, except they make John Carter kind of look like a 
caveman with a weird, and then the way they draw, it's just uh, something's a little demented about uh, about this. Um, and how he draws the Thark is very, he or she or whoever. Oh, and he draws complete nudity and John Carter and everything. So this is more of an adult uh, adaptation. And, and this, is, this reeks of being something from another country. Let's see where this, it's just, it's not how people in the United States of America do comic books. Let's see here. Oh, distributed in Canada. That could explain it. No offense to those. Yeah, Toronto, Ontario, Canada. Printed in China. Ooh, horrible. Where did this come from? I don't know. Very strange. Who is the uh, person behind this? I have to know. It's it's all right. <laughs> It's it, as they like to say. The kids like to say it. It's it. It's it. It's it. I had a friend whose last name was it, and then when it became the slang for all right, he'd hear his name all the time and think, "Oh, someone talking to me? Someone said it." Uh, yes. I've got a million crazy stories. Um, posted a link on Instagram too. Um, why it's the rock and roll generation. That's a book everyone has. The Art of Playboy. T uh, introduction by or text by Ray Bradbury. Uh, how about that? Nice art like this. Fantastic. Incredible. Okay, so Heritage Comics used to put out these fancy books showing what that's actually pretty nice. Look at the way the light shines on that. This is a catalog that shows everything they've got up for auction, and it's got nice color photographs and fun to look at. This is like original art from Mad. Um, the price for this is actually $30, uh, originally what it was. Um, this is for the big time uh, bidders. This is from 2001. This is a Heritage Comics signature auction from March of 2002. On a print. Yikes. Man, a CD just fell out of this. There's a whole CD that was in this thing. Apparently, that Frazetta art was up for auction that year. I wonder what's on this CD. Or maybe it's a DVD. I need to put this on the DVD player. Take a darn look at that. This original artwork for sale. For <clears throat> this is for the rich people. Lots of original mad painting covers. So, this one's from July 29th, 2004. Um, these are fun to look at. I Ah, this original Vampirella painting was up for auction. And that Detective Comics and 3.0 is for auction. This nasty looking copy of Action Comics number one. <laughs> yeah, that gives me the creeps, the condition it's in. Now, that, that looks like a book I'd like to read. I, I wonder if there are reprints of that from Guandonaland or something, Catman. Yes, indeed. 
post the link here on my community tab too. Yeah, I need to look, I need to see that. Um, this is October 2004 heritage. It's like they had a bunch of Dick Tracy stuff up for Dick, a bunch of Dick Tracy stuff up for auction. Um, I think this is all Dick Tracy in this catalog. Must have been a major Dick Tracy collector. Uh, all this stuff up here is a. Uh, Another one from 2004. Yeah. Wow. So 9.0 copy of uh, Green Lantern number one. Looks like uh, Kevin's here from Gotham City. Now, he's not open today, so this will be him from his home. <coughs> hey, Kevin, what's up? How you doing? Oh, pretty good. Oh, you're showing the painting you were talking about. Look at that. That's pretty cool. It's pretty good, huh? Yeah. Is that a cover of a comic book or something? Yeah, but it's it's one of those store exclusives, so I won't be able to get it. Uh, that power goal comic, what would it cost to get one of those from somebody that had it? To buy this comic right here? Well, that or that power girl I was talking about the other day, where it's... Uh, this I think this Godzilla is 20. That Power Girl is probably going to cost 25, maybe. Yeah, and you have to order it from stores that order giant quantities, huh? Yeah. Oh. A store like this that's doing that their own cover, they'll be able to get all the ratios because they have to produce this, uh, a certain amount of their own cover. So they'll be able to get a ton of those ratios. Oh, okay. So this, they, if they had to print a thousand of these, you know, they're gonna get ten of the one in a hundred. Yeah. So they're doing this book for the seventieth anniversary of Godzilla coming up. Oh, okay. Oh, they have a. We need to pay for our army. Work harder. You need to make their pressure. Work harder. That's actually what they're doing. Arthur Adams did a one in fifty. This is probably an old. Is this an old piece of art? Yeah. Hold on. I stepped away for saying. Oh yeah, look at that. Do you ever go to the community tabs on uh, on YouTube? No, only on that Todd E. Walnuts because I, I saw he. I didn't even know that existed, and but he was uh, talking about me on his community tab and telling people to subscribe to me, and I was getting a lot of subscriptions, and so I discovered that existed, but no. Um, <laughs> I need to post more on there because I just realized I posted this last Easter. Oh, yeah. So I haven't posted very much on here. 
Yeah. I must have done this one on Christmas. Here's that video that someone just posted. Oh yeah. Do you want to watch it real quick? It's only it's only two yeah, minutes. Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. See if it's too loud. Welcome back to another episode of Phoenix Pop Culture. Today we are checking out Gotham City Comics and its new location in Mesa on Country Club, uh, right between University and Main Street. As soon as you walk in, you're greeted with an impressive amount of comics, old and new, as well as newer release issues on the wall. The store isn't huge by any means, but it is split between uh, the comic book side and more of the collectible side. So on the collectible side, you've got all kinds of different figures and statues and, and collectibles from various properties. A lot of horror, Godzilla, wrestling, and so on. There's actually quite a few nods to various Disneyland rides in the store, which I really appreciated. It's been a few years since I visited the original Gotham City uh, before it moved, but I don't have any reference to uh, the size comparison, but uh, the store has a nice amount of uh, merchandise and selection, so I definitely recommend checking out their new location. Good. Uh, you know, I know it's been a couple of weeks since the previous episode, but uh, I was recently, I came on Expo, so a lot of... Did you know that guy was filming? I didn't know he filmed. I saw somebody filming, but I didn't see him filming as much as he did. But he didn't. Did he introduce you himself and tell you? No. He didn't. he didn't introduce himself or nothing. Oh, okay. That's pretty cool. Um. Oh, he just he said. He replied to my comment on his video. He said it was his pleasure to do the video. Let's see. So, how far is Mesa from Phoenix? It's just it's right next to it. Okay. If you drive what, five minutes, then you're in Phoenix. Oh, that's why he put on the title Phoenix Pop Culture Shop because just more people know Phoenix than know Mesa. Yeah. Did you end up finding more bookshelves, or you just have extra ones? No, these are uh, bookshelves I'm just bringing down from upstairs, and then when I get new bookshelves, they'll go back up where those used to be. I just wanted to make this more of a library. I I don't know. Really, I'm just trying to distract myself from everything going on in my personal life and in the world. <laughs> just give me something to do, because uh, these are not... But things will get better. They got it. Can't get any worse, right? Um, but at least you got yeah, good bookshelves. Like the one, the one I just bought is uh, the IKEA one, and those things like it's already ready to fall apart, and I just built it. Yeah, yeah. I never heard of IKEA until that movie Fight Club came out, and I think the guy. And the movie was real proud that he had all Ikea furniture. And I was like, I guess I asked someone at the time, what's Ikea? And it's like, oh, that's this trendy place. And then they brought one to Dallas. 
I went in there one time. It was like a maze, but it wasn't any. It wasn't the kind of stuff that I like. But I sure could use some bookcases. Boy, can I use some! I'm just gonna go and buy stuff at these uh, uh, used stores. I think. Yeah, or. You might be able to do well on a Facebook marketplace, maybe. I don't know. I check. Nobody has them on there. Yeah. Or they sell right away when they post them. I mean, if everybody has this IKEA stuff, it, it doesn't last. You don't even have something to sell when you're done using it. Let's see, uh, there's a place that on Main Street by the by the old store. They have some cool furniture. Let's see if they have anything. Yeah. You'd like to suppose they have uh here's their logo. Oh, is it is it a fifties kind of furniture place? Yeah, they have all they have is pin. They have furniture and pinball machines, and they do pinball tournaments there. Oh, that sounds like a, a pretty cool place. How far is that from you? Half mile. That's a half mile from you, man. Yeah, that would be that would be heaven. Yeah, let's. I need to get one of these record. Record box things. I dig it. Uh, Here's their pinball. Pharmacy. I never seen that taxi pinball. Is it the from the movie Taxi? Do you know? Let me see what you got there. Hold on. Um, what now? Let me let me make that full screen. I never seen that taxi pinball. Is that the move when the movie came out? Uh, taxi. Whoa. Where is the taxi one? Um, I think that's not related to anything. Um, taxi was a TV series. I don't. I think that just uh, some original idea they had. Um, I can't. I can't make out what all these are. Um, you can see yeah, the there, there's a rush. Yeah, these are. More recent uh, machines. The one on the far right looks like an older machine. Uh, yeah. That that one you can tell is maybe late seventies, but everything else is. When I say recent, I mean the last twenty years. You know where it's all computerized, and everything. Looks like they replaced that that one that's glowing real blue. That that they put in LED lights in that, which. Some people like, but it, it gives it kind of this weird bluish glow that is not 
what I'm used to from a pinball machine, but they, you know, they last longer. Um, that's wild. Uh, and is their furniture affordable? Um, I don't know if they have prices on here. Oh, this one's two ninety five. Okay. Like this. Wait. Well, that looks like something good to put a TV on or a record player, and they'll keep all your records under here. Oh, is oh, uh, if the record player comes out from the bottom, it would be good. But if it uh, if if it opens from the top, then you can't put anything on top of it. Um. Yeah, I'm not sure what that is. Yeah, there's probably stores like that in, uh, in the neighboring city to me, but I think I'm pretty sure there are, but I haven't just gone there to discover them yet. See, that would be really good that what you just showed for displaying like Aurora model kits and things uh, behind the glass. You could have, uh, you know, little statues and things. Yeah, I bet where you're from, you could find a lot more old stuff like this. Well, you mean in Texas or where I'm at now? Oh, no, where you're at now. Well, I don't find anything really. Uh, what I've discovered is a di there's a regional difference, you know, in Texas, they have a lot of garage sales and I've seen a few here, but uh, they have estate sales. And in uh, um, here, it's mostly auctions. So, uh, Someone passes away, they have auctions. They don't open up the house to people. So I, I guess that's a regional difference, but I'm not used to auctions. I wouldn't be comfortable with an auction. Um, the state sales were always interesting. At first I was creeped out by them, but I got over that. But it, it's always interesting, even in the state sales were you don't find anything in that you want to buy. It's just interesting to see the architecture of the inside of the house and, you know, houses from different time periods, uh, that kind of thing. Um, gosh. <clears throat> Another armload of books. Let me. Uh, call oh, here's a cool. Master. Here's a cool pinball machine. Oh, uh, let me make that bigger. Yeah, that is. That is. I've never seen that one before. But it looks to be seventies. Um, yeah. Oh, the girls put up a new video. Did you see earlier when I was showing this girl I just discovered on YouTube with Tourette syndrome? No, I saw that Sapphire just posted a, a music. Let's see. This is her video today. What does she do on her video? She just <laughs> she just curses and and has weird tics, but she uh, she's apparently a big hit on TikTok, and this this is her on YouTube. Looks like she's on a car trip. This may not. I haven't seen this one. It may not be spectacular.
She has much better. Uh, one, the ones where she's cooking are pretty spectacular. John Gorris is impressed. It says, man, that's a clean keyboard. Um, I've never even cleaned this keyboard since I got it. Yeah. What, what, I'm surprised it's not all dusty. I, I watched we, my wife and I watched so much of that last night that anytime I go to YouTube that pops up first. It's uh, they've, they've, the algorithm thinks that's what we need to see. Um, uh, what do we have there? It's a bar. Is that at that store? Yeah. Maybe I'll buy that. Um, it's raining pretty good outside. Yeah, that's cool. Probably rains all the time over where you're at, but here I don't get much rain. Well, it hasn't rained a little bit. Why am I not getting a picture? What's wrong with this? Hold on. Hey, have you ever seen the eyeball lamp? Um, I'm not sure. I seen a picture of one. It's really cool. Here, I'll send it. See if I can send it to you. Are you still there? Yeah. Yeah. 
John Gorris is impressed. He says, she expresses what I wish I could. <laughs> um, oh, there we go. Are you sending me something to uh, click on to show or something? Grab some books real quick. These hand chairs are neat. The what? These big old hand chairs. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah, my friend had a big red hand chair. Um, my friend Tom that passed away. He had everything. Is it the same one as this one. Let me see. Yes, but it was red. He said they were really valuable. I guess it depends if you have a real one from the 60s. I don't know. Oh. I don't know much about those chairs. They, in their post, they said they got so many phone calls for those. Really? Yeah, I think they're very much in demand.
more here. Okay. That's it for now. Would you grab books or a shelf? I'm no, all the shelves are down there now. No, I'm just grabbing books. Uh, but it sure beats going up and down stairs. Oh, they have one of those cool Christmas trees. Okay. This thing Mars says Tretz is sad to see. Uh, true, but sometimes it's hilariously funny too. Uh, but I know it's hard for I me. Mean, this girl's got a boyfriend and she seems to have a happy life. She's very popular on TikTok and YouTube and probably making money. So, but, uh, and she's aware that it's funny. You know, some people think she's faking it. Um, happy Easter, everyone, says Meyer. Happy Easter to you. Here is, uh, oh, I didn't have my Batman from the 30s to the 70s book that, uh, reprints. Batman stories in black and white. This is part of the the wave of nostalgia. Yeah, they're all black and white. There's a little color section, with some covers, but this is a book you probably checked out of the library a lot as a kid. This was a part of the nostalgia boom in the early 70s, along with this one. And there's a Wonder Woman one too. Where is that book? It's here somewhere. This is the Superman from the 30s to the 70s. There was also one of Captain Marvel, which I never got. I think I saw that at a half price books. That I can tell. This one's got a, an actual color story in it, but most of the book is in black and white. So that's that. This is a book on the Mad Peck. It was um, great kind of underground cartoonist. He's cool in that. Um, is it? He, has, he would give you tape recipes. Here's the songs that you need to put together. It will time out exactly the size, you know. Here's tape recipe number six. These songs will time out exactly to fill your... Uh, cassette tape but he would do these comics with uh he, he used harvey's the black cat and he would it would just all be stuff he kind of took or stole from pop culture and some of it would be stuff that would appear in underground kind of hippie newspapers but uh, lots of collage stuff and then he's the guy that designed the look of this book, which is one of my favorite books on the history of comics. Comics, History of Comic Books in America by Les Daniels. 
graphics by Mad Tech Studios. I thought I just heard thunder outside. Maybe we're getting some of the rain from down there in Mesa. So he, he did really creative things. This is a great book. It, great EC stories. Uh, uh, it has the whole comics code, the text of the comics code in there, uh, word for word. Uh, is it rain? Let's take a look. Okay. I thought I heard thunder. Um, Light rain forecasted starting in nine minutes. Yeah, the thunderstorms at 3 p.m. Yeah, we're getting rain today. That's why I thought it looked like rain. How about that? All right. Okay. This is a golden age of comic books. This is a pretty common book. It's just reprints of covers with really this book is I think designed to just be cut apart and for people to frame these covers. Um, but since most people don't like to do that to books, you'd have to get a second copy. But this is, um, this came out in the 70s. Um, Richard O'Brien, August 76. Is that the Richard O'Brien Rocky Horror Picture Show? I doubt it. Did I ever show you my Dell bookshelf? I think it's Dell. No. Yeah, let me give you full screen. I don't know. It's, out in the, it's out in the garage. I'm going to see if I can find a picture of it. Oh, okay. So rather than go out. This is a. You wouldn't be able to see it in the garage. It's buried. Oh, is it Dell Comics or Dell Paperbacks? Let me see if I can find a picture. This is uh, the big, uh, great comic book heroes book Jules Pfeiffer put out. I think it came out about 65. This was the first, you know, treating comics really well by a. Jules Pfeiffer, who is a respected cartoonist, has the origins of Batman and Superman and um, the Green Lantern's origin. It's it's really great, great book. Um, this is a big Buck Rogers book, the collected works of Buck Rogers in the 25th century. Lots of uh, daily comic strips and. Sunday it's like, it's like this one. Let me go to you. It's like this oh one, but my it's, gosh. Uh, it's been painted over. So. Oh, okay. Yeah, you showed me a doll, but yours doesn't have the words on it, right? No, it's is been painted yours? probably a bunch of times. Okay, no, but the one I have been it's all, it's all black and painted. Okay, but all your artist friends, don't you think you could get someone that could recreate those words from that picture? That's a good idea. Yeah, you got to do that. You got to restore yours. So, yeah, someone that's artistically talented could do that. You might even be able to do it with, you know, trade uh, comics to somebody and they do that for you. That's great. It's a good idea. Yeah. Who do you? you, you, you yeah. You seem like we got tons of artists. 
doors. Yeah, that's amazing. That's cool. Obviously, they're trying to shut out the competitors by giving a free rack to the uh, bookstore. That's like, but the catch is you can only put our comics in. Here's the great women cartoonist. I have to save that picture because then I can. Oh, yeah, definitely. I've seen. What other exclusive racks have I seen? I think I've seen Dell. Um, yeah, I don't know. Here's a book about women. Here's another one. Comics. Maybe uh, mine's this one. Maybe mine's this one. Well, uh, let me give you a full screen on that. Oh, wow. Uh, well, if that's the case, that would be great, too. Let me go. Let me go look. Yeah. Definitely get someone to repaint it. Um, this is a this is a worthwhile book. A lot of artists that you probably didn't know were women. That or no, this is not about artists. This is about girl characters in comics. Take two. So it's a. Uh, yeah, I think mine's that. I think mine's that one, the DC one. Oh, cool! Yeah, you definitely. I think. I think mine's. Because mine yeah, has it's... those these round curves. Yeah, that's great. And I great. looked at the yeah. bottom, and it has the same. And mine's doing this too, where it's get it gets messed up at the bottom here. Yeah. Well. I would say uh, hire someone see the and recreate it from that picture, I think. I don't think it would necessarily See, I can't tell that. the difference. I can't tell the difference because the Dell one looks a lot like that, too. Yeah. Oh, well, yeah, I don't know. I think it could be the same rack that the two different companies uh, – or it could be the same rack and just different decals or just different spray paint on them. Let me go look again. Yeah, it's an, let me see one, two, three. I have three shelves. Okay. Yeah, mine looks more like this DC. Yeah. Well, that'll be um, great to restore. Here's uh, Marvel's Greatest Superhero Battles. One of the Fireside books. This one I didn't have for my childhood. I got it later. Um, it's part of that series that started with Origins of Marvel. Look at this Comics. one. This one's neat. Let me take a look. Um, yeah, that one's That's neat. Okay. What does it say at the top? Dell Comics are good comics, yeah. It's a great way to display comics. I like this one because, yeah, nothing's covering them either. Like the shelf below, it's not right. covering the, the one and above it. 
And it's on wheels, too. Yeah. Of course, the comics can easily fall out of it, on the other hand, but... Man. That's neat. That's that's cool, because that's before my time. I never saw comics displayed on a rack like that. I've seen them displayed like magazines on uh, in an army... Um, you know, PX kind of environment. Um, but never on an exclusive rack. Here's the Dan Lee, Jack Kirby, Silver Surfer graphic novel. Um, I couldn't find these books for the longest time after I moved and I thought they were all gone. Here's a cereal rack. Oh, let me show. Let me look at that. Oh, that would be cool to have too. But <laughs> if you've got the room, but yeah. Are you looking at things that are for sale, or are those just pictures on the internet? There's pictures on the internet. Yeah, I imagine those would be pretty expensive. Um, here's Bring On the Bad Guys, which I think was the third in this Fireside book series. And uh, this is all the, the mid-70s stuff, and it was real exciting at the time. The second one in the series is Son of Origins of Marvel Comics. This uh, John Romita cover, it's like almost to the, it's like one step away from what would later be the Alex Ross style. You know, it's still comic book looking, but it's getting to be more realistic and, paint, and painterly. I have that, I have that yeah. book. Yeah, it's a great book. This one I got as a present as a little kid, and and then this one was a Christmas present. It was it was bent when I got it on Christmas morning. It's the way it was at the bookstore. But this is Origins of Marvel Comics, and I have that book too. Yeah, and of course this is where he kind of over, kind of he kind of overstated his, uh, you know how much he involved he was in the creation of the characters but um he was important so anyway that's uh those are the fireside books had those to the shelves uh, oh man Popeyes some kid came into the shop. Easy. Some kid came into the shop and he said he wanted to buy some old slabs. Yeah. Old book. Some so I grabbed out my oldest slabs. I had some amazing fantasy uh -huh. um stuff and he goes he was just uh, he was like, Whoa, that is old. And I go, Well, what is it old to you? And he goes, I go, like the nineteen nineties, and he goes, Yeah. And I was oh, like, he's oh, I don't stuff from the nineties. Yeah, he won a 90s uh, slab comic. Oh, boy. Well, he wasn't interested in the amazing fantasy. No, he won a 90s. I go, I throw, I sell my 90s stuff for like a dollar, you know. I'm not going to slap a dollar comic. Yeah. Well, those were pre-Amazing Fantasy 15, so he wouldn't be interested in something that doesn't have superheroes in it, probably. That's why I told him, I said, you've seen Amazing Fantasy 15, but you've probably never seen, like, 11 or 13. <laughs> and that's the ones I have, because those are the ones I could actually buy. Yeah. Here's Dan DiCarlo's Jetta. This was an Archie comic series. This is from Craig Yo Books. Um, and I think I've got 
one issue of Jetta, but I, I'm not sure. Here's a neat I've little thing to display comics in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's somebody hand built that. Yeah. My dad used to be good at making stuff like that. Oh, that would be good, yeah. Yeah, if he was still around, I'd have crazy displays like that. It was the art of Ramona Fraden, which I got from you, but then I realized I already had the copy because I'm mentally deranged. Let's see. Let's get these books up. Is there anything we haven't seen in your house that's fascinating? There's a spinner rack of some Caspers right here. Oh, look at that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, that's a famous photograph. Yeah. That kid, look how he's licking his lips. <laughs> Yeah, that's neat. There's a famous photograph of Boris Karloff with like his granddaughter, and he's put, looking at a spinner rack filled with like EC comics, horror comics, and that's a fake photograph. In reality, he's looking at like funny animal Dell comics, and someone has changed all the comics out to make them horror comics. Uh, but it's, it's still a cool fake photograph, but it you know not, have you seen that photograph with the dog um chewing up an amazing fantasy 15 is that yeah, fake i don't know about the origin of that one <laughs> i've seen that yeah that's pretty pretty great i don't know that anyone would just like oh let's take a picture of the dog that's destroying the it, that was probably like a fake uh but i wouldn't train a dog to chew on comics that wouldn't be a good thing Mad about the 50s. I've got tons of mad books. This one even reprints the Mickey Rodent story. I have, you're talking about the Dark Horse EC reprint? Um, yeah, I think so. Is Dark Horse who's doing the current ones, the, the EC archives? Yeah, but I don't know. Did they do them two different times? They have ones where they it looks like they switched the logo on. I don't know. That's why I I want to have a match and set. I have three, four, and five with an A. They switched the logo on me down here. Look. Um. Um. Oh wait, is this one? Different? I guess maybe one's not Dark Horse. Gemstone. Is everything, is the contents the same inside? Gemstone Publishing. I think it's the same book. It's just the publisher changed. Oh, man. That's I, I, what I think is going on. All right. I don't know who Gemstone is.
I guess it has the same. I guess it has the right, correct books in each of them. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. You ever open up one of your original EC comics to compare how they colored the inside of those uh, those modern archive books? Because I'd like I wanted I'd like to know that they tried to match Marie Severin's coloring as close as possible. There's a Wonder Woman book. What, that, what book are you asking about? Just any EC, have you ever looked at an original EC comic, the interior, to compare how the coloring looks in one of these modern archive books? I can't remember what the, uh, I don't think I've ever had a, an EC that wasn't slabbed. All the ones I bought it were all slabbed. Oh, you've never had a, oh, okay. I can never find them. Yeah, I guess you're right. I thought I, I I don't know. This has a bunch a bunch of pictures of Wonder Woman. I think they've all stuff. I think they've all been slapped, but I'm afraid to uh, crack them out. I guess. Yeah, you see, uh, you, yeah, you probably since the reprints are so readily available, maybe you ought to leave them in there. I I'm just worried that like the cover will fall off or the page will fall out. Yeah, yeah, I understand. Those are pretty historic, have, historically important. If I could find them, I would look through them. Yeah. Um, there's, uh, this is kind of a set. These, uh, what's this one? Oh, this is a cool. The Peanuts Treasury. Do you have this uh, Tales of Terror, the complete compendium of incredible yeah, old Yeah, I was comics. just looking at that one yesterday. It says good yeah. reference in it. Yeah, that's a good book. You ever find these? Yeah. The picture story Bibles from the Bible. Oh, yeah, I've never, never seen Are these? Person. Me either. Or these, the tiny tot. Never seen those in person either. These never see these. I wonder if they ever reprinted those Bible comics in the modern age. See though what those were like. I think I have one of these international comics, maybe. Unless I sold it to you. No, I remember you talking about having it. I don't think you were selling it. Is it that one? I it might be that one I have. I don't I don't recall, but I remember looking at the title, the logo, and thinking it looked a little like the way uh, an underground comics uh, logo would look. Yeah. They, about it. There was another one that looked kind of underground. Oh, the art in this kind of looks. 
Yeah. Yeah. Like this stuff. Kind of looks underground, huh? Yeah, definitely. What do they call this stuff? Pre-trend? Yeah, I think so, yeah. I finally found the book here that I was trying to, about a month or so ago, I was trying to remember what this book was called. And I, I, I and finally Paulo remembered what I was talking about. I was talking about a hero that flew around on a bird, but it's actually more like a dragon. And uh, I knew it was of uh, European origin, but uh, called the mercenary in the mid eighties. Did you hear about uh, Savage Dragon, what the guy put inside that book? No. Was it like male nudity or something? No, he put like, um, he put Mickey Mouse in there doing some terrible things. Really? In Savage Dragon? Yeah, in number 269, the, the latest issue. Yeah, what a, I wonder what... Man, Savage, wasn't there a Saturday morning Savage Dragon cartoon in the 90s? It's or like uh, he did like he did Tijuana Bible stuff with Mickey Mouse in there. Really? Yeah, I've I wonder heard if, that. I wonder if Disney's going to try to sue him, maybe. I don't know. He, he may be trying to. Of course, Disney doesn't have like a super wholesome image at this current time. Uh, their current image is trying to pervert our society. But uh, this is the mercenary. This is the book I was trying to remember what it was called. And it's wonderful art in it, but some of it I can't show because this guy is rescuing the princess. I don't think I've ever done, but usually she's not very well clothed. Um, the book on Max Fleischer Studios. You ever see this book, Snake Eyes? Post Popeye Picto Fiction. It's got Roy Tompkins in it. He was an artist out of Austin, Texas. And they even have Bukowski in it. This is the kind of like the 80s. Give myself full screen for a second. This is like 80s, uh, 80s underground. It was a kind of a new yeah, wave well, of underground stuff. Does it, does it have that lady in there that uh, I showed you? I had that art from her. Oh, maybe. What was her name again? I forget her name. Hold on, let me see. Um, I associate her more with the first wave of underground comics, but there's Clyde the Rat. Um, I don't know. Oh, this is Roy Tompkins here. Nineteen ninety, yeah. Roy Tompkins was out of. I'm pretty sure he was out of Austin. I got a lot of little mini comics that he had printed himself at the local Kinkos. Who's oh, that this lady? Is, this is great. This is uh, Spain Rodriguez's Trash Man Lives. Oh, here's her name, Sally. Let me Sally Sally something. Yeah, I didn't see her in there in that book. Of 
But this, uh, this is, of course, the original underground movement. And um, just this great, uh, the cars are really cool. Um, a lot of stuff I can't show. Um, great detail. Do you have any, uh, do you have a comic called Bad Planet? Um, it doesn't sound familiar. Um, what what is it like? I don't know. There's a cover that everybody's talking about right now. It's a Dave Stevens cover. Hmm. I don't know. I think it came out like 2006. There's there are cars that are very that seem to have influenced Tim Burton's Batman uh, Batmobile that you see in, in here. There was, of course, this is all look at these cars. Brass you know, man. Okay. That looks cool. That's it. There's Bern Hogarth's Tarzan book, which doesn't reprint old newspaper strips. It's an original from maybe 1972. Oh, this came from the collection of Michael Price. Who, he did a comic book called The Prowler, but he was a local movie critic for the Fort Worth Star-Telegram. He must have sold this to uh, Half Price Books. It's a story of Tarzan's origin as a young boy. It's a whole story, but it's mostly... Uh, it's beautifully drawn... But uh, a lot of uh, a lot of Tarzan without any clothes on, so because it's before he didn't put the loincloth on until he discovered human beings. So this is uh, part of that. Series. This is the Wonder Woman book I was talking about a minute ago. It has an introduction by Gloria Steinem. How exciting. Oh, look at this. Here is your review copy of Wonder Woman. Introduction by Gloria Steinem. Interpretive essay by Dr. Phyllis Chesler. Price is $12.95. Publication date is December 7th, 1972. This is the one they sent out. And this has, well, unlike the Superman and Batman one that were part of the series, everything's color inside. It's all color. So, and when they did the opening credit sequence for the Wonder Woman TV series, all the images, this is what they used as their reference for the cartoon and, you know, the animated opening credit sequence of the series. Um, from the same company, they were riding a nostalgia wave. There's bringing up father, which is a. Oh, let me see what you got there. Garbage pill kids, uh, preliminary drawing. Yep. They made uh, garbage, but uh, pale kid toys. That was for the box art, I think. What that was. Oh yeah, the, here's a package of the toys. Came in these little trash bags. Nineteen eighty-six.
bi biography of William M. Gaines. This is a great book. This is the ridiculously expensive Mad, which. Uh, This is the inside flap of a costly item called a dust jacket. It's supposed to keep this book from getting dusty. This was $9.95 when it came out in what year? Oh, this came from the Nicholson Memorial Library in Garland, Texas. This is from October 1969, first printing. Oh, and they even reprint the some of the extras from the special like these uh paperback covers or, and uh yeah this is a pretty nice book it's not in great shape because it was a library book and here's they reprint the the mad mobile which no one's ever cut out because it was a library book, you know. Uh, this was an earlier one, um, Mad for Keeps. This book was $2.95 when it came out in 1958, so this was earlier. So all the, all the stuff in here is going to be from the 50s, obviously. Oh, let's see what he's got there. You remember these old uh, art print books from the 70s? Let me see them again. Um, Uh, well, show me. I, I'm not sure I see the art's hard to see it. Yeah, I, I guess I probably do. When did artists start doing those in the 70s? Probably in the 70s. That um comic art got to be somewhat respectable i guess well wasn't it i i thought i saw a documentary recently that was talking about that yeah sure. how the artists were just getting they weren't getting paid that much and so they just started printing their own making their own prints yeah, that makes selling, them at, selling them at conventions Okay. All right. Ouch. Oh, man. I don't know if this book's any good. Um, it's an interesting subject about MK Ultra, but I haven't read it yet to see if it's. Uh, how decently written it is. Here's a um, Wonder Woman, modern Wonder Woman book, but I don't know if this is any good or not. I haven't read this one yet either. Looks a little questionable. You guys can tell me if this is something decent or not. Let's see. Meyer's talking. 
on my way to the store. If you guys are still on when I get back, I will join. Oh, cool. Here's a Avengers book. I don't know the. These are some books I got cheap at half price books, and I thought, well, maybe I should try to see if these modern comics are okay or not. Maybe I should give them a chance. And so I got these collected editions, and uh, this one is kind of looks interesting. Brian Michael Bendis is the writer. Artist Daniel Acuna. So tell me in the chat if this is something good. I don't know. This is a uh, ghost meeting a Batgirl that I don't acknowledge that as being Batgirl, but um, these were times when I had more money. <laughs> it just Buying stuff, I don't know if it's any good or not. I like the ghost character, but I don't know what that even is, that girl. This is a known quantity, League of Extraordinary Gentlemen. This is, uh, don't judge it by the movie version. Oh, what do we have here? Pee Wee Herman. I actually forgot I got this poster signed. Ah, huh. what's it a poster for? A uh, big adventure. Oh, okay. That that was that the poster at the release of the movie. It doesn't. No, this is a new poster. That's what I thought. It doesn't look like the art. Yeah, because Big Adventure. Oh no, no, Big Adventure was the first movie. Yeah, that's definitely not the art. He was riding a bike on the original poster. And then there was Big Top Pee Wee. And I think that was the last movie until um, that one that was on cable TV during the pandemic. Um, I thought I only got my comic signed, but I must have, I got this poster signed too. Don't you have the bike? Bike like it? This is going to do a number on my back. Look at all these books. Oh, oh this oh, is what? Oh, my gosh. I never showed you guys this. It's pretty cool. Wipe the dust off at first. I'm just seeing, do you have the lens cap on? Oh, there we go. Oh, look at that. And then here's a check that he wrote. Oh. How much was it for? Twenty-five dollars, and it was for look at ex, what was it for? Expenses, San Francisco trip. Meyer, if you're watching, when was it? April twentieth. So it was on four twenty. 
67. That was my second birthday. He went on a trip to San Francisco, spent 25 bucks. Wait, Paige, they, oh, is this when you would write yourself a check just to get cash out of the bank or something? Okay. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, that was before ATM machines and all that. Pretty cool, huh? Yeah. I used to have, I don't know if I still have it, um, a Lon Chaney check. Wow. Lon Chaney Sr. Or Jr.? I think, it, I, think, I think it was Jr. Oh, okay. See if I still have that. There's a Marvel Visionaries Jack Kirby reprints. Um, a bunch of stories in color. I don't know. There's another one. Roy Thomas. Just cool stuff. Um, there's a John Buscema one. These are pretty neat. Um, they're like $35 books. I'm pretty sure I didn't pay that. I'm, a, I'm almost 100%. Here's Marvel Monsters. Now, are these old stuff? Um, some of this, what is going on with that page? Two of these pages are fused together. There we go. Yeah. Yeah, sometimes you get pages stuck together. This book is, uh, it's got new stories with this new art, and then it's got um, some stories that kind of sort of look like old art, where it's set in the old days, and then they've got um, I don't know. Some original stories. Original. It's, uh, oh well. There's that. It's a collection of Days of Future Past. Oh. I have the originals, but and then I, like I say, and I've got a lot of these Ed Brubaker collections of Captain America based on Eric Green's recommendation that Brubaker is a great writer and how impressed I was with that uh, Captain America Woman Soldier. Marvel Encyclopedia, Fantastic Four. This is just a literal encyclopedia. Oh. Yeah, I was impressed enough that I just got tons of these cats. See, it still has the half price book sticker, which should peel off right away if you do it when you first get the book. But if you leave it on there for a decade, then sometimes it's hard to. Yeah, see, it's it's hard to get it off. I mean, eventually you can, but it's a pain. So I'll just leave it be. This weird illustration on the back. Um, yeah, I was just picking up tons of these Ed Brubaker uh, things because they were just a couple of dollars each at half price books. So I thought I'd try them out, but I still haven't read them. I'm not sure what order. I guess I could look inside and what order these stories are supposed to be in. More Ed Brubaker. This one's a little thicker. Uh, Uncle Skull wants you to wants you to die. It's, it's, that's interesting. All right.
Well, Brubaker must have been on this Captain America comic for quite a while. I picked up a bunch of these. Those were the days when Marvel was putting out good movies. Uh, it's hard to believe now. Um, this one is not Brubaker. I don't know if it's any good or not. Um, Missing Mars says video is all black at Gotham City. Yeah, well, it's, I think he has his camera down always. Uh, I think he's trying to avoid just showing a mess like that's how most people do. They just like put the camera down. Um, uh, okay, here's another Ed Brubaker collection. This one has an Alex Ross cover, so it has Gene Colan art inside. It says it does. But... Possibly be. Paul Dini art. No, he's a writer here. Um, oh, issue 601 has art by Gene Cole, and that must be at the back here. Yeah, sure does. Uh, Gene Colan art looks kind of disguised by modern coloring. Gene Colan art with computer coloring on top of his art. But that's definitely him. Uh, Briar Texas is still going. I guess like the Energizer Rabbit. Well, yeah, I guess I am. Oh. Uh oh, what am I being told here? The remember Cap is not very good. I would say Brew Baker is the last good writer on Cap. What is? Do I have remember Cap? Is that this thing? Oh, remember. I thought you said remember. Oh, this this stuff is not good. I kind of guessed by the fact. Look at his way he's got the bare arm. It's weird. Yeah, well, I got a lot of Brubaker. Uh, there's Monster Masterworks. Autocorrect, yeah. Now, this is all genuine 50s, early 60s marble monster stuff. There's none of this new, newfangled art in it. Do you say you wanted to see this another time? Yeah, sure. Let's, look at that, guys. He's got a recreation of the Creep Show ticket booth. See the rat too. Somebody asked if there was the rat was still is in there. Can 
Can you see him or no? Yeah. What was the story behind this again? What, what artist created it? Christopher Nelson. And that's a one of a kind. He didn't make more than one. Uh, he made. He's making one right now, but it's not as good. Oh really? Maybe I'm just biased, but it didn't look as good to me. Did he make that for you, or did you see it already built and, and buy it? I went to, it was either Monster Palooza or Son of Monster Palooza. Yeah. And they had it in their museum. And I contacted the, the curator and arranged me to go over to his house and buy it. Oh, neat. Christopher Nelson, if you watch Kill Bill, he's the groom. When they go to the church and she's getting remarried. Wow. But he did all the uh, special effects in uh, Kill Bill. I think one of his earliest movies he worked on was um, the Michael Keaton Batman. Look at this cool display case I got. Yeah. It was from the McFarland store out here. He had these uh, custom made to hold his um, pro like prototype figures. He put in these. Can you tell it's like a dome, like a bubble? Yeah. Eric says, uh, Cap 601 was one of the last things Colin did. Sadly, his age was apparent in the work. Oddly enough, the modern coloring techniques probably make it look better than it was. Yeah. What'd you say? The Todd, there's a Todd McFarlane store there? There used to be. Huh. He shut them down. Like over 10 years ago. Okay. I guess that was when all that was super popular spawn or something. When was the... Um, when was the real estate market collapse? No. I don't I know. That's... Maybe someone in the chat could tell us. Oh. I think that's when it closed. The 2006 or something like that. 2008, maybe. These are fake um, wax packs. Oh. Huh. A rabbit over here. Do you see him? Is it too dark? Uh, a little too dark, I think. You've seen him, though.
Missy Mars said that was wild looking, Kevin. Graphic Which Man one? says 1929. And then he says, oh, the recent one. I'm not sure. I'm not sure what. <laughs> I think I got lost. What people are talking about. I'm the stock market, the stock market, the uh, housing market. Collapse, oh, right? oh, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, right, right. Yeah, okay. Now I understand. Yeah. What happened? They were giving everybody loans that couldn't pay for them? Yeah, they were, they didn't qualify for the loans, but they gave them to them and then they weren't able to pay and then everything collapsed. Yeah, and that's how I got my house. I was able to get a house that would, was maybe foreclosed on or something. Yeah. A lot of times the houses have a lot of damage when they're foreclosed on because they the people get mad and they go and put holes in the sheetrock and do everything they can to mess the house up before it so, goes back to the bank. I think I bought it maybe from someone that bought it and then fixed it up. Uh, you ever seen this guy crusher is that his name crusher oh i think i've seen him what what toy line is he from i think he's his own thing mattel in the late 70s i think oh okay you yeah, crush him down you crush him down and then he would ex uh, you hit a, a valve, like an air valve, and he'd come back. Okay. Yeah, that wasn't something I Santa ever brought me. Uh, maybe you would have been a too old. No? Yeah. Well, 79, I would have been like 14. <laughs> yeah, you might have been too old for that. I think I'm going to bring this to the store, though. Oh, well, yeah. That... I'm thinking about making a little monster museum in the back area. Would you let Would you let people into it? Maybe that. Maybe you could pay this guy to get in. <laughs> Yeah, how much room do you have to do a monster museum in the back? It's not very big, but it's big enough to put these couple, like maybe five or six of these life-size figures I got. Oh, yeah. And then people can take their selfies and stuff. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's pretty spectacular, recreating that ticket booth. It look better with the lights on. Let's see. Well, it looks pretty good either way, but yeah, that looks real good there. Uh, yeah, I'd probably, just for StreamYard's sake, it probably looks better with the lights on. In person, it would probably look better with the lights off. So we've got a... Uh... Vampirella versus the Cult of Chaos. And this is uh, from Harris through Dark Horse. This is all the original Warren stories from when 
Vampirello was kind of turned into a serious continuing comic strip before she was kind of a jokey host. And the first story was just really silly, written by Ackerman. But that's that. And then this one is more uh, stuff from Warren. Um, and it's got a Dave Stevens cover. You know, putting this on a bookshelf, I'm thinking I should put this in a comic box with my other Dave Stevens covers. And, uh, and this was a Dave Stevens cover also. Um, and uh, again, it's also um, Warren reprints inside. Yeah, I'm going to take those upstairs and put them with the. This is the unauthorized Tarzan. It's the um, Charlton Tarzan comics, all printed together from Dark Horse. Um, hey, you were showing that Thunder earlier. Yeah. Is That's probably the same, had that same book that I just got in there. Huh? What did you just get? That uh, fact, Emily. Oh yeah, I'm sure it's in there. But did, is that a? Do I know about that fact, Emily? Is that something in my pile? I don't know if you know about it. You didn't. You didn't ask me for one. Are you sold out? It's like a fact, Emily, but it has a cardstock cover wrapped around it because the inside cover is a little in politically incorrect. Oh, yeah, I know what you're talking about. The profile of the, yeah, the warrior. Okay. So it's like yeah, they I wrapped, I know about. They wrapped a card stack still... cover around it. Do you, do you still have a copy of that? I have three of them, yeah. Yeah, I'd like one in my pile. This is. It's, a, it's all Frank Fazetta art. Yeah. This is a. Uh, very well respected um, adaptation of Edgar Rice Burroughs' Tarzan from the mid 60s. The only problem is they didn't have permission from the Burroughs estate to do it. So they were shut down pretty quick. But what existed from Charlton was well liked by people. And so it was all collected. A lost chapter in the comics history of Tarzan finally back in print. This was. This wasn't that long ago. Seems like this is from the time period people were still wearing the stupid masks. Let's see. Did you ever Am see I the Dark Horse series of Tarzan or where he's on the Planet of the Apes? Oh, do they, they have that? Is that any good? It must be. I only had a couple issues. Like I had issue three and five I was telling Graphic Man about. Um... Some of those things just seem so contrived, and, and and then later I thought, well, maybe, because it's like uh, Red Sonia and Betty and Veronica and Vampirella team up, and it's like, oh my gosh, it's like, it should be something that I love, because it's all characters I love, but it just seems like, oh, Mars Attacks and Red Sonia and uh, Betty and Veronica, it's like, but... Uh, there was a book where the original 60s Star Trek crew were on Planet of, the Planet of the Apes were, yeah, and then I think there was another one where the 60s Star Trek crew were with the 60s Legion of Superheroes, DC, I, and I, at the time I just thought, eh, and then later I went back and found some of those in dollar bins. I don't know if I, I can't read this at all, man. Oh, there it goes. Printed in China. Twenty thirteen. Well, it must have been printed before the pandemic, but 
I think I probably bought it during the pandemic, so that's why I remember that. Here's another uh, reprint of the Warren stuff. This is from Dynamite. Because they can't do anything decent on their own, so they reprint the old Warren stuff. And this reprints quite a chunk of the Warren. Put that there. And this is when Warren was still around. They were reprinting their own stuff in this. You hear that thunder? Wow. But they they colored it for this edition. So this is the original black and white Vampirella stuff, but in color. So this is probably mid 70s, 70. Oh boy. I don't know. It says copyrighted 71. It, maybe it's from 71. I don't know. I doubt it. This is uh, Pepe Gonzalez. Jose Pepe Gonzalez that uh, really created the look of Vampirella. He's a Spanish artist. That's why Vampirella always looked Spanish. I mean, she should look uh, Latin. That's just how she was designed. Um, Graphic Man has one of those Tarzans. I have issue four of that Charlton Tarzan. Here is uh, one of um, the box set of Humbug, which is Harvey Kurtzman. left mad which he created and then he tried to create other magazines there was humbug there was trump there was help seems like there was another one in there before he finally just went and started working for hugh hefner with uh, uh, playboy this this book um this reprints all of humbug humbug was like comic book sized but was um, actually a little bit smaller than a comic book. Uh, and so this is his attempt to uh, split away from Gaines and do his own mad magazine. So if possibly if Kurtzman had stayed with mad, this is what mad would have looked like by the late, 50s. This is a parody of Baby Doll, the controversial. Okay, this is the cover of the first issue of Humbug. So, this reprints everything. And then, second. Sounds like we're getting quite a thunderstorm out there. And then the second volume. That's what the it looked like. I have, I think, one issue of Humbug. Yeah, here's their parody of Rodan. Um, the way that the text looks, I always was a little off put by that. Um, Harvey Kurtzman didn't like the way the text was done in EC Comics, so he had it hand, hand lettered. That's why the text in Mad and in the War Comics look different from the way it did in Tales from the Crypt and Weird Science. But here he kind of to me, that text is, is worse than what EC had. Anyway, it's a parody of Rodan. That's something that Mad never did parodies of Japanese monster movies. But uh, this is... Um... Oh, here's a Flash Gordon parody. As I recall, 
This is like, yeah, it's like a Russian Flash Gordon. And it's got Jack Davis doing the Flash Gordon art. Okay, so. Um, for ever since I got this book, I've had it on the shelf facing out like this. But now I'm realizing it would probably look better on the shelf like this, showing every cover of Humbug. That's the one I own that has the like Queen Victoria on the cover, that one right there. Those are all the, I think I actually have that one too. Maybe it was just, this one was small. Maybe the other ones are more magazine size. I don't know. Anyway, it didn't, it didn't uh, take off like mad. So uh, here's the EC Comics story. This is just a little fan-made publication, but it has some great, art in it. There's the Ray Bradbury connection. Yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. I need to read that again. This is um, Goodman Beaver. This was um, Harvey Kurtzman. Ooh, look at that. I didn't realize it's signed by Kurtzman and Will Elder. And this is number 734 of a limited edition of 1,250 hardcover copies. Now, this was originally put out, I think, as the executive comics book and Goodman Beaver is uh, goes around this, this is where he meets Tarzan and it's it's like there's uh, yeah they couldn't reprint this either today but um, it's insane and he meets other characters this is where he meets Lloyd Bridges from Sea Hunt. And, uh, and um, he meets Don Quixote. Oh, this is where he meets this guy out who turns out to be turns out to be Superman. But they write it like this. You're you're, see how there's a little asterisk? You're Superman, right? A little asterisk covering up some of the letters in Superman. Um, well, I guess he comes out of retirement. I haven't read this in years. But the problem was, in one of these stories, he meets the Archie, the cast of Archie. And, uh, oh, here's meeting... Cleopatra, Elizabeth Taylor. And as I recall, when they were trying to do a, a reprint of this, there was a problem and they had to change the artwork for the Archie part. Or did they not even bother putting it in here? I, it, it could be that it's not in here. I didn't see it. Um. I'm not seeing it. I think they left that whole Archie one out. Now this character later would they would change him and turn him into uh, little Annie Fanny. They would change his sex to a girl and and basically Goodman Beaver became little Annie Fanny. But I might have let me see if I have uh, I, I just saw that I had the paperback over here. And maybe the Archie story is in there. It was just, it didn't go over with 
you know, the whole comics code thing, a lot of that really had to do with Mad doing the parody of Archie back in the early 50s. So when he did it again, it really ticked off the Archie publisher. This book is not in good condition. I'm wondering how this happened. I found it. Brought to you, do you have this model kit? Did you freeze? You must have froze. I think I have the show now. I was going to ask you if you had this kit. I just found this head. The custom head they made for this kit. You can make them look like the, the Haunted Mansion guy. Anybody ever built this kit? About this kit. You have this one. All right, I'm back. Just showing these model kits. Oh, cool. Yeah, there was an electrical, uh, I guess, a uh, lightning hit outside and power went out for well, for a second and it shut my internet Wi-Fi down. Yeah, that's Disney Haunted Mansion. Did, I, did you see this? I was showing this. Um, I have a custom head made for this guy to make him look like the Haunted Mansion. No, Caretaker. I because I haven't been able to connect since I disappeared. I just now got it back. Well, yeah, because yeah, he kind of kind of looks weird there, but I got this head. Caretaker head. Oh, yeah, yeah. That does look more like the, yeah. I'll, I'll use this head instead. I started, I started it like I started breaking the pieces off the spruce. I remember that was, 
that's activated by rubber bands, right? It's a moving kit that. Yeah, like he pops out of the coffin or something. Yeah, they used to advertise that in comic books around 1972. Yeah, <clears throat> that'll be same time. They were doing Pirates of the Caribbean kits too. Yeah, hopefully they reissue some of those because they're kind of expensive now. I found this. This was for my my old dog, maybe twenty years ago. Oh. Well, you put it on their collar and they walk around and take pictures. Oh. So I wonder if there's okay, any graphic pictures. Graphic man saying my volume is is uh, low. Earlier, Gratu, you were loud and clear, but after you reconnected, the volume is a little distant. Huh. I don't know. Thomas Fairfell, I have built the grave robber, Kevin. Who did? Thomas Fairfell. Oh, he's built one? Yeah. Are those pretty small scale kits? One twelve scale? So it's like a... If he stood up, he'd be like a six inch tall figure. Yeah. They bought 112. No, it looks like that would be a pain to paint, that one with the organ. Yeah, this one would be easier, just mud. Yeah, that's easy to dry brush that. Yeah, that would be a pain. Well, I it's it's beyond my skill level. I mean, I could try it, but uh, some. Yeah, I wish I had someone to a professional builder that could build all my kits. Yeah. Well, I found the book. I was looking for, but the must be some damage to the bottom of the book that I don't remember it being damaged. This might have happened during the move. It's really annoying. Um, but anyway, this is the book, Executive's Comic Book. Oh. My Wi-Fi is gone. I can see you still. Okay. Well, it's this is the Goodman Beaver book I was showing you. There's a story called Goodman Goes Playboy. That where he goes. Open this book too wide. This is where he meets the Archie cast, and they're all um, sophisticates. Yeah, it's raining real hard outside, and a lightning strike is, I wonder if my voice is recovered from that, but this is, um, they didn't allow this to be reprinted, and uh, I don't know. Seems like it might have been reprinted subsequently. I'd, I'd have to do some research on it. I remember reading that they couldn't reprint this and uh, oh yeah i can't really show you there it's like a roman kind of uh, thing that the romans do you know stuff you can't really show. 
Yeah. I guess I understand why the Archie publisher was, a, it goes a little far. Um, yeah, yeah. The, can't show that page or this one. Yeah, okay. Well, yeah, just trust me. It, it It's... Uh, that's that. Um, okay. Oh, oh. Mm. Book reprinting Jack Davis stories from EC Horror. Man, it looks like it says 24 blood soaked tales from the crypt classics from the pen of Jack Davis. There was a whole series of books like this. And, and these books are reprinted in black and white, so you see the original artwork. It's just a different format. These DCs have been reprinted in lots of different ways. And then this book, the actual artist, the actual writer of this book brought a copy to the local comic store and gave a copy you know, uh, too, it's like, hey, would you like to carry this book? And, and of course, I was there and I wanted that copy. So it made it look like this book's really in demand. So, but it's from Tomorrow's Publishing. It's um, Our Artist at War about DC War Comics. Actually, is it just DC? I believe so. No, Marvel also, Warren, Blazing Combat. It's just about war comics in general. So, how about that? Just realizing I better go back to work tomorrow. There's a bizarro world. And, uh, this one is, um, yeah, this story is done like an EC comic. Uh, different artists are doing different things in this. This is interesting. It looks like it's, this is a um, modern artist doing interesting things. So, yeah, I forgot about this part. So, it's kind of like an underground DC. This one 
I think it's the same thing. This is a, a Matt Greening cover. So it's um, interesting takes on everything. Lady Sitter's Guide by Dennis the Menace. Price is a dollar fifty, so it's oh let's see what Kevin's showing over there in Arizona here. Look at that. One of those pin plaques uh, for your aquarium. This one they fight over the the chest. Yeah. Here's a diving sea dog. It'll dive from the top to the bottom. One more. Oh, this one's cool. The Phantom Pirate drinks from the jug. Yeah. Remember looking at all those in the in the pet stores. Pet stores. Yeah, when I was a kid. My dad always had an aquarium. My parents wouldn't let me have aquarium. They said they stink too bad. Yeah, that was like my dad's hobby. But I never had a, a dog or a cat growing up. My older brothers had cats when, before I was born, but I never had one until 2006. When I, was, I got my first cat and dog. Has my voice improved? Anybody that's listening? Is it... it sounds the same, but we're on StreamYard, so. Yeah. Let me tune in and see what it's sounding like. Um, you know, when you get on StreamYard now, it gives you an option to upload a, a picture from your files for the thumbnail, or it says we can do it with AI and submit two pictures and we'll combine them using AI. And that's what I did in the last two streams. And, and so it cuts out the background behind the characters and it puts them there with the words that you type in. It's uh, Meyer says, sounds good to me. Yeah, I guess it's all right. It always it sounds a little canned because I don't have a microphone. I just talk straight into my computer microphone. Look at this. Does they have a year on there? Uh, 80, I think it says 85. Yeah, 85. Is that He-Man slime? Yeah, it's still sealed, but it sounds like it's just water in there. You hear that? Yeah. I would have thought it just turned solid by now. Yeah, it must have separated and just turned water. <laughs> I 
probably put it in something so it doesn't ever leak out of there. Yeah, that's a whole other world. They didn't have slime when I was a kid. I don't think they did. Here is a book I've had since I was real little. It's the Wacky Races Annual. And Wacky this is... Uh, that was one of the best cartoons. Yeah, this is... Uh, I think it's British. They did, did, did these annuals. Um, and I got it overseas when we were living in Germany. But it's, um, you know, it has text stories. And it has um, text. And then it has uh, puzzles. Uh, dastardly detours, but then it also has reprints of Gold Key, Wacky Races comics, um, with this real thick paper stock. Uh, more text stories. Um, it's um, curious cars. So this this is something. Look at this illustration. Let me see what year exactly this came out. Um, well, it ends in, in X, so I bet it's 1970, published in Great Britain, the world distributor, Manchester. Yeah. This, yeah, they would do these. These things. I've got one for Fireball XL5 too. Um, this is uh, an artist I like. Darwin Cook passed away. Selena's big score. Um, he was. Um, oh, did you have this? Um, uh, hold on. No, I never had the Bigfoot from the Six Million Dollar Man line. I only had the Six Million Dollar Man, and then years later, when I was grown, I got the Fembot in the box, and I, she's never come out of the box because I thought she looked cool in the box. But yeah, I didn't ever get that. I think it came out. Maybe a year later, after the six million dollar man figure, that box is in nice shape. And I don't know, I don't think I saw the Bigfoot episode when it originally aired either. Did you know that it was Andre the Giant when you first saw it? No, I wouldn't have ever known that. Um, I didn't watch wrestling. Um, yeah, I. Um, well, wrestling was regional then, as far as I know. So where I was living when that toy came out, I believe we were in Arlington, Texas, between Dallas and Fort Worth. The only wrestling you had was on at 1030 at night on uh, Channel 11, an independent station, and it was... They had the Von Erichs were the big the Von Erich family. Were the what was big, that, like um, Mid-South Mid Wrestling or something? Mid-South? I Someone watching would know better than me. I don't know. Um, uh, later, I guess it was Vince McMahon that unified all the different wrestling areas in the country and turned it into one big thing. But back then, it was... Uh, it was regional as far as I know. Um, and I, if, if I was, I wasn't allowed to stay up till uh, that hour, even though it was on a Saturday night, 
I, I still had a bedtime even on Saturday nights. And, and if I could have stayed up, I would have been watching Saturday Night Live because I was aware that that was a great show, but I couldn't stay up late. And I could see the, they, for a while they had prime time. They would rerun some skits from Saturday Night Live in prime time. But I, um, I wasn't allowed to stay up and it, I certainly would have watched Saturday Night Live instead of uh, a bunch of guys and, and wearing their shorts. But uh, I, I don't know. I mean, I just, if wrestling had been on in the early afternoon, maybe I would have fallen into it because I know I enjoyed watching roller derby uh, when I was five, six years old, but that they had that on early so I could see it. And I thought that was amusing. And maybe I would have thought wrestling was just as funny. I think we watched like that on Saturdays, maybe after cartoons it would come on. Yeah, they didn't have it in the early afternoon. It was it was late at night. So I missed oh, so all I, that. I think they had a Saturday night main event would come on. Yeah, I, all that I missed all of that in my childhood. Just. Um, it seems like everybody else is was really wrestling was a usually big part of their life. Usually, wrestling and comic fans are a lot of the same people. I know it's all the other four color fossils know all the wrestlers know everything about it. I, uh, I it. it uh, These are considered right here. These are considered the first wrestling figures. Oh, okay. I think they came out in like 1980, maybe. In Japan. Okay. Myers saying. Me too. Never had Bigfoot. Still want one. Okay, I'm starting to figure out this Goodman Beaver stuff by, um, oh, look at that. It's Abdullah the Butcher. All I really knew, my mom told would tell me about Gorgeous George, which I guess you remember from the 50s. There was like a, a wrestler, but he was kind of like Liberace. Oh, I think he name. actually has the first, uh, I think that guy actually has the first wrestling figure, but it's actually a puppet. Oh, really? Yeah, the guy you were just talking about? Yeah. They had a, they had a puppet of him that, that came out in the, okay. I don't know. Yeah. These are sixties, I think. And what I've seen of sixties and fifties wrestling, it looked far more appealing than the seventies stuff. Especially this guy, the Crusher, he seemed uh, and Freddie Blassie, they seemed very amusing. I'm figuring out Goodman Beaver because I've got this Will Elder book here. Let me get myself full screen for a second, and and apparently these Goodman Beaver stories must have first appeared in Help. And you see, in the original help, it looked exactly like Archie. And that executive comic book that's from like four years later, looks like they redrew him and gave him kind of a flat top haircut. You see here, it's, it's exactly Archie, but in a Roman, you know, in, in Roman decadence. And so that's... This is a great book, The Mad Playboy of Art. It has art from all of his, uh, his uh, all this press sleep already, his whole career. Mad, uh, even the paintings he did in later life, you know, just it's a great book. All right, well, let's uh, get everybody back going here. Here's the first Hogan. I think, I think it's the first Hogan. 
Yeah, I don't know. Meyer, how did all of that, how did wrestling become unified? Was that Vince McMahon? Do you know the story it's, behind all of that? No. I don't, yeah, I, I don't know that much about it, but it is Vince McMahon. And I think it involved like PBS or TNT, uh, right? I mean, oh, yeah. that, that's what kind of spread it was the syndication of the WWF or the WWE, which I don't remember which came first. What, what was first, Kevin? WWF or WWE? No, they had to change it to WWE recently because the World Wildlife oh. Fund or whatever. Right. So at the beginning, it was WWF. The first. So we had local wrestling in San Francisco. Again, but then there were wrestlers that traveled through circuits that still, like, we might see. Like we would see like Superfly Jimmy Snuka here, and we would believe that he was like a San Francisco wrestler. But then he would go and wrestle in Portland, and then he would go and wrestle in it. Like they would kind of move around, so they were already kind of switch switching around. And so everybody's local TV had their own like wrestling group that they were watching. But then with the uh, cable television, I think Vince McMahon out of New York City, maybe on the East Coast yeah. somewhere. He signs a deal with uh, Ted Turner, and and that's when we all learned about Andre the Giant, Hulk Hogan, the Iron Sheik, right around, I don't know, 80, 81, 82, I think. But I'm not a like, no. – when, uh, when he bought Ted Turner out, that was much, much later. Okay. Ted Turner's with WCW. Okay, so when Andre the Giant played Bigfoot, he, he wasn't known as a wrestler everywhere. He just – is that yeah, correct? he had to, in the he 70s. Was, yeah, he had to have still been wrestling. He was known, but he so but he like he was like a circuit wrestler. Like I said, he would wrestle uh -huh. like in San Francisco and New York and Chicago and Miami and it was and, all territories. Know. Back it was all different territories back then. It was different yeah. territories with like like what Kevin was saying, Mid South wrestling, uh, the NWA in in in. Uh, was it the end? What was the what was the NWO? What was the one in North Carolina? Um, there was anyway, the National Wrestling Alliance. That's NWA. Yeah, that's the one that had uh, Ric Flair and Dusty Rhodes. Um, yeah, yeah, and that's kind of how it was. I still watch all of it. I watch everything. The one in uh, the one in Portland, I know, had uh, Roddy Piper. That's where he came from. Right, Roddy Piper. Yep. I kind of stopped watching around the mid nineties as far as like when the, the wrestling that I watch now on YouTube, I like to watch classic wrestling probably mm -hmm. from the seventies to the nineties. The nineties is when the, the Monday night wars happened and uh, Ted Turner and Vince McMahon went against each other. And then uh, Ted Turner offered more money to all Vince McMahon's wrestlers and brought them all over, paid them crazy amounts of money. That's when you saw Hulk Hogan and Razor Ramon and all those guys leave. But I think I got into wrestling in 1985 when these guys, these big rubber figures came out. Yeah, so this is when it became popularized for kids and there was the Saturday morning cartoon. Was it like about 85? Yeah, yeah. And they had all the merchandise, all the toys. These are great. They're really cool. Yeah. And none of these have any, like, action. They're all just static, like, solid, heavy figures, right? Yeah, they're just solid rubber. Or not solid rubber. You can bend them. Oh, okay. You can bend them. But they're not hollow. They're pretty heavy, right? Yeah, they're... A rubber or PVC. They have a weight to them, yeah. And then after this, I remember that one. There's like they had actions, like they would like pop up or swing and stuff that came later, right? After that, then this was LJN and then Hasbro came in 91. Or no, 89 was the last year for these. So in 1990, they did the Hasbro little plastic ones with action features. Yes, these are the ones I was thinking of. Yeah, these all have action features, and they're small, and they're hollow. Yeah. And yep, I remember the Superfly one that pops up. 
Yeah, he was a jumper. Mm-hmm. He's probably back there somewhere. Jake the Snake. He was one of my favorite ones. I don't have any. Of these. I have I have the some of the new ones, but I don't have any of, of this stuff. This vintage stuff. Pee wee stuff. Yeah, that's great. I love the vintage pee wee stuff you have. These two are my oldest toys. Those are both great. I I always wanted that Bigfoot like like Gratu. I just had the the first. Uh, Six million dollar man with the engine block that came in the pink box. Like it was like almost it was almost eight dollars back then. <laughs> yeah, that's probably a lot back then. Yeah, yeah, that's the like comics that. were still twenty five thirty cents. Mm -hmm. It's what these yeah. were in eighty five. These these were considered a lot because these were uh, seven ninety nine, I think, or six ninety nine. I should be giving you full screen on this. These are in great shape too, Kevin. I mean, you've really took a lot. Of how long have you been collecting these? And how long did it take you to get? Do you have everything? I think so. When you have a store, you can just always upgrade once you get a new one in. Oh, okay. Yeah, of course. There's Jimmy Snooker and there's look at Andre with his. Oh man, long hair. I like that Snooker right there. These are great. Yeah, this neck is awesome. Are they are they bendy figures? Yeah, they're not bendy with a wire. They were gonna originally do them with a the wire, but they I think they thought that it would poke out of there and stab kids. Yeah. So they did them without well, the wire. Whatever they use, it makes them look like they're sweaty. Yeah, they're all shiny. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the shiny the shiny rubber they use. So he's casted in that rubber. He's casted in this color. And then they would just have to paint the shorts on. Yeah. So whatever whatever the main color of the figure is, that's what they'll cast it in. He was probably maybe casted in black. I don't know. Sometimes the ones casted in black, though, when they get a scratch on their face, then you can see it through it. Yeah. Yeah. The tip of the nose. and Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's the bad part about the casting in black. Is that Gene is that, Oakland? Is that the guy's name? Yeah. That's <laughs> mean Gene. Mean Gene. He would interview them before their match. Wow. Macho man back there. I remember uh, when Frank the Animal Fletcher stole Miss Elizabeth. I was really watching it at that time. We were watching it like every week at that point, about 1986. Is that sound right? Is that right? It was a storyline. I know there's George the Animal Steel back there. Yeah, George the Animal Steel. That's who I meant. George the Animal Steel was the guy. He came running I in. He, like, I thought you were talking about somebody else. Yeah, that's George the Animal Steel. I'm sorry. But yeah, he kidnapped Miss Elizabeth, and it was like, you know, how they would do like a month-long storyline, you know. She got uh, she got Stockholm Syndrome. She, like, fell in love with Frank the Animal Steel. She didn't want to go back to Randy. I'm going to start calling him Frank now, too. Call him Frank the Animal Fletcher. That's what I called him. That's a great <laughs> name. How did I come up with that? I got to, again, yeah, slow down. <clears throat> and I'm going to start using that. I'm going to start using Statue Bob. What's Statue Bob from? Gratu made that one up and said uh, Gem Mint Collectibles. It's Statue Bob. Oh, yeah. I heard you guys talking about. Uh, that Savage Dragon, uh, Eric Larson, earlier. Boy, that guy's a pill. So he lives here in San Francisco, and he loves everybody to know that he lives in San Francisco. And I wish he would go back to wherever he's from. 
but um, he was really involved with the comic history museum here in San Francisco about 10 or 15 years ago. And I was kind of into it and I would go and, uh, and he's not a cool guy. Uh, well, let's just leave it at that. He's a real. And... Yeah. The, it's the people that buy his books. It's the people that have been buying it ever since it started. That's you say he's not a cool guy. guy. I'm, he's not. No. He has he's got, not. he's like Trump derangement syndrome, right. socialist, violent Marxist. <laughs> right. I mean, that's the only reason probably he hasn't gotten canceled for his uh, pornography. He's got a real bad attitude and he loves punching Nazis. That's how I'll put it, right? I mean, it's, oh, his comic, his porno comics, I mean, anybody else that would have done those would have gotten canceled, but I guess his politics are... Did he put out dirty comics? I didn't know that. Yeah, he puts it in there. I don't know how. Does he like own some of Image or something? He does. He's one of the original founders, and he still is connected to them. That's I, I imagine that's the only way he can afford to live here, and he owns a house here. I mean, he lives here, which is very, I mean, very nice. Uh, so, uh, most shops yeah. would, would not even order his comic. I mean, he, most shops would sell like two or three copies at most. So I think him owning the business part of the business is the only way that comic is getting produced. That's interesting. Yeah, that's got to be it. I think he he also has connections to other stuff. Like he he's involved with things like Netflix and Hollywood and you know what I mean? There's no I'm not sure what how how much he owns of image, you know what I mean? Oh. That's cool. So my, did you ever end up getting one of those, Meyer? No, I didn't. You know, and I had two that I was, you know, on my list watching and hunting, and they both got snatched up by somebody before I could get them. I just didn't pull the trigger, which I should have. And then all now these I've have slight variations to them. I'd offer you one of those, but they're all like different. I'll find mine. I'll find mine. So I want like every little variation I can find of it. Right. This is, I think that's one of the best Star Wars figures. The Rancor. That and Job of the Hut. There used to be this bar on uh, here on Geary. And I guess the guy who owned the bar was a Star Wars collector. But in the in the street side window, he had all this stuff displayed and it was all yellowed by the sun, Kevin. And he just didn't care. He had he had large pieces like he had the, you know, the, your X-Wing, your your land, your, your Walker, your Millennium Falcon, that Rancor. And they were all up on like a high shelf in the window, all the big pieces from the 80s. Right. And they were all yellowed and faded and, and completely done. I just thought it was kind of funny that he didn't care that he just, maybe they were his childhood toys. I don't know, but it was kind of cool. All gone now, boarded up. It was a, what kind of store was this? It, it was a bar. It was a, a, a pub. Oh. Yeah, that's a weird thing to have in a bar. Yeah, that's what made me think that it must have been like the owner just had his Star Wars collection on display on a shelf in the window. Is basically what, what was going on there. And just a little dive bar. There's like, you know, 100 dive bars on that street where there was. Look at that. This was given that away at the a video store when that movie came out on VHS. That's what I was going to ask. Is that actual Leprechaun promotional item? That's yeah. awesome. Probably really rare. I've never seen it. That's cool. I love those movies. I think they're hilarious. Here's a Bendy <laughs> Meteor Man. <laughs> That's great. 
never saw the movie, but I saw the ad a million times on that inside, you know, on the in the comic books. There's King Kong Bundy. Yeah, this guy's heavy. Feel his paint came off. This guy was a monster. He was like he came off the butt showing now. <laughs> yeah. So that is that like a really oversized figure compared to everybody else, right? Mm-hmm. This yeah. one, this one will break your wrestling ring. You drop him on it. <laughs> That's what he did to mine. So kids, a lot of kids played with these by bashing them together. So there's paint loss has got to be really common, right? Yeah. We would take them and slide them down the street and make them look all beat up on purpose. We'd skin them up on purpose. Make them look like they're dam battle damaged. Who's that guy, Captain Jenks or something? The guy that was in the uh, Cindy Lauper video? Yeah. Captain uh, Lou Albano. That's it, Captain Lou Albano. Captain, Captain Jenks. Jenks. That sounds better, Howard, though. Howard Stern, I think, is what that's from. <laughs> yeah, he had, like, rubber bands in his beard. Is that right? Yeah, he's got a rubber band yeah, in his beard. He put them on his cheek. For, I don't know how he did it, but he would have them, like, hanging on his cheek, even. See that? Mm-hmm. What a gimmick. He was also a Mario brother. He was oh, yeah. Mario in the live action show. Yeah. The Super Mario Brothers Super Show or something like that, right? Yeah. They would show the cartoon. Mm-hmm. They would have They'd live have action. Live action. Yeah. Yeah. It was watchable. I was an adult, but I watched it. But I was in the army, so it's like a whole different level. I was like a kid. I was like a college student, same age as a college student. These are little pieces from the Crypt Keeper board game. Here's another little, I think this is a promo from uh, Goonies when that movie came out. That was a promo. Oh, wow. Never seen it. That's great. Did it say? 85, Warner. Or is it 85? Yeah. Yeah. Or is it 85, Warner Brothers Promotional. Yeah, I think when the when the uh, VHS maybe came out, you get these at uh, video stores. The video store in my town, they didn't even have. Uh, when I first started going there, they didn't even have membership cards. It was just a mom and pop. They would just write down your name or something. I showed you that Rambo before. Yeah, I've got, I have one. I don't, I, yeah, I've got that one that you have right there. I just don't have, he's not complete. I don't have all the weapons. It's pretty good for the articulation for the time. Yeah, I think they're nice figures and it's actually a really wide line. There's some really good villains. There's vehicles. Right now, I just have the two different Rambos. I've got that one and the one with the white t-shirt and the jeans from the cartoon with the symbol the, the eagle on his chest you know and then i got one of those weapons packs 
have you seen that you know the rambo weapons pack they must somebody must have found a warehouse find of those because a couple of years ago those were all over mercari for 10 or 15 bucks a piece you know what i'm talking about brand new sealed yeah. in the package yeah here's another video store promotion oh look at that never-ending story that looks like terrifying it's weird looking What's this guy's name? I can't remember. He's like that fly, big flying dragon. Yeah, it's like a dog kind of big flying uh -huh. dragon. Here's one of the coolest, I think, Beetlejuice figures. Oh, these are great. Is it the one with the stuff sticking in out of them? Yep, this is the best one, isn't it? This barbecue, like, uh, what are those, kiss shish kebabs? Is this shish kebab Beetlejuice, I think? Yeah, so you try to stick as many through them as you can. So I've seen this also and passed on it and never bought it, and I wish I had, and it's great to see it. This is a, like, I agree, it's the coolest Beetlejuice toy. And then with all of them, you would you could remove their heads, and then they have a shrunken head. Either a shrunken head or a weird eyeball or something. Right. This was a heavy gross out time. Same time as like mad balls. It was like kids. They were really marketing the gross out stuff, weren't they? Yeah. Here's also, that, that Beetlejuice cartoon really was good. You remember it was on Fox or something like the Fox Kids? It was a really good cartoon, actually. Let's see what his. Huh, I've never seen this figure. That's cool. Is that the guy, the weird guy from the party at the house? He's the guy that redecorates their house. Yes. Ortho or something. Oh, that's great. Otho? Was it Otho or Ortho? I think it's Ortho. Ooh, that's cool. I didn't know that figure exists. I haven't seen that. Yeah, he was your stereotypical interior interior designer. Yes, he was. That was a wrestler? <laughs> oh, no, this is a Beetlejuice. Okay. <laughs> It'd be a good wrestling name, too, Otho. Remember, action features used to be on almost all toys. Right? And action yeah, figures were on. Oh, look at There's another. I found another yeah, shish kebab. The action oh, yeah. features was a key part. They they felt like, you know, the... Oh, there's one of the shish kebabs, one of the skewers. So he has an extra one that won't fit in, in him. And I found another head for him, too. Oh, that's great. That's the carousel head. Maybe this is from a different one. Oh, back then you'd have to uh, engineer these toys for their action features. Yeah, they won't even, they can't even figure out how to put action features in toys now. There's no desire for it. Right, but if there was, they wouldn't even know how to do it. It's a lost uh, engineering and toys. I don't think exists really. You remember all those 
I guess it would have, would have been the late nineties or mid nineties when like, I'm thinking of KB toys. Do you remember all the, 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 it was Batman was flooded, right? There was like every kind of a Batman you could imagine. There was the ice Batman, the fire Batman, the Arabian Batman, the right. Yeah. The, the, every the different Midian. variant. Yeah. Yeah. There were all these different variants. Oh, that's great. At, so at that time, I guess it would have been mid nineties. I worked in this office and uh, there were these ladies that were in the reception that were really like, um, I don't know what you would call it. They're like uh, hyper involved and super like uh, happy or something. So they constant organization everywhere and constant parties. And there was like, you know how they have a secret Santa? Well, at this office, it was to the next level. Like you had like, a entire worksheet that you would fill out that had everything, all your likes, everything that your birthday, the things that you like, the music you listen to, all these things. And then those would, everybody would pick a number or something. And then at the beginning of the year, you get that other coworker's sheet. And then there's, I mean, 10 occasions throughout the year or something where you have to buy gifts for that other person or do things. It was a, it was a big deal, right? It was actually really yeah. fun. It was it was fun. But on my list, of course, I put superheroes, Batman, Superman. So like for a year, I got all those action figures I was just describing to you from some girl in medical records. Some, you know, that I didn't know. Or, I, you know, yeah. she was like buying me all this 49er stuff, giant stuff, and Batman and Superman action figures for a year. It was kind of cool. I never wanted any of those extra different ones. I just wanted the main one. Yeah, you want the one that looks the most like the one from the cartoon when you're a kid. I mean, that's what yeah. I want. You know, they would do like Arctic Blast version, where you just be in a snow gear. Yeah, that's the, the like. I remember getting this one where he's like fencing. Like I was like, wow, that's really cool. This is awesome. Thanks so much, Meredith. That's really awesome. Well I, well, I mean, you don't know until the end of the year who's been buying you all this stuff. But anyway, uh, yeah, it's like, and he's just like in this fencing position. He can never move out of it. He's holding like this, this you know, like like foil. It's mm -hmm. like the Three Musketeers version of Batman. Or they put like these like wings on him or something that he could fly. There was an Egyptian one too, where he had like this King Tut helmet with a big, you know, like a big scepter or something. She gave me that one too. I gave all of them to my kids, and then now they're 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 gone. Not that I it's like the stuff I collect now anyway. Like they would run out of. It's like when they'd run out of ideas, they would throw those kind of figures in. They started doing it. I remember at the end with Ninja Turtles. Yeah, you're right. Ninja Turtles did the same thing. Every different version of Ninja Turtles. They even did Universal Monsters, which looking back now, I'm like, those are really cool. Well, at the time, I didn't understand why they were doing Universal Monster Ninja Turtles. I didn't know they did mad balls. In the mid eighties, there was this stuff. I can't remember the name of this toy. I might, I'm going to, it, it might, you might know when I'm going to get to it. So it was that spray foam type stuff that you would get at Toys R Us, but the, the top, right. Was made of that plastic. Silly string? And it was, that silly it looked, string stuff? Yeah. It looked like a mad ball and it was hollow. And I had this purple one with horns. It was like a demon like a pig kind of you know what i'm talking about and you you could you took it off the can and it fit perfectly on your stick shift so i had for years on my stick shift in my rx7 i had that that head it's like this purple play it was right during the mad ball time and it was like silly string or foam or something that shot out and it was like it was like four different heads um i wish i could think of it Screaming that, something like that. Like silly string stuff it was flammable. And if you uh, were having a birthday and you had your candles lit and a kid sprayed that stuff, it would it would torch the kid. 
Do you remember when that was happening everywhere? I do, I do. They either stopped making mm -hmm. it or they had to change the formula. Uh, I remember there was a Superman silly string and Spider-Man and it would like squirt out their mouth. That's exactly what this was. So it squirted out of the plastic head's mouth and then after it was empty, you could pop that plastic head off. It was hollow and it would fit, like I said, like a stick shift, a doorknob, something like that. Yeah, I never thought to pop that off. I think I just maybe threw it away. Yeah, that's a much better idea. It would be like uh, the soakies, you know, you get a, like almost getting a free toy with your with your soap. Yep, that was it. Special action feature on this guy is his right forearm falls off. And the, his leg lower fall. left leg falls off. It's already been coming out of the box, so it's soaking it. This is from the Tales yeah. of the Tomb show? Yeah. I've never seen it. All right, so, okay. Noticing right off the bat that he put something to hold his leg on. That's weird. <laughs> I didn't notice that when it was in the box. So it's like taped or something. Okay. That's out. Now, all right, how does his leg fall off? What is that? Oh. Arm in? There's no button. Oh, let's look at the back. Let say right here. Okay. Right forearm falls off. Squeeze the legs together. Oh, there you go. Oh, it just, just breaks off. I was just thinking, you know, probably the earliest action figures that had you know, play actions were those G.I. Joes, talking G.I. Joes, Eagle Eye G.I. Joe, G.I. Joe with Kung Fu grip. That was kind of the beginning of it. And then Big Jim with the muscle in his arm that would get bigger when you bend it. And then Six Million Dollar Man. Quick draw Johnny West. So, yeah, late 60s, I guess, is when you're getting... Well, I mean, that's the inception of action figures, too, is the late 60s. Did you see that guy from Toy Ventures is bringing out a Dracula and a Frankenstein uh, Lincoln Monsters? No, uh -uh, I haven't seen that. Let me see if I can pull it up. You watch his channel? Yeah, I the subscribe to they, they were on a live stream. I guess the next uh, issue of Toy Ventures magazine, if you order it, you can get uh, an inflatable uh, Stretch Armstrong villain. Who is the green monster guy from Stretch Armstrong? Uh, maybe he's just called the Stretch Monster, Stretch Creature. I don't, I don't okay. remember his, his name, but I know what you're talking about, the green one with the scales. He was really cool, actually. Kid in my yeah, neighborhood. So I was in he's high just, school. He's going to give away a, um, an inflatable. Oh, that's cool.
Oh, it's Plaid Stallions. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's his YouTube. Brick, Brick Mantooth, is that his name? Yeah. Brick Mantooth is Plaid Stallions, yeah. Right. That's Toy Adventures magazine. Mm -hmm. Let me see if I can find these Lincoln Monsters. Got two still here? Or is he eating? I'm here. Oh, no. I'm just kind of doing things while I'm listening. Did I lose my screen? Hold on. Something happened. Okay. Hold on. Oh. Everybody's gone. Meyer's still here, but yeah, let's see. Where'd Kevin go? He might. Have I know, he said back. something. About, oh, he's coming back. Yeah, he said he lost his screen. Yeah. Okay, I haven't seen these. So is, he's making replica of these Lincoln monsters. The replicas? Is that what he's doing? I think it's his own take on it. Maybe. I love the boxes. The box art looks like the original box art, right? Yeah, but he hired somebody to make this art. Mm -hmm. It's similar. The colors are similar and everything. Uh -huh. I never had any of these. I had those Mego ones, the you know, the glow in the dark Dracula, whatever the vampire that looked nothing like Dracula with the weird eyes, the glow in the dark eyeballs. I probably well, had these. I didn't, I didn't care. Like I've had the AHI ones and these. I always just thought they were bootleg uh, Migo. Yeah. What was the company where they they look like their heads look like the um, Aurora models? That's uh, the AHI. Yeah, I've got an AHI Frankenstein. Yeah, I've had those come through the store, and I would just be like, "These are bootleg Migos," and kind of just not care about them. Well, the the Migo Frankenstein didn't look like the universal but the ahi must have had permission well the ahi creature is crazy the ex how expensive it is really and there's two versions of it have you seen both the versions there's one with uh, like a slim the one that has a slim waist they call it the female version i probably see them yeah, these hey, guys Brock, have covered it. In their magazines, they've covered them in depth. So. Yeah, yeah. Gratu, do you remember those those rack toys that were they were bendies and they were they were like Bullwinkle or Boris and Natasha? Remember those? Yeah. They would be like on on a card, like a blister card or something. Yeah, I've got the Boris and Natasha, and and then I also have. Um, Gumby and Pokey. See, Gratu, when you order it, when you pre order it, you can get this free inflatable. What, for your store? No, I think I, had, I don't think I can order it through Diamond and get this inflatable. I think I'd have to order it through him. Oh, okay. So you get one for every magazine you order? Yeah. That's a oh, pre order that's a bonus. It's a bonus for getting it through him. <laughs> that's pretty cool I have to admit this guy has some cool ideas like he did um, you know how Migo like Batman has that little glove that he, that you put on him yeah it's almost like an oven mitt or something yeah, yeah, it's, a, yeah it's a mitt yeah. <laughs> so this guy <laughs> makes a uh, he, he did a promotional item for his booth at some convention and it was a life size one of those that you could actually wear. That's funny. I think that's very funny. That's that's yeah. When I was that's a kid, right. I hated that. That's the first thing that would come off, and I would just throw them away. You know, they would just get thrown into my toy box. But it well, was, they would just they would, they would fall off and they split all the time too. Yeah, well, it was silly. It looked stupid. Yeah, it would have been better if they just you know colored Robin's hands yellow and Batman's hands blue. 
Aquaman looked really bad with those mitts on, those green ones that he had. Yeah. Yeah, otherwise they were perfect figures. You know, the Aquaman figure looked great with, without those stupid mitts. Let's see which one's the best. <laughs> That's great. I like how he's looking up. He's kind of, I don't know, he's kind of soft, though. I mean, he's kind of odd looking. He looks like a like an Archie Frankenstein. <laughs> yeah, he doesn't look like a, like a monster, huh? Like ugly. Besides the scar. Yeah, he looks like a teen Frankenstein. He's even got a pompadour. Look at his hair's perfect. Uh -huh. Yeah, like Frankie Avalon. Yeah, he does look like Frankie Avalon. <laughs> Frankie Avalon Frankenstein. The art's real digital looking too, though. Yeah, yeah, I see that. Yeah. Too bad. I think he was trying to make it look bad, but it looks digital, which I don't like. His, his coat is too long as well. What is that? It's a kind of weird looking. Look at how long it's Yeah, like it's, it's almost like a trench coat. Let's see if he looks better. He looks like Count Floyd from SCTV. <laughs> Remember? Dr. Tongue. <coughs> I'm, I don't know. I'm on the fence about. I'm on the fence about getting these. <coughs> I mean, the price is good, but I I wouldn't like them. I don't like them. I'd pass. That's the retail price. That's the pre-order price, and if you buy them to, both together, I think you can save five dollars. Yeah, they. They don't really grab me either, honestly. No. Um, <clears throat> I guess he's tried to change it just enough so he can not get in trouble with Universal. Yeah, maybe so. That might be why the, the coat is long and the face looks like Frankie Avalon. We don't know. Glow in the dark hands also? What is that about? Why just the hands? Why the hands? Well, that was the way they... In the 70s, the hands glowed and the eyes also glowed. Right. Um, I think that's it. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I guess that's, they're trying to make, he's trying to make it like the Mego too. Yeah. But what back then when they made those figures seemed like it was just perfectly a normal idea. They would never do now. They were, those were actual little plastic balls of glow-in-the-dark material that were on stalks that were in inside of the head sculpt. Nowadays, they would just paint with glow-in-the-dark paint. They would never engineer like what, just like what Kevin was saying about engineering toys. They don't do it the same way anymore. They wouldn't engineer yeah. that to be like that, to have actual plastic eyeballs inside of a hollow head sculpt. Yeah. Oh, you're right. It is just called a stretch monster. All right, let me see if I can look up the uh, Reginald Lincoln monsters. Okay, wow, those things are expensive. I guess the, it looks a lot like the original one.
Oh, yeah, it does. With the eyes looking up, the same expression with the eyes looking up. That's what he's doing. Wow. Well, I don't have any real nostalgic feelings for that particular figure because I don't think I ever saw it as a kid. I've never seen it before in my life. I've never seen it. I've seen, I saw the AHI and the Mego. And oh my gosh, it looks like Eddie Munster. It's really odd looking. 75. It would have probably yeah. been like a whack toy at a drugstore in 1975. Yeah. Yeah, I've never seen it. It's, which is kind of rare. <laughs> I feel like we saw everything in 75. But this might have had low distribution and really it might have only been in certain stores, little five and dimes, you know, Rexall drugs or something. Yeah, anything that happened after June of 75, I wouldn't have been exposed to it because oh, once we moved to Tacoma, Washington, I was limited in, in uh, where I went, except to the PX. Um, before, when I went, the early part of 75, when I was in San Antonio, I, I would see a lot of stuff around me. I don't think I ever went to a toy store while we lived in Washington State. This is the AHI one. I like this one better. Yeah, that's the one that I have. It's just his hands look a little awful. The AHI, that looks perfect. That's in good shape because usually the paint rubs off on his nose. The tip of it's his a little nose. bit awful. It's a little rubbed, a little bit. Yeah. Uh, mine's worse than that. But it's That's it's basically nice. almost identical to the Aurora head, and uh, yeah, I think that's why I like that so much. And that bucket, that trick or treat pail that I just got is based on that head too. Yeah, with the same paint job, how he has the blue eyes. <coughs> yeah, that's the one to have. That kind of material on the jacket's always got frayed real easy, I remember. Yeah. Yeah, it did. Yeah, it was ultra cheap. And then the the other monsters, even though their heads were like the Aurora kits, didn't look as good as I recall. Those are the uh, me those are the Mego ones. Yeah. That's what I have. Those must what are those reprint re, re uh, redos of them? <laughs> I don't know what this guy's selling, but it's not a figure. <coughs> yeah, I, I have all four of those. All right, let's look at the Dracula, and then we'll go to AHI. I have the HI Dracula, but I wanted to see this. Oh, is there? There he is. It's a huh. picture of him. <laughs> yeah. Oh, you can't even find him. He's so the Frankenstein rare. was the only really cool AHI one, as I recall. Uh, oh, here's there's the Dracula, Lincoln. <laughs> the Lincoln Werewolf, I think I had once. What was that company? Imperial Toys. Remember that company that made the big plastic animals and dinosaurs, uh, like a big shark or something? You get them at souvenir souvenir stores. Imperial Plastic yeah. or something. I think they made some Universal monsters in the seventies. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. I remember a they little did. werewolf that was kind of cool looking with the, the checkered red shirt. All right, here's the two different. Look at that. It's $1,500. I was going to say, look oh, at boy. the boys on that. That's the HI. This is the slim one. They call it the female one. Oh. All right, it disappeared right there. There it is. Yeah, see how the waist is real slim? Yeah, in the face, too. The face sculpt. Yeah, it has, it has, has wide hips and a slim waist. 
And then here's the the male one. And these things were real like waxy hollow so the paint would just like come right off. Uh -huh. A thousand bucks a pop for all of them. Yeah, I've never seen one of those. The paint's always jacked up on them like this. Oh, look. Oh, look. There's an original Monsterizer. Yeah. It looks really close, doesn't it? It looks it looks like yours, pretty much. The... Mm -hmm. <clears throat> it's real nice out here today. It's warm and sunny, and the the ocean looked beautiful this morning. Birds are. Uh -huh. Yeah, it's probably about 65 or something, maybe 68. All my windows are open. Yeah, that Frankenstein's the best one. Well, that one's, what was, that's not even color green. Or is it's it? just where it wears off and there's two different versions you can get a green body or a, one that doesn't have a green body okay yeah some of them don't have the green like arms see that has green arms and this one doesn't and that one doesn't have green arms uh I have this Dracula, but he's his clothes dry rotted. The old fabric is the my least favorite part of dealing with vintage toys. I like even try to steer away from toys that have old fabric and on the Migos, I've been fortunate enough to buy Migos that are still in good shape and the snaps still work. But sometimes you get snaps, I know you know this, Kevin, that are just rusty and won't even come apart or go back together again, that are just messed mm -hmm. up. A lot of times they've been they've been re-sewed back on. A nice one. Here's Hulk Hogan when he first went to WCW. That's what he looked like. He got rid of his yellow. That's Hollywood. He got, he got rid of the yellow and uh, and red. This is right when he first went over before he was even Hollywood. He, that was the night he went over. He looked like that. Um, uh, this is a great figure. 
Yeah, this just came out. That's really nice. Later, I would say Hollywood. Mm -hmm. I've got that one that came out a couple of years ago. That's like the uh, like a like a Master of the Universe Origins size, right? You know what I'm talking about? Uh huh. That's Hollywood Hogan. Yeah, I have that one around here somewhere. The new wrestling figures, though, are really very nice with the pinless joints and all the accessories and the price point on them is also good. By I, didn't even notice. I didn't even notice that we don't have pins anymore. Yeah, it's really nice. See that? Look at how nice that looks. I know they were doing that with Marvel Legends. I didn't know they were doing it with uh, wrestling. Yeah, they are. I got a Mr. T figure last year that looks great. That that where he's in red, you know that one. Uh, what is that? The Elite line or it's the Ultimate Ultimates? The Ultimates have that white box. Yeah, that's the one. I have the Mr. T Ultimates, and it's a great figure. Those are different because they have these butterfly joints right here. Yeah, it it had it's the articulation is crazy on it. So. So those are pins on his knees still. Is it harder to take apart his arms now that it doesn't have pins? Because I, I, I would like to heat the arms up and then I could take them apart and customize stuff. Yeah, I'm not sure. There's a guy on, I, for, I forget this guy's name. My son watches him and he told me about it. There's a guy that does live streams where he just fixes toys, where he's. Um, yeah, I watch that guy too. He'll do like two or three hour streams and people send him their broken toys and then he fixes them live on YouTube. Oh, cool. It's like Jerry the Jitterbug. Oh, there he is. That one looks oh. big. Though. Or is it just the perception I'm looking at? Well, it's, it's yeah, it's just close to the camera. See, that's why I know he has a nose rub and um, it's funny. <laughs> Yeah, I See, like that figure. It's almost exactly the Aurora model kit. Do you have the green arms or the? Do you have a oh, green arm yeah, one? Yeah, he has green arms. I've never. So his arms only go green up to the elbow. Possibly, but I've never, I've never in my life taken the clothes. See, his feet are green too. So maybe his whole body's green. I don't know. I think it just uh, goes up to his ankles, and then it's. But this that's this one and um i've got the Migo frankenstein somewhere but i probably have him like hanging out hanging out of like a tiki glass or something because like some of them like this this Migo wolfman he uh, did you buy those in the 90s or did you buy them when you were a kid no these were when i was Living in San Antonio, 74, 75. His leg is just dangling. It's uh and it's missing and this the pin probably. Yeah, I don't know how to fix it, but so I just I, I just had him sitting down. But um see so he even has a little bit of blood under his eye. And uh yeah, I love this figure when I was a kid. I thought this was great. Uh, has the glow in the dark hands, and he has the glow in the dark eyeballs too, right? Yes, um, with little. And those weren't those weren't licensed by Universal, so they were trying to not look like the. Right, that's just a great design. That design is so cool. I th I thought that was great when I was a kid. I was fascinated by those eyes inside there. You know what I mean? I wanted to like yeah. poke it. You know. <laughs> yeah. 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 Then the mummy one is uh, he's he's crippled with the leg problem, but I think I might have taken the clothes off and taped the leg at some point. But oh, that's sculpted on bandages on his head. Yeah, they're sculpted in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's no cloth on his head. The cloth starts right here around his neck. And then um, the um, Migo Dracula. Yeah, this is my favorite. The original. <clears throat> I 
I kept this guy for a long time. This is something that I had all the way up to high school, and then I ended up just giving it to my cousin. Like, I don't even care. I yeah, this could... one is, you... is still intact. The legs aren't dangling. Those little rubber shoes he's got, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Kind of looks like a witch a little bit. Um, anyway, I'll give you back. The... Oh, here's the, this one's, I missed this one at that toy show I was at last time. I could have, I had a chance, I would if I would have been a half hour earlier, I would have got this. What what company put that out? That's the Remco 1980 creature. Okay. It looks like he's wearing a Halloween costume, though. Yeah, I call him the pajamas. He's wearing a creature pajamas. pajamas. Yeah, that's what it looks like. I like those little figures that... Who's coming out with those figures that look like kids going trick-or-treating? I saw those recently. Yeah, those are NECA. NECA, that's right. Yeah, those are good. Yeah, this is cool looking. It, it really looks like a Halloween costume. I like it. But that's a thousand dollar figure. <laughs> yeah, for some reason they made a bunch of Frankenstein and Dracula and the Mummy, but Creature and uh, Phantom they made hardly any of. I probably won't even be able to find a phantom on here. The card art, the card art is amazing on these. Well, those are the small ones. That's different. It's just a great looking card, but, isn't it? Yeah, those are the three and three quarter inch. I remember seeing these at the drugstore when I was in high school, like on my way to, you know, <clears throat> buy beer, looking, going to, to the beer section, to the coolers, walking by these. Yeah, for so cool. long, these things were nothing. Yeah, they would they would like be you know they'd have the yellow sticker with another yellow sticker on top of that yellow sticker. For the longest down. time, they were nothing. Yep. Like the Phantom one, you can't even find the Ramco ten inch. This is the bot. They came in a box like this, the ten inch ones. And yeah, I was really. They had this seen action the feature where they would grab you. They had these like weird arms. I've that never you... seen that. Before. Never seen one. Oh, uh, that was neat. Um, go back up one. Uh, where was that? Oh. Wait. Um, am I looking at the puzzle? That thing there, there right? looks cool. Um, is it's that like new? Game. It's one of those little pinball games. Little pocket <laughs> pinball things. Yeah, is it great. a new toy or is it from back then? It's this is a custom tribute. It says tribute to oh. the Funko pinball game. What is okay, this called? I've never seen that before. It's called a bagatelle, I think is what that's called. Yeah, is that bagatelle, right? right. Let me try to find a different. Yeah, the Phantom one, you, I can't even find a picture of it. It's still rare. Here's the mummy. He's like in mummy pajamas. <laughs> that was one of those Remco. Uh, what what is that line called with the science fiction monsters? The invaders. Yeah, the invaders. Who was that he guy was that used friend. to watch our show that made those great videos? Had a whole collection of those. Oh, the guy. Um... He was yeah. making really good videos, but then he was—he got involved in some other stuff that kind of took him away from YouTube. But he had a great collection of uh, little. He made the custom play sets. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was 
He started doing games, uh, gaming or something. The art's pretty cool on these two. Yeah. I don't like the font though. Like the font ruins it. Yeah. It was trying to be, what do they call that when it was, it's like some kind of advertising thing where it's just real plain almost. Yeah. Yeah. That, that was what, it was that mid eighties. When did that come out? I, I seen advertising like this still to this day where it's like on shirts where it's like three words. It's like right across their chest, and it's just like, yeah, yeah. It's not an interesting font. I mean, it's like all this stuff should have been on the back. The art is fantastic. I think it's you know it's a. It's but bad. see how he's like, he's supposed to grab you. Oh wow! Look at that thing. And it came with a, an iron-on patch, and then a little glow-in-the-dark ring. Wow. The ring's up here. Ah, I've never seen this. This is awesome looking. Cool. Oh, here, the guy got a good picture of him glowing. Look. Oh, neat. Oh, there's the patch. You hardly ever see the patch. Patch is always missing. That's a unique image. I've never seen that image either. It's cool looking. His nose is weird. Yeah, he looks kind of sleepy. He's kind of contemplative. He's got a whole different thing going. And he's making direct eye contact with us. He's looking <laughs> right at the camera. I like sleepy Frankenstein. That's my favorite kind of Frankenstein. <laughs> There's that place set for the the small yeah. ones where it's made out of cardboard. Yeah, we were just talking about this. Yeah. Pretty neat, actually, all the different features it has for all the different monsters, right? Yeah. You get a coffin, you get a sarcophagus, and you get the laboratory for Frankenstein. The table for the monster. Yeah, and there was a little underneath uh, the grate over here is where um, you'd put your phantom over there. Oh, yeah, you were talking about that, how there's a catacombs for the phantom. These things, I, I found these before and I didn't think they were anything. They're like 300 bucks. Oh. They're called, uh, they're little hand puppets and they come in a little plastic box. That'd be decorated like this one. I haven't seen that. Remco. Yeah, all this stuff came out at the same time from Remco. Yeah, I just was kind of unaware or not paying attention in the 80s to uh, everything. Yeah, I, mean, I was driving around a lot in cars with my friends. So that's like a Christopher Lee. Yeah, it is. It looks cool. Uh, it, is it more of a Count Yorga? I think, I think it's its own. I think it's its own thing, but they were they couldn't make it look like Bela Lugosi. So let me uh, let me look it up because I'm thinking it looks like uh, Robert Quarry and Count Yorga. So this one's ideal. There, there's that even... font again you were talking about. Same font. This one must have been a different uh, country. That's in the U.S. Oh, yeah, they had this crush action feature. 
I guess what ideal and Ramco are the same thing. Well, yeah, I don't know. I didn't know that. I haven't heard that. I'm before. gonna I'm gonna go to my camera for just a second. So so uh, yeah, you kind of stop there if you. Okay, yeah. I think they were trying to get this. Definitely, that's him. Yeah, it's Robert Corey. Yeah. Um, anyway, never mind. Oh, here's here's without his clothes. You can see how the arms work. See how they have these oh, weird. Oh no! My gosh. See those weird slices in there? Yeah. That would make the when you push this lever on the back, it would make them grab you. But they're always broken because of that. This lever didn't hold up after time. Oh, is this the new? What is this one? Oh, this is a custom one. This guy's making his own custom one. Oh. There's his <laughs> arm. That is really weird. What is that? It's a mask based on the toy. <laughs> Halloween mask based on the toy. <clears throat> yeah, the guy got, he was making them on his own custom ones. And I think NECA hired him to make, a, uh, to mass produce them. He also makes a, uh, I follow him on Instagram. That's why I know about this. He also makes a, uh, a six million dollar man toy mask that you can wear. That sounds cool. I mean, you know, in theory. Loot yeah, trade. he's doing masks. He's doing all these masks based on toys, like he does Star Wars toys. I think that's a cool idea. I like it. Uh mm huh. -hmm. Uh, I wish I could find this phantom. Let me try. Yeah, excuse me. I guess because they, uh, creature and phantom were like the last wave of the run, so and they just didn't make as many. Even though they knew Creature is the most popular character. Search Google. Oh no. Hey, I'll be back. I think my phone needs a charge.
I went upstairs to get some more books and looks like uh, people have disappeared. Meyer's still there, possibly. His sound, his mic is not going. Unless the Avenger says, yes, that's Count Yorga. I'm back. Oh, cool. Yeah, I I went up in the elevator to get more books and I see, oh, Gotham City. Yeah, he said. Did he, did he say something about having to go or did his camera just go out? Running out of power. Oh, okay. Oh. Yeah, I just brought the last of the books. I'm not sure how they fit into these bookshelves. Oh, I gotta move things around to get them. Get things in. So, what else has been up? Not much. Nothing really. Same old thing. Oh, my wife is awake. I'm here seeing if he's still going, laugh out loud. And she says, hi, Meyer. And Paula says, I was awake for four hours and I came back. It was still going. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. <laughs> Just using up all my stream yard hours. Um, Easter Marathon 2024. So, got one more. But yeah, nothing much. Um, I'm getting ready to go and visit my kids next week. Uh, for a couple of weeks. That's about it. This is a... Uh... I was asleep for almost five hours and here we are. <laughs> Well, yeah, I don't know where I got this box. Nationals guaranteed hosiery. I put things into it. It's a ticket stub for X Men Two. This is a. Uh, guess an invitation to my college graduation. Um, what else is in here you just get you wind up things and you don't know what to do with them and what is this man it's like uh that's that was the really bad spider-man movie spider-man 2 with the but it's um Dr. Octopus? No. No? What was no. Spider-Man 2? I thought that was one with Dr. Octopus. Spider-Man 2 was, but the amazing Spider-Man is the one that you didn't, with the other guy that, that was the skateboarder. 
Yeah, I didn't like that. Yeah, the the first one was not as bad as the second one that had Rhino and. Uh, oh, I didn't see that. Uh, Electro. But it's I don't know what this object is that you're being given free attached to this card when you bought your ticket. It's not a keychain. I don't know what that's supposed to do. But it wasn't thrown away. Um, what else is in here? Nothing too spectacular. Um, a birthday card. Oh, this is supposed to talk. Doesn't talk anymore. Here's a ticket to not, uh, The Wolverine. The one that has the in the title is it was actually good, I thought. But the one that was the origin story wasn't. So that's what's in that. And then um, got an enemy ace archive edition. I don't know why. That hosiery box made me laugh. I've got two of them. They must have come from an estate sale. I, I don't know why they own them. I have no clue. Looks like they're from like the Kennedy era. There's the Doom Patrol Volume One, but I have I, I didn't get the other volumes of Doom Patrol because I had all the original comics. So didn't see. And then this one, even though it says. <laughs> The Shazam, which makes no sense. It's uh, reprints of Captain Marvel. So I file it under C. I don't buy into this. His name is Shazam nonsense. And uh, here's um, John Waters' autobiography, Shock Value, and this horrible death of Superman that I bought just to see what that was all about. Which was all nothing. It doesn't feel like a Sunday. Um, shoot. Anyway, so um, so then I got a few more of these that I got to put up here. Um, this is the Action Heroes. It's DC Archives simply because, um. They had bought out the Charlton characters, so this is Captain Adam. I and it just I, I they don't put Captain Adam big on there, which is strange. But anyway, Captain Adam, good cool stuff. Black Hawk Volume One. Um, they're about to do a facsimile of this first appearance of Black Hawk soon. Um, This artwork, I'll just make myself get a little bigger. This artwork, you, you forget how gorgeous this artwork was in Blackhawk. And then um, Black Canary. And this.
representing from the golden and silver age of comics, over 25 adventures featuring the Black Canary. Um, it's good stuff. Um, Black Canary is for Black Hawk. Then um, these Batman books, the ones that are called the Dark Knight Archives, reprint Batman. Back to Black Canary. I mean, it's a little on the nose. Like, is a woman that screams, is that really a superpower? I mean, don't most women scream? <laughs> yeah. Also, she's blonde and white, so she the power works a lot better for her, right? Well, she was <laughs> she wasn't in that what was that Harley Quinn and the unbearable lightness of being or whatever that came out. They had black hair. They okay. So what is going on? So then there's another one that's called Dynamic Duo, but it's also Batman. No, Batman and Detective. Oh, the ones called Dynamic Duo are Silver Age reprints. Huh. Okay, it's confusing. And the okay. ones that are called Batman are detective. Why don't they just have the name of the comic? But it's a, so if it says Batman, it's detective comics. If it says Dynamic Duo, it's sixties Batman. If it says Dark Knight, it's the Golden Age. Batman. Somebody in the editorial department was really feeling themselves. They're like, we want to put our own titles on these compilations instead of making it, you know, I'm going to add yeah, a little. Yeah, it doesn't really make sense. Um, Paulo says, Black Karen Airy and Missing Mars says, those Reeboks made me laugh too. The ever resourceful Gratu. I, I, there's, so you need boxes to put stuff in and you got stuff everywhere and you're not going to just throw it away. Like there's a little card from captain strange life. I'm not just going to chunk it in the trash. I'll put it in a box and then I'll discover it at some point after I'm dead. Oh man, this dark night got chewed on by somebody. So that's why I hate putting these books down low. I'm afraid someone's going to chew on them. Who knows? Oh, I can move these over. I've almost got this whole project finished. Um, okay. Cleo is awake, my wife, so um, he sure is resourceful. She's probably hungry for dinner, lunch, whatever you call it. I'm Leonard. Gonna, I'm gonna so go. we're probably going to eat something upstairs and watch a movie. Do you have any? Uh, other recommendations? You send me a lot of recommendations, but any recommendations you'd like to give people to see on YouTube or whatever? Not that I can think of. <coughs> I just finished that uh, second season on Netflix of that um, Love on the Spectrum. I think it's a really good show. It's a dating show for autistic autistic adults. It's pretty good. They should do a dating show with that girl that... that uh, girl with Tourette's <laughs> you imagine I the, thought the dating that, game yeah well as soon as I you showed me those videos as soon as I saw that it reminded me of that show it it, it, it would it would definitely uh add some flair to the show um <laughs> are yeah, the people that out. extreme on that show no they're they're like uh you know they're all across the spectrum but there's nobody with violent Tourette's that I've seen there, uh, it's a good show though. I recommend Love on the Spectrum. Yeah, 
it's heartwarming and wholesome is what I would say about it, which is unusual for a Netflix show, right? Almost done. I don't know where to put these, so I'll just put them on top of those. Okay, so I will uh, end this live stream by joining with my phone, and, and then you guys can see a close up of, of this project, which Let's see. So this means there won't be any live streams anytime soon uh, because I've run out of hours. Uh, my wife says, I heard you quoted her saying John 312's come back. Yeah, I thought that was yeah. hilarious. That was one of my favorite ticks of hers is that she says John 312's come back. She's got yeah, a lot we of looked up John 312 uh, and so to cool. figure out what it was. This girl, I think, has I, th I think the ironic thing is she's a religious girl. <laughs> she knows biblical verses and <laughs> so and so we looked it up because uh we're trying to figure out what and, and I don't remember because it was the real late at night, but maybe Cleo remembers what John 312. Uh, hey Siri, tell us what John three twelve says. Okay, I found this on the web for tell us what John three twelve says. Check it out. Um. Okay. Here, here. Yeah. I have spoken to you of earthly things, and you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? That's what she keeps saying. In, in her turret uh, <laughs> when you say John 312 scumbag there was a, a really realistic dream where my uh, friend that passed away Tom uh, came to me and I was like and I was talking to him and it's like and I'm thinking wait a second you're not alive how are you here and it's, it was like and and he said hey don't worry about it hey I'm, I'm gonna tell you something I know you're gonna forget and but you got to remember this, and he and he said it was, it was John something, and I and then of course I forgot when I woke up, but it was a very very realistic dream, and he was trying to convey something. Uh, sorry. <laughs> so I, I my wife and I immediately thought maybe it was John three twelve, but I don't know. You know, three sixteen is the one the, you know the most important verse you know whatever in the Bible. But I don't think he would be just telling me that because that's it was something. And and I almost really feel like he was communicating with me. But anyway, this uh, it's weird how this girl with Tourette's just appears on YouTube all of a sudden out of nowhere. And and there's and we watch it and then there's some some communication from the Bible mixed in with all of that weird uh, insanity. Uh, and yeah, it's so who knows? She uses it like like an insult, kind of. Her tick, when she says it in her tick, it comes out like she's like insulting somebody. She's saying, John 312, scumbag. She said, <laughs> Well, there's one where she's talking about someone's asking her a question. Does your boyfriend feel insulted by all of this? And and she says, No, he knows I don't mean it. And 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 there there's we were looking for videos of her interacting with her boyfriend. Some they're in the kitchen cooking together, and that's mm -hmm. uh what uh, you know, I wanted to see how does she she has a normal life. Uh, it's like the girl with you, you know that girl with two heads. I mean, I guess she's like a conjoined, but it's it, basically there's two heads coming out of looks like one torso, and she just got married. And it's like, well, right. which which head did you get married to? And that's very, you, but you you know what you got to live your life. I don't know. <laughs> um. What am I doing? Oh, I'm trying to get in as uh, me to this live stream. So uh, anyway, I, what was her name again? Uh, oh, see, she immediately pops up whenever I go to YouTube. It's the first thing that pops up because. Um. <laughs> yeah, I thought it was a bit. I thought it was a bit at first. And so then I searched more to see 
if it had been debunked. And the first thing I found was a segment from Dr. Phil interviewing her father telling, and I was like, Oh, this is real. I was like, Holy crap. Wow. You got to watch her being interviewed by Chris Cuomo on CNN. I could show you that real quick, but <laughs> she just complete and he can't keep from laughing. Eventually he has to, but this, this, Jesus take my fucking meal. These are some things that set my ticks off. The smell of lavender. Fuck you, stupid. Why not? Community dick. Festive dick. Miracle dick. <sighs> she got big old tits. La 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 la, go fuck yourself. We have lavender. We have hats. When it's flipped over, tip it to be top that when you're tap the rotisserie chicken. We have hats. Songs, shake it off, and best song, best song ever. No, I don't listen to. Them. When someone repeats my ticks or when I read my ticks, it sets my ticks off. Yeah, butter your own biscuit, fat ass. <laughs> John three twelve scumbag. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, you need Jesus. <laughs> Have you ever been in a trash room or like went to go throw something out at like a dumpster or like smelled your trash in like your house and you like you know it needs to go out? Well, that smell sets my ticks off. <laughs> Fuck you. <laughs> Alcohol sets my ticks off very, very bad. Like to like aggressive bad to the point where I fuck your dad and your dog. <laughs> Stupid. Where like I'm beating myself. <laughs> Being in a restaurant. And having like, like say you go with like friends and everyone has their own plate. I want to personally pick up your food and throw it. I've also multiple times like stuck my hands in the water and. Yeah, like, it's it debilitating. Oh. She has a debilitating disability that is hilarious at the same time, but it is debilitating. Yeah, sorry to put your head next to hers so then you're, you're having to. You feel bad about laughing. That's what happened to uh, yeah, it's to uh, Chris Cuomo. Yeah, it's dangerous for her to unload the dishwasher. She can she can like have a, a violent tick and throw shit everywhere. Like it, it's, it's, yeah, it's, this is sad <laughs> and funny, but sad. But I'm yeah. glad she's making videos. She's doing good on YouTube. She's really into yeah. YouTube. She posts multiple times a day. Hold on, I was playing this over what you were saying. Sorry, you were saying I what? Saying I was saying it's good that she's found YouTube and TikTok. She's popular. She's got like seventy five thousand subs or something, and she posts multiple times a day. Or she cans her videos. She pre cans them maybe, and then posts. She has the number of videos she had when I noticed last night. She's got like fourteen hundred videos in a four year span or something. Which is crazy. Yeah, she posts multiple times a day. She's posting like three, four times a day on YouTube videos that are one or two or three minutes long of her just ranting. And um, it's cool that she's, she. it's uh, maybe it's helping. I don't know. I mean, it, she's getting the ticks out, right? And yeah. that's part of the thing, I think, is that, is that that's, it's a, that's part of the disability this, is that there's this, a. This is pretty priceless. I, I hate Chris Cuomo and his brother. It just comes out. Tourette's is 
Yeah, it would really suck to have that condition three, four hundred years ago. You would have been burned. <laughs> yeah. You just, they yeah, just she, immediately yeah. assume it's demonic possession. And I'm not 100% sure it isn't, but it's something. How are you doing, Kevin? Oh, I was going to come in too. I got distracted because as soon as I go to YouTube, it always shows me her now to watch. It'll do it again. Watch. Yep. See? That's all they do. <laughs> I was going to come in too. I got distracted because as soon as I go to YouTube, it always shows me her. Am I here? Yeah, yeah, we can. Yeah, you're here. 
Was that real? Yeah. Were, is that on the news? Oh, that girl is just a, a, a girl on TikTok and YouTube. Apparently, she really has Tourette's, and she's really yeah, I heard you. I heard you talking about that, but was she? they put her on the news? Yeah, Chris oh, Cuomo Chris brought, him, brought her on CNN, and she's just flipping him off, and, and he's trying to keep a straight face. It's hilarious. Uh, because she's saying everything to Chris Cuomo that we all think, you know, and the thought during the pandemic and everything. Uh, let's see. Moon they didn't says, it out? Did you try the eggnog combo? No, we haven't been drinking today. No. Yeah, that's apparently real. Um, They're allowed to do that on news? Oh, well, you know, you're not supposed to say this. You know, on CNN, it's a cable news channel. But um, I guess because it's a medical condition, I don't think the FCC is going to go after them for that. No, like, they're giving the girl a pass. What, would you two, you think, you think you, little would, kids are going to see that? And start. Saying the F word. She says the F word like 20 times in, in two minutes or something. She's, so, I mean, little kids are going to go around pretending they have Tourette's. You oh yeah, I'm sure she's caused influence because they call her an influencer. Yeah, she's on <laughs> yeah I'm sure she that's that's happened. Uh, yeah. I have a couple customers that have Tourette's. They don't say cuss words; they just have weird tics. Yeah, the the guy I knew that had Tourette's would just kind of just move his head while he's talking, you know. But uh, uh -huh. he he would never curse or anything. But she has apparently a more severe case of it than yeah than she's most. like super saying Tourette's final form she's reached the final form of Tourette's <laughs> and it's just she looks so angelic is, is what's funny about it but then in a way it's kind of like the beginning of the exorcist movie you know when, when right. Reagan you know Linda Blair is just starting you know it's like the what first that, you know, that I watched this, last this? night was her showing off her new puppy and the puppy is absolutely adorable and beautiful and she just can't say 10 words without cussing talking about this puppy because she's so excited about the puppy that she wants to show everybody but because of the threats and the ticks the the excitement brings out the ticks and so it's pretty funny that was the first one i watched and i was like holy crap is this real man no i don't think moon dust asked if she can go to church she says she can't even go to restaurants she has to have the takeout yeah, no, <laughs> she's she there's no place you imagine her in a movie theater <laughs> yeah. um we were thinking that she probably can't go to church, yes, but somehow she knows about John three twelve. So you know, oh look at that! That looks like Chris Cuomo, doesn't <laughs> it? That looks like him trying to keep from laughing. <laughs> That's exactly what that looks like. His shirt's printed on. It's like one of those costume shirts. Yeah, I'm going to give myself, myself the camera just, just for a second because I, I want to show, show the, the final form of, of uh, this, this project. project. Okay, so oh, let me turn on this ring light to give a little more light. So, um, library, so these, these are, are all the books, books that wow. have been put in in the last two live streams. And then there's a few stray books on top. And I've got this little spinner up here. Huh, bury and my heart. It would be. I love that. If you turn the corner, there's, there's this bookshelf. Looks like I get a few more books in there. And then as we go around it, it this is where you just have the it the backs, but I've got this uh, spinner, the spinner, this wheels uh, thing. Um, but I'm gonna put some kind of posters on the back, so it won't, you won't just or eventually get other bookcases on the back, so. 
And then, then there's, there's books, books over here. here. And there's all, I've got to get all this cleaned up. That'll be a project for next weekend. Got all my EC, Russ Cochran, Seth. And then uh, over here, we've got some more books. Got more books in a library. Plastic dog poop, which is important for all libraries. And then all of these paperbacks and things that I need to go through sometime. Um, there might be some toys interesting to look at, possibly, too. Um, I don't know. Um, Go back to those creepy letters. This is the bike Did we you were talking them? about. That it is not a replica of Pee Wee's bike, but uh, it's here for some reason. Is that this a was a Frankenstein. They had a target a few... Uh, Years, Years ago, ago. Uh, um, okay, and then there's uh, more, more books, books over here. here. Uh, anyway, anyway, if you, you take nothing else, else from this live stream today, today make sure you subscribe, subscribe to Bailey Dupree, Dupree because, because I think she's, she's my new discovery of March 2024, 2024 in the last. last you know, you know, very end of the month, month uh, that's my recommend video recommendation. recommendation. Okay, yeah, so, so this is a more of us, and then over here, we've got, got a stereo. Stereo, the stereo system, and then a bunch, a bunch of, of uh, there's, there's one, one of my few wrestling figures, figures and I got a bunch of Vampirellas over here. Anyway, anyway that's, uh, that's, that's the, the beginning, beginning of the library. library. Uh, so, uh, so I will, I will yeah. so. looks great. I noticed that Metarog has do you remember the other day, uh, uh Meyer, we were looking at Metarog's live stream. We were like were we talking or texting and it was like who is the we were probably talking on the phone, who is the guy going through the comics? And it turned out that Metarog has figured out the same trick he calls into his own live stream. And so that was him flipping through his comics, the ones that were double sided. Right. Uh, while so he was two of the people on the screen, and they all had different weird names, so it was a little confusing. But I'm sure this this live stream's confusing too if someone stumbled into the middle of it. But that's that's how you can, uh, you know, because I don't want to take this whole laptop over there to show you guys. So I I come on and. That's how I do it. it looks really good, man. You have a lot of books. It looks good. Yeah. Um, but boy, I need more bookshelves. So I, I need more bookshelves. And man, we've got to get a kitten or two um, pretty soon. We'll probably shred all of those books. <laughs> but uh, I just need to get a kitten for, uh, for Alan, who's just walking around. It doesn't seems to be doing okay but he's probably wondering where pete is and i i don't know can't get inside a cat's head but i need to get some companions and then eventually a companion for for drew the dog as well mm -hmm. i'm trying to remember who sent me this book someone sent me this book Is that coming from Kevin or you, Meyer? <laughs> it's Kevin. Who sent me this book? Was it was it Charlton? Look at this big tooth. It's the kind of stuff that uh, Kevin. Did you hear that? My phone just started uh, playing. Your Casper started the Casper thing. Your phone started the Casper thing. <laughs> My phone just it? started playing by itself. Yeah. Oh, that's weird. It's definitely the Illuminati. Just that kind of, this is a, it's kind of a generic looking book. It's got those kind of generic letters we were complaining about in the Frankenstein uh, Rimco, but it's just, I, I don't know how I own this book. Someone gave it to me. Um, uh, Where's the album? Let's see, what are people saying? Mundus says that place is huge, so cool. I have albums, I'll show them soon. 
I think he has way more books. <laughs> yes, indeed. Um, and she has way more books that, that I need a bookcase for her books. They're just stacked up in the attic. Wow, cool ringtone and or or um i'm gonna take off you guys happy easter yeah, everybody uh, we're gonna we're all gonna probably sign off here soon as we approach nine hours that's longer than a work day man thanks for watching everybody all right all right take care everybody oh yeah make sure that sheena volume one's uh in my pile and what was the other thing you were talking about so oh, you got a crazy amount of watch too. hours Huh? Once you hit your thousand subscribers, you won't have to worry about your watch hours. Well, no, it's not that. It's it's not watch hour. It's the it's uh StreamYard only gives you twenty free hours. I've gone no, over saying, twenty hours here, but but I, I I'm had saying once five you, hours uh, left when I started, and they let you keep going until you get to I think twelve hours, then it shuts it off. But uh well, no, I'm I saying once you get a uh, once you get a thousand subs, you need uh you need to have also so many watch hours that people have watched, and it's hard for a lot yeah. of people to get that. Yeah. Um, so you won't. I don't think you'll have a problem with that one. You'll be ready to. Well, if people so, ever watch an entire eight and a half hour stream, uh, they wouldn't even have to watch. You know, you, depending on what job you have, you could put on headphones and listen to an entire stream while you're working, I guess. But um, let me look and see what what I've got. I haven't looked in a while, so I'm still stuck at 709 subscribers. I can't I can't get to 710. Maybe one of you 15 watching, if you'd like to subscribe and get me to 710, but in the last 28 days, I've had 7.4 thousand views, and watch time in hours is 2,000. Wow, that's crazy amount. Is that is that good? I yeah. What's good? Um, yeah, because a lot like, of people, you know, when they get their thousand subs, they have a hard time getting up to their watch time. But you did it like oh, with live stream. Um, I think that's the secret to it. Doing says, live I've gotten eight subscribers, I guess, this month. And uh, yeah, I, I I just can't get to a thousand because every time I gain five, I lose three. And it's just whenever I mention that I like Donald Trump or something, I lose people or something happens. Or maybe YouTube is um, is throttling me for all I know. Uh, because I, I just saw this. Look at this uh, headline. Um, on, in, on on Infowars. Um, I won't say it out loud. I'll let you guys read it. Oh, look at this. The Archbishop is not liking what Biden did um, declaring Easter blah, blah, day of blah, blah. But we won't talk about that. Um, where is it? Uh Blah Blah says it has a responsibility to manipulate algorithms leading up to 2024 election. Um, responsibility is just even Google, YouTube. Trying to use the word responsibility is a narrative fig leaf to cover up. Anyway, whatever. I don't think I say anything too bad. It's a, you know. It's like, hey, does anyone remember Maui? <laughs> that, that's probably a pretty bad thing to say. But anyway. Hey, you got me almost to uh, 600 the other day when you mentioned me on there. I did? How many How many did you have before? I think I got like I five. Really did it. I think huh? I got five. New, I think I got five new ones. You cut out. I think I got five new ones when you mentioned oh, me. Oh, five. Yeah, that's good. So I'm uh, yeah, two the away guy from that got me a lot was yeah um, yeah walnuts got me a lot of subscribers uh, let's see my wife says I'm not PC 
And Trump 24, we celebrate Easter. Brandon can celebrate that other crap, <laughs> says Bulldog 66. Yeah, everyone subscribe to Gotham City Comics and subscribe. Let's see if I've gotten any subscribers. I guarantee you I haven't. Let's see. I, they're not going to let me have that 710. I, I just know they won't. Yep. Yep, still still 709. Maybe every all 15, 17 people watching have already subscribed. And the thing is, they have different subscribe means different things on different platforms. Like on Instagram, you to subscribe on Instagram means to pay money. It, it's something else if you just get everyone's what is it? You you follow people on Instagram, but if you subscribe, that's an extra step where you actually give them money, I think. Um, Big Mike Day, LOL, says my wife. How dare you be so politically incorrect? Dr. Five says, not being PC is the new rebel. Yeah, it's it's, it's so weird how punk rock punk rock has become, and rock and rollers, it's become uh, the thing to, to uh, be completely down for whatever the politicians say and tell you to do. It's just so it's, you know, you see, uh, that, that was kind of a weird, thing. but whew, man, I, I wish I got paid a salary for doing this, man. This is, this is, that would be good. Punk rock, strange. Uh, what are people saying? Oh, people commented a bunch of that. Punk rock turned into disco. So when people catch on, he will go up in subs. Strange, Dr. Fibes, happy Easter. Yes, happy Easter, Dr. Fibes. Uh, oh, let's see how many subscribers Dr. Fibes has gotten to. Because the other, when he first came on, like a Thursday before last, he had four subscribers. <clears throat> and then, um, now, let's see. All you got to type in, <clears throat> show you. Type in... Um, Dr. Fibes and the word moon, and it will get you to him because he has a music video, the moon and other, if you just type in Dr. Fibes, it's going to be hard to find him. He has 26 subscribers now. He's gone up from four and he's got some great videos up. So hopefully you'll all subscribe to him and hopefully he'll start doing um, full form videos on, on, uh, on here. So, did you subscribe to Dr. Fibes, uh, Kevin? Oh, yeah, right away, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, when you <laughs> were you watching that night, that first night he appeared and showed his house? Yeah, yeah were, I was there. You? I couldn't even sleep that night. Oh, I, we didn't either because I had to go upstairs and show it to my wife, and she couldn't believe it. And <laughs> yeah, I had about an hour's sleep the next day at work, seriously. But, uh, so there, you know, uh, <laughs> you, yeah, I need, need sleep at work. It's kind of important, but, uh, uh, so yeah, um, I, well, what's going on here? My wife says, Dr. Fives rules. Cleo or Greta, as you're called on here, do you, have you seen the Dr. Fives movies? I don't know if I've ever shown them to you. Uh, thanks to your show. I'm getting more subs. Thanks, Gratu. And then, whoop. Ha, ha, ha. The Fever Dream Night. Dr. Fives, I plan to make some videos, some more videos of, I plan to make videos, <clears throat> take two. I plan to make some videos of some of my collection. Good. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Bulldog 66, great stuff, Gratu. Love the channel. And my wife says, yay to the more videos. I don't think I'm going to be able to make any more live streams until possibly two weeks from now because I've used up. And, 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 but if my wife creates a StreamYard account and I get into that, then I'd have another 20. So we'll, we'll talk into that because apparently you can create multiple StreamYard accounts. And, but don't, I need to be quiet, I'm giving away my secrets. So uh, anyway, we watched one but back in like 2016. Okay, so I did show you the original one. And uh, I don't know what that face is doing. I can't make it out. Is it an angry 
face, the laughing face. I don't know. But I need to go. I, my wife says she's not hungry, but I'm starving. So I think I'll go up there and eat and see what's going on with my wife. So all of you guys out there and Kevin, you must apparently are sitting in a very dark room. Yeah. Are you still there? Yeah, I'm here. All right. Well, good uh, good night, everyone, and happy Easter. And remember, Christ is King, and all that. Apparently, that's the new rallying cry because that gets that people say that's politically incorrect. It's not cool to say that. So, oh, it's a laughing face. March thirty first. Whoa, what does this say? What? Paulo says it's March thirty first. Tomorrow is April first. What day does Streamyard reset? It depends on when you started. I think it said April 16th is when I my new hours start. Oh, tomorrow's so April Fool's now, Day. Take, what's that? Tomorrow's April Fool's Day. I didn't hear you. April yeah, Fool's it's Day. April Fool's Day tomorrow. Yeah. If I do a show, it'll be like one of my little hour, hour and ten minute. Yeah, maybe I'll do an April Fool's hour and a half, one of my little short shows where I film hey. it. Let's get out all our joke stuff. Get out your fake poop and everything. Yeah, you know, you ought to do a, a show tomorrow just showing all your joke stuff and put it up on YouTube, you know. Get in maybe okay, a little right. bit before the store opens and just film all of your gag gifts. And, and That's a good three, idea. You know, you know, you got a ton of it. Thanks for that. Yeah, I'm going to. Anyway, I'm I sure. guess I'll uh, sign off. Take care, everybody. And what's that? I'm going to try to do that tomorrow. That's a good idea. Yeah, that would be a great idea. Yeah, and, and my wife says, yay, yes, happy Easter and happy April Fool's tomorrow. All right, take care, everyone. Usually Easter isn't the day before April Fool's. Take care, everybody. I will see you soon. See you. In stream.